Order. Colleagues will no doubt have seen a number of images taken by members of scenes in a division lobby last night. I would like to remind all colleagues that as the recently issued guide to the rules of behaviour and courtesies of the House makes explicitly clear, and I quote, members must not use any device to take photographs, film or make audio recordings in or around the chamber, unquote. I well understand that yesterday's events were exciting and that these days many people regularly take photographs which they feel compelled to share with a wider audience. But members featured in these photographs have not given their permission and to that extent this represents an invasion of privacy. I hope I have made it clear that this practice should cease. Order. Questions to the Secretary of State for Scotland. Martin Day. Number one. The Secretary of State for Scotland, Secretary David Mundell. Uh, Mr Speaker, this has uh, been a momentous week for Andy Murray. So I'm sure you uh, will agree that it's appropriate at this Scottish Questions that we acknowledge in this House Andy's extraordinary contribution to British sport and his personal resilience and courage. And I express our hope that we will once again see Andy Murray on court. Mr Speaker, uh, with permission, I will answer questions 1, 4, 7, 8, 10, 12 and 14 together. I am in regular contact with the Home Secretary on a range of issues of importance to Scotland, including future immigration policy after the UK leaves the European Union. Apart from his enormous talent, can I agree with the Secretary of State more widely about Andy Murray? He is the embodiment of guts and character and the most terrific ambassador for Scotland, for tennis and for sport. His mother, Judy, must be the proudest mother in the world. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Tories' obsession with slashing immigration to the tens of thousands will see Scotland's working-age population decline by 4.5%. That's 150,000 people by 2041. Is the Secretary of State happy standing over such a policy that will cause economic harm to our country? Mr Speaker, uh, uh, the the Honourable Gentleman does not correctly characterise the situation. The immigration uh, white paper which this Government uh, has set out is uh, an undertaking to embark on a year-long engagement process across the whole of the UK to enable businesses and other stakeholders to shape the final details of a post-Brexit immigration policy and process. Neil Gray. I concur with your comments and the Secretary of State regarding Andy Murray, and I would uh, uh, encourage all members to sign my EDM recognising his achievements. Immigration has been and continues to be good for Scotland, and Scottish Government uh, modelling suggests the Brexit-driven reduction in migration will see real GDP drop 6.2% by 2040, which has a monetary value of about £6.8 billion and a £2 billion cost to the government revenue. Does the Secretary of State uh, believe that this cost to Scotland is a price worth paying for his government's Brexit mess and immigration folly? Uh, Speaker, I I don't want to end up uh, repeating my first answer on seven uh, occasions, but I want uh, uh, to make uh, clear that the immigration white paper which we uh, have published is a consultation. It's an undertaking of a year-long engagement process across the whole of the UK, including Scotland, and I expect Scottish businesses, Scottish stakeholders and indeed the Scottish Government to play an active part in that process. Dr Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Scrapping freedom of movement will make recruiting staff for NHS Scotland harder. And despite being paid the real living wage, lab technicians, admin staff and social care workers don't earn anywhere close to 30000 So what did he do to try and convince the Home Secretary to take into account Scotland's needs? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm not going to take uh, any lectures from the Honourable Lady on Scotland's needs in relation to the NHS from an S 
SNP that has put up tax in Scotland so that doctors and nurses in Scotland pay more tax than anywhere else in the UK. Speaker, I was interested to hear the Secretary of State's comments about Scottish businesses. CBI Scotland said that the proposals outlined in the White Paper don't meet Scotland's needs and were a sucker punch. Isn't it the case that this hostile immigration policy proves the Tory government is anti-business? Mr Speaker, I'm really pleased to hear the Honourable Lady supporting the CBI because the CBI couldn't have been clearer. They don't want a separate Scottish immigration policy. They want one immigration policy for the whole of the United Kingdom, and I agree with them on that. Jimmy Linden. I'm sorry, yeah. Mr. Speaker, this is absolutely pathetic. When we look yeah. at you know, Greenfield Park here, home in my constituents, we have an ageing population. We need people to come and look after the folk that live in Greenfield Park here, home. And the Secretary of State is absolutely out of touch with this. Yeah. Only get a grip and understand Scotland's immigration needs are entirely different from this London-centric policy pursued by this British government. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I understand very well the issues uh, uh, that face uh, Scotland. I don't believe that they would be better served by having a separate uh, immigration policy in Scotland, and I don't believe that immigration into Scotland is well served by a Scottish government who puts up uh, tax, has a poor record on infrastructure and housing. Marian Fellows. For the Scottish Federation of Small Businesses has said the UK government's obstinate approach to immigration is a clear threat to local communities, making it nigh impossible for the vast majority of Scottish firms to get the labour and skills they need to grow and sustain their businesses. What part of that comprehensive statement would the Secretary of State care to dis- disagree with? Yeah. Oh, I've set out in my uh, previous uh, answers that the immigration white paper is uh, is a consultation and the FSB and others are contributing uh, to that and we uh, we will uh, listen to it we, I am clear that Scotland benefits from a UK wide uh, immigration policy but I also believe that there are things that the Scottish government could do to make Scottish Scotland more attractive for people to come to Drew Hendry yeah. Mr. Speaker, following the disgraceful Christmas video aimed at EU nationals and then the cata- catastrophic defeat for his government last night. Will he, event- will he now urge his government to end the hostile approach yeah. to our EU friends, neighbours and colleagues <laughs> vital to the Scottish economy and communities? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree that EU uh, nationals have played an enormous uh, part uh, in the Scottish economy and more widely in civic society. And I wanted to give them certainty last night in relation to what their position would be, and that's why I voted for the deal. Ross Thompson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Is the Secretary of State aware that on the 10th of January this year the Times reported a study conducted by one of Britain's leading social surveys which shows that Scots do not want immigration to be devolved. Does he agree that that is a hammer blow to the calls of the SNP and that the biggest danger to Scotland is their drive for another independence referendum which puts people off wanting to come to Scotland? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it, uh, uh, it, it's certainly clear that the SNP does something uh, to put off people coming to Scotland. Last night I read that Boy George was going to be moving to Scotland. This morning the First Minister of Scotland engaged with him and now we hear he's not coming. <laughs> Uh, David Ducate. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Can my right honourable friend uh, confirm that the Home Office and the, and the, the government in general are, will continue to engage and have been engaging, but will continue to engage with Scottish businesses uh, in consultation of the immigration bill? Yes. A, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to engage. The white paper is an engagement uh, process, and I know that a, uh, my honourable friend, as a, the great champion of the fishing industry that he is, has already brought forward issues in relation not just to fishing vessels but to fish processing. Luke Graham. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, I welcome this Government's move to guarantee EU citizens' rights here in the United Kingdom. Unlike the SNP in 2014, who threatened EU citizens that 160,000 would be stripped of their right to remain in Scotland, no unilateral guarantee was given to EU citizens by the SNP in 2014, but it is by this Government. So can my Honourable Friend clarify the direct communication this Government is having with EU citizens in my constituency and elsewhere in Scotland to make sure they are welcome and 
highly part of our community. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the Government is engaged in a process uh, of not just uh, engaging uh, with EU citizens, but uh, setting out very uh, clearly for them how they can uh, proceed in the process of settled status. John Stevenson. Mr Speaker, the borderlands area on both sides of the border needs to attract more people to come and live and work in that area. Would the Minister agree with me that the way to do that is through investment, both private and uh, public, and create the business environment for, in, for that investment, not by increasing taxes and regulation? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I uh, absolutely uh, agree with uh, my colleague, and as he knows, this Government uh, fully supports the uh, Borderlands uh, initiative. It is investment, it is improving uh, infrastructure uh, and housing that will bring about uh, making uh, s the south of Scotland, north of England uh, more attractive, not putting up taxes. Colin Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tax divergence by the Scottish Government is damaging my Gordon constituency, struggling to attract overseas workers to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and the oil and gas industry. Would the Secretary of State agree this is economic madness which makes Scotland unattractive? Mr Speaker, as I have said many times before uh, in this chamber, I remain at an absolute loss to understand why the SNP think making Scotland the most highly taxed part of the United Kingdom is an attractive proposition to bring people to Scotland. Mr Stephen Kerr. Mr Speaker, can I, can I as the Member of Parliament for Dunblane add my admiration for Sir Andy Murray and indeed for his mother? On the issue of the White Paper on Future Immigration, does my right hon. Friend agree that the salary floor of £30,000 makes it difficult for Scotland to retain international graduates when the average graduate salary is £21,000? There has to be the opposite of London waiting, doesn't there? I, I think my hon. Friend makes a very good point, and I am sure that that is one that will be taken very much into account as we move forward the engagement process with the White Paper. Paul Sweeney. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State's Government have been responsible for pursuing an agenda where immigrants are demonised. We saw over the um, last year with the hostile environment policy, we saw over the Christmas break when the Home Secretary declared a national crisis when a handful of refugees made the perilous journey across the Channel, and we now see it in black and white in the form of the immigration white paper. So my question is simple. Will the Secretary of State apologise for his government's demonisation of immigrants and its harmful consequences for the Scottish economy? Mr Speaker, of course I don't accept uh, the Honourable Gentleman's characterisation uh, of events. Uh, Scotland uh, remains a place which should be uh, welcome uh, for uh, migrants wherever uh, they come from. The White Paper sets out a basis for a consultation for developing a new immigration policy post-Brexit, and I encourage everyone to take part in that consultation. Kelvin Hopkins. Number two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Ministry of Defence spent nearly £1.6 billion with British, uh, Scot Scottish businesses in 2016 17, supporting some 10,500 jobs. I think that this really does demonstrate the vital contribution of the workforce in Scotland to defending the UK from the growing threats that we face from across the globe. Gilbert Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. At Defence Questions on 26 November, I raised concerns about the desperate shortage of Royal Navy coastal defence vessels, numbering just three, to the minister, according to the Minister. It is also the case that Scottish shipyards have suffered from major cuts in defence orders. Will the Government now right both these wrongs by allocating new orders for coastal defence vessels from Scottish shipbuilders? I am afraid I do not agree with the Honourable Gentleman. We have secured 20 years' worth of work. Uh, on the Clyde with the uh, shipyards there, I think we would be hard pressed to find any industry in the UK that could say that they have secured 20 years worth of work that helps their workforce for the future. 
Question here. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, armed Forces personnel in my constituency of Angus and across Scotland warmly welcomed the UK Government's intervention last year to mitigate the Scottish Government's income tax increase. Can my honourable friend confirm that in fact the UK Government will seek to continue this mitigation to ensure our Armed Forces personnel are not out of pocket in Scotland? Well, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this very important issue. Uh, and the Ministry of Defence is reviewing the Scottish Government's plans for next year's tax. Uh, we await the final outcome and ratification from the Scottish Parliament. We will review the situation and determine whether the impact on the UK Armed Forces warrants uh, an offer of financial mitigation. And once a decision has been made, an announcement will be made to this House and to those personnel affected. Happy birthday, Mr Sweeney. Yeah. I gather it's a significant birthday. 30 today. Don't look a day older than 20. Um, Ian Murray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The defence sector is critical for the Scottish economy, but so are other sectors like financial services, higher education, food and drink, and indeed fisheries. So would the Minister have a chat with the Secretary of State to make sure in Cabinet the Secretary of State is insisting that a no deal is ruled out? Uh, I, think, uh, I, I do admire the honourable gentleman's ingenious way of bringing in uh, issues around defence industry in this way, but I would say that my right honourable friend is constantly fighting for Scotland around the Cabinet table, and he will continue to do so long into the future. Chris Stevens. Oh. And tradition of all that continues, but there, are, there is key uh, work being uh, key contracts for the land platform, uh, which the minister is aware of. Can he tell us um, how uh, uh, what he's doing to make sure Scotland gets a good share of the, that, those land platform contracts? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, as I said to, uh, earlier, you know, in terms of the Ministry of Defence, we are trying to build in a, a good shipbuilding programme so that actually shipyards around uh, the country know what the MOD's requirements are going to be for the next 30 years so that they can plan accordingly. But we also want them to be incredibly competitive so that they're able to compete for competition for commercial lines, not just in this country, but for opportunities that exist around the world. What would the impact be of the breakup of the union on uh, defence supply companies based in Scotland? Catastrophic. Elizabeth Laird. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to start by adding my sentiments to those expressed by the Secretary of State on our wonderful sportsman, Andy Murray. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State has turned his back on Scotland's great shipbuilding tradition by putting the solid fleet solid support contract out to international tender. The Secretary of State will no doubt trot out the line that these are not warships. However, the Minister of State for Defence, Lord L, responded to a written question saying they were non-complex warships. Well, I grew up in a shipbuilding community. A warship carried weapons, explosives and ammunition, which is exactly what these ships do. So, if these are not warships, what are they? Well, I have made this point consistently, and the Honourable Lady will know that, that the the National Shipbuilding Strategy defines warships as frigates, destroyers and aircraft carriers. The primary role of the FSS ships is the replenishment of naval vessels with bulk stores. They are not uh, uh, combatant naval auxiliary support ships, and therefore they will go out to international competition. But what I am delighted to see is that there is a a British bid for that competition. Leslie Laird. Well, can I suggest to the Secretary of State that he might want to go and visit a shipyard, as I'm sure there's plenty of workers there that would like to give him a different account of that strategy. These are high-skilled, high-paid jobs that could return £2.3 billion of revenue to the Treasury while providing sustainable employment and ensuring that communities continue to thrive. Instead, the Secretary of State is torpedoing Scottish shipbuilding in favour of bargain basement deals. So, will he allow this Prime Minister to continue the destructive legacy of Thatcher 
or will he support the Scottish Labour Party and the Labour Party and back our plans to finally stand up for the Scottish shipbuilding and to protect and create jobs in the industry? Well, it may have escaped the Honourable Lady's attention that I'm not the Secretary of State, and I have visited many of the shipyards around uh, this country and in Scotland, and I've seen for myself how good they are doing. And what we want is them to be competitive so that they can have a long-term future. We've got 20 years of work guaranteed for Scotland's uh, shipyards. I think that's something that we can be proud of on this side of the House. Mr Speaker, listen to me. Minister Andrew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have been making good progress since the Government's intention to negotiate a Murray deal, uh, which was announced in September uh, last year. The partners there have submitted a number of project proposals which are currently being scrutinised. Douglas Ross. Grateful to the Minister for that response. The MOD are one of the largest employers in Murray and set to get even bigger with the significant UK Government investment. Given that local personnel at Kinloss Barracks and RAF Lossiemouth are already engaged with the Murray Growth Deal, will the Minister confirm that his department will now play a significant role in this very important deal for Murray? Well, first of all, I'd like to pay tribute to my humble friend for the work that he's doing with this deal. I know that he takes a very keen interest in it, and so does the Ministry of Defence. Um, we, in terms of uh, surplus land being released at Forsyth as part of the Stirling deal, uh, and uh, he is right that, uh, that as a local employer we are an important player in that area, and I can confirm that the Ministry of Defence is exploring opportunities for involvement in his local growth deal. Kirsty Blackman. Mr Speaker, I meet regularly with the Scottish Government in a number of forums to discuss a range of matters related to EU exit. The JMC plenary met on 19 December and was attended by the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales, along with the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Steve Blackman! (laughs) Will he encourage the Prime Minister to extend Article 50? Mr uh, Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister has, has set out quite clearly that it is not her intention uh, to uh, request an extension of Article 50. Pete Wishart. Scotland wanted nothing to do with this ugly, self-defeating Brexit, but last night ten Scottish Tories voted to defy their constituents, with the other three wanting something much, much worse for Scotland. What should the Scottish people therefore do to ensure that they are suitably democratically rewarded? Mr Speaker, we're not, we're not taking lectures uh, from a man who repeatedly defies the democratic will of the Scottish people by ignoring the outcome of the 2014 independence referendum. Ace Winson. Mr Speaker, while we were in different lobbies last night, I appreciate that the Secretary of State genuinely felt that the Prime Minister's deal was the best way forward. But he can read the runes of how likely it is that that deal or any reincarnation of it will get through this House. So what personal commitment will he give that he will do everything in his power to protect Scotland from the catastrophe of a no-deal exit, including putting his country above his party and his own position? Mr Speaker, I have been uh, very clear uh, on the ramifications uh, for Scotland of a no-deal Brexit and why uh, I wanted to avoid that, and that is why uh, I voted for the deal. But I am also clear on the position I stood in the 2017 general election on a manifesto of delivering an orderly Brexit for Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, and that is what I intend to do. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I begin by associating these benches with the comments that you and the Secretary of State have made regarding Andy Murray? He is indeed a great ambassador for her, his country, and I believe in that capacity his best is yet to come. Yeah. Year, year, year. Mr Speaker, last night this place made history. We defeated the Government's plans by an unprecedented majority. These are plans on which the Secretary of State has staked his reputation and on which his fingerprints are indelibly printed. Given that that massive defeat, will he now commit 
to meaningful engagement with the Scottish Government and consideration of alternative plans, including remaining in the single market and the customs union. Mr uh, uh, Speaker, I make uh, no uh, apology for supporting uh, the Prime Minister's deal. I believe that it was the right deal for Scotland uh, and the United Kingdom. And of course, we will engage uh, constructively uh, with uh, the First Minister and the Scottish Government. But if we are to do so, then they must bring forward proposals other than stopping Brexit and starting another independence referendum. Jeopard! Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was uh, going to suggest that the Secretary of State is ill-equipped to take this process forward in Scotland, but he makes the argument for me. Given his refusal to engage properly in discussion about alternatives, given the fact he is so out of step with opinion in Scotland at every level, will he now do the decent thing and resign, step aside, so that someone else can take this forward? Mr Speaker, that's getting uh, a little tired. I thought the honourable gentleman could think of another sound uh, bite. I'm not out of step with opinion in Scotland. People in Scotland do not want another independence referendum. And they recognise that the SNP has weaponised Brexit in order to try and deliver such a referendum. William Foster. Question number six, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, leaving the common fisheries policy will allow the UK to take back control of our waters, becoming an independent coastal state. We will negotiate a fairer share of fishing opportunities to benefit fishermen in Scotland and across the whole of the United Kingdom. I thank my right honourable friend for the positive assessment he's just given the prospects not just for Scotland's fishing industry but for the whole of the UK from leaving the EU's common fisheries policy. Yet would he agree those benefits would be lost if we listen to the arguments of those who want to separate our union but reunite Scotland with the European Union's common fisheries policy? Indeed, my honourable friend is uh, absolutely right. The SNP are false friends to Scottish fishermen. They want to keep Scotland in the CFP by staying in the EU, and failing that, they want an independent Scotland to rejoin the CFP. Throughout the negotiations, this Government has shown that it has put the interests of Scottish fishermen and those across the UK at the heart of our approach to leaving the EU. Martin Whitfield. Great for Mr Speaker. Would no deal not be a disaster for the fishing industry and its support industries, and shouldn't we say no to no deal now? What, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, if that's the honourable gentleman's view, then he should have voted for the Prime Minister's deal last night. Mr. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the government's commitment to ending the CFP on the 31st of December of next year is sincere, why does the government continue to resist amendments to put that date on the face of the Fisheries Bill? I don't think that my uh, uh, right honourable former colleague will find that that is an accurate interpretation of the government's positions. And my uh, colleagues, uh, like the right, or, like the honourable gentleman for Bamford and Buchan, has argued strongly for that case. And we will see what happens when the bill returns at report stage. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Charlie Elphick. Number one, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am sure that the whole House will join me in condemning the appalling attack in Nairobi and in sending my thoughts and prayers to all those who have lost loved ones. Our High Commissioner has confirmed one British fatality and we are providing consular assistance to British nationals affected by the attack. We stand in solidarity with the Government and people of Kenya and will continue to offer our support to meet the challenge to security and stability that is posed by terrorism in the region. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. May I join with the Prime Minister in her strong condemnation of terror? Uh, and, uh, 
You will know, Mr Speaker, and the Prime Minister will know that I first sought election to this House because I believed in more jobs, lower taxes, a stronger economy, and more investment in the public services on which we all uh, rely. And does she agree that since 2010, Conservative governments have delivered time and again for the British people? And the biggest threat to that is sat on the opposition front bench who, with a leader whose policies would mean less jobs, higher taxes, a weaker economy and less investment in our public services. My, my hon. Friend is absolutely right. What have we seen under the Conservatives in government? We have seen 3.4 million more jobs. That is more people earning an income, earning a wage, able to provide for their families. We have seen more children in good and outstanding schools, more money into our National Health Service. What would put that in danger? A government led by the right honourable gentleman, more borrowing, more taxes, more spending, fewer jobs. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. May I start by correcting the record? Last night I suggested this was the largest government defeat since the 1920s. I would not wish to be accused of misleading the House. Because I've since been informed that is in fact the largest ever defeat for a government in the history of our democracy. <laughs> so Mr Speaker, shortly after the Prime Minister made her point of order last night, her spokesperson suggested the government had ruled out any form of customs union with the European Union as part of her reaching out exercise. Can the Prime Minister confirm that is the case? Uh, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that the exercise that I indicated last night is, as I said, about listening to the views of the House, about wanting to understand the views of parliamentarians, so that we can identify what could command the support of this House and deliver on the referendum. And what the government wants to do is, first of all, to ensure that we deliver on the result of the referendum. That's leaving the European Union. And we want to do it in a way that ensures we respect the votes of those who voted to leave in that referendum. That means ending free movement. It means getting a fairer deal for farmers and fishermen. It means, it means opening up new opportunities to trade with the rest of the world. And it means keeping good ties with our neighbours in Europe. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, my question was about the customs union. Yeah. The Prime Minister seems to be in denial about that, just as much as she's in denial about the decision made by the House last night. I understand the business secretary told business leaders on a conference call last night, we can't have no deal for all the reasons you've set out. Can the Prime Minister now reassure the House, businesses and the country and confirm that is indeed the government's position that we can't have no deal? I think that the point that the Business Secretary is making and that he has made previously is that if you don't want to have no deal, you have to ensure that you have a deal. Now, I will give this, I will give this to... I will, I will say this to the right honourable gentleman. There are actually two ways of avoiding no deal. The first is to agree a deal, and the second would be to revoke Article 50. Now, that would mean staying in the European Union, failing to respect the result of the referendum, and that is, and that is something that this government will not do. Prime Minister hasn't answered on a customs union, hasn't answered on, on no deal, and continues to spend £4.2 billion of public money on a no deal scenario. Yeah. Can't she understand? Yesterday the House rejected her deal. She needs to come up with something different yeah. than that. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not just on Brexit that this government is failing. Four million working people are living in poverty. Half a million more children in poverty compared to 2010. The Roundtree Foundation confirms in-work poverty is rising faster than the overall employment rate. With poverty rising, can the Prime Minister tell us when we can expect it to fall for the time she remains in office? Can I tell the right honourable gentleman what is happening? We now see one million fewer people in absolute poverty. Under the, that, 
That is a record low. We see 300,000 fewer children in absolute poverty. That is a record low. We see a record low in the number of children living in workless households. An income inequality, income inequality lower than at any point under the last Labour government. That's Conservatives delivering for the people of this country. What would we see from the Labour Party? £1,000 billion pounds more in borrowing and taxes, the equivalent of £35,000 for every household in this country. That's Labour failing to deliver for working people because working people always pay the price of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corby. In denial on a customs union, in denial on no deal, in denial on the amount of money being spent preparing for no deal, in denial on last night's result. And even the UN rapporteur on poverty says the government is... Well, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's very, it's very telling, very telling indeed, that as soon as I mention the report of the UN rapporteur who said the government was in a state of denial about poverty in Britain, Tory MPs start jeering. Tell that to people queuing up at food banks. The government too, Mr Speaker, has failed on children's education. Can the Prime Minister tell us what is her greatest failure? Is it that education funding has been cut by seven billion? Per pupil funding fallen by eight per cent, sixth form funding cut by a fifth, or that the adult skills budget has been slashed by forty five per cent? Which is it, Prime Minister? Hundreds of free schools, a reformed curriculum, 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools, narrowing the attainment gap for disadvantaged children. This is a government that is delivering the education that our children need for their future. But I say to the right honourable gentleman, he says he talks about being in denial. The only person in denial in this chamber is him, because he has consistently, consistently failed to set out what his policy on Brexit is. I said to him last week, I said to him last week that uh, he might do with a lip reader. I think when it comes to his Brexit policy, the rest of us need a mind reader. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is very well aware that we want there to be a customs union with the EU. She seems to be in denial about that. But one of the problems she has on her denial is the flagrant disregard for dis- facts and statistics. And the Statistics Authority has written to the Department of Education four times to express their concern about the use of dodgy figures by her ministers. When police officers told the then Home Secretary not to make more cuts to police, that Home Secretary accused them of crying wolf. With 21,000 fewer police officers and rising crime across the country, does the Prime Minister accept that the then Home Secretary got it wrong? I say to the right honourable gentleman, of course, as we look at what is happening, particularly at what is happening on knife crime and serious violence, we recognise the need to uh, take action. That's why we've introduced the Offensive Weapons Bill, and it's why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has uh, introduced the Serious Violence Strategy. It's also, we are also making nearly £1 billion more available to police forces uh, over the next year. But I also say to the right honourable gentleman, Yet again, in all of these questions about public services, he only ever talks about the money that's going in. What matters, what matters with the police is the powers that we give them as well. And what was it? What was it when we came to the issue of knife crime? When we came to the issue of knife crime, when we came to the issue of taking more action at criminals who were involved in knife crime, when we said that if somebody was caught on the streets for a second time for a knife crime, they should be sent to prison, what did the right honourable gentleman do? He voted against. He doesn't support our police. He doesn't support our security. Jeremy Corbyn increased the number of police on our streets. It was a Labour government that brought in safer neighbourhoods. It was a Labour government that properly funded the police force. It's the Tories that have cut it. Ask anyone on any street around this country, do they feel safer now than they did eight years ago? I think we all know what the answer would be. It was that Home Secretary that not only attacked the police with that, but also created the hostile environment and the Windrush scandal. 
She promised to tackle burning injustices. She's made them worse, as Windrush showed. More homelessness, more children in poverty, more older people without care, longer waits at A&E, fewer nurses, rising crime, less safe streets, cuts to children's education. This government has failed our country. It cannot govern, cannot command the support of most people facing the most important issue at the moment, which is Brexit. They failed again and lost the vote last night. Isn't it the case, Mr Speaker, that with every other previous Prime Minister faced with the scale of defeat last night, they would have resigned and the country would be able to choose the government that they want? The right honourable gentleman in that peroration talked about the importance of the issue of Brexit that is facing this country. Later today we will have, we're going to have the no confidence debate. He has been calling for weeks for a general election in this country and yet on Sunday when he was asked in a general election would he campaign to leave the European Union, he refused to answer. Not once, not twice, not three times, but five times he refused to answer. So on what he himself describes as the key issue facing this country, he has no answer. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition has let anti-Semitism run riot in his party. our allies, weaken our security and wreck our economy, and we will never let that happen. The Prime Minister will be aware of the Sirius Minerals project in my constituency that is already employing around a thousand people and is set to boost British exports by £2 billion. From her visits to China, where she met the company's customers, she will know how how important this polyhalite fertiliser product can be around the world. The company is currently seeking a Treasury guarantee to complete its financing. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this is precisely the sort of project the Government should be supporting to show our commitment to the Northern Powerhouse and the industrial strategy? Can I, can I say to my right honourable friend, uh, I'd like to thank you for raising this issue because I was uh, particularly pleased to meet the CEO, CEO of Sirius during my trip to China and talk to them about the work that they're doing. And it is, as he says, exactly projects like this that drive investment and exports in the North that are what the Northern Powerhouse is all about. Now, in relation to the particular discussions my right honourable friend mentioned, I'm sure he'll understand these are commercially sensitive so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the specific discussions. But this, as I say, is exactly the sort of project that is what the Northern Powerhouse is all about, in driving investment, driving experts, good for the North. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity in Kenya and, of course, our solidarity with the people there? Mr Speaker, yesterday the Attorney-General said that any New Deal would be much the same as the one already on the table. We know that the European Union won't renegotiate. If the Prime Minister survives today to bring forward her Plan B, will she concede that Plan B will basically be a redressing of Plan A? As I said in one of my answers to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, what we want to do following the defeat that, uh, that we had in this House last night is listen to parliamentarians and find out the point at which uh, what is it that would secure the support of this House. That is the question that we will be asking, but that is against the background of ensuring that we deliver on the referendum result, that we leave the European Union and we recognise what people were voting for when they voted in that referendum result, an end to free movement, ensuring that we could have trade and negotiate, uh, have our own trade policy with the rest of the world, be fairer to our farmers, fairer to our fishermen, but maintain that good relationship with our neighbours in the EU. Ian Blackford. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, that simply didn't address the question. The EU won't renegotiate. The Prime Minister has no answer. She has failed. What an omni shambles from this government, suffering a historic and a humiliating defeat, the worst for any UK government. Westminster is in chaos. But in Scotland, we stand united. Mr Speaker, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain, and we will not allow our country 
to be dragged out of the European Union or brought down by this Tory government. The Prime Minister knew that this deal was dead since Chequers. She knew it was dead when she moved the meaningful vote, and she knows, as we all know, last night was the last straw. The Prime Minister must now seek the confidence of the people, not simply the confidence of this House. The only way forward is to extend Article 50 and ask the people of Scotland and of the United Kingdom whether they want the Prime Minister's deal or whether they want to remain in the European Union. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister now must legislate for a people's vote. To the right honourable gentleman, as he knows, I, as I, and as I have said before, this House legislated for a people's vote. It legislated for a people's vote that was held in 2016, and that vote, that vote determined that the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. He talks about our country. Our country is the whole of the United Kingdom. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it is for the whole of the United Kingdom that we will be looking for a solution that secures the support of this House and ensures that this Parliament delivers on the vote of the people. Jeremy Lefroy. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of all the members of the All Party Group on Kenya, which I chair, and on behalf of my honourable friend, the member for Mid Derbyshire, the Prime Minister's trade envoy to Kenya, can we express our sincere condolences and sympathy to the President and people of Kenya yeah. and encourage them in their fight against this terrorism? Yeah. Um, my right, right honourable friend has rightly committed very, very substantial amounts of extra money to the NHS, her and her government, and the plan produced last week is very encouraging. But can she also look at the difference between the money given to the highest CCGs and the lowest CCGs per head. We are not wanting to see amounts come down, but we do want to see a fairer formula to allocate money for those CCGs receiving the lowest amount of funding. I thank my honourable friend for the remarks that he made uh, from his position as chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group, as I understand it, on uh, Kenya. I was pleased when I visited Kenya last August to meet with some of those who are working to fight terrorism, doing very important work to bring stability and security to people in that region, and very important that is too. Um, First of all, I thank my honourable friend for highlighting the long-term plan that we have set out for the National Health Service. Uh, The the resources allocated to CCGs reflect the needs of the population, and that includes levels of deprivation and the age age profile of the population. And uh, changes have been made to the allocations for 2019-20, increasing the fair share allocations for Staffordshire CCGs, which I am sure my honourable friend is particularly uh, interested in. And they will see a higher level of growth in their actual budgets over the next five years. And that difference will ensure that over time funding across the Staffordshire and Stoke on Trent CCGs will become fairer. So that biggest cash boost in the NHS's history is enabling us to do that. And I think that I hope that will be addressing the issue that my honourable friend has raised. Kyle. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Prime Minister's defeat yesterday was historic and titanic. Yeah. Everything has changed and she has to change too. Yesterday, thousands of people descended on Parliament Square to demand their say. Nobody was taken to the streets demanding a Norway or a Canada option. She, when she came to power, she promised that she would give people more power over their lives. If she is not going to give people power to have a say over this deal, then what is the point of that promise in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. to the honourable gentleman that he cannot ignore the fact that in the 2016 referendum that in the 2016 referendum the people of this country voted to leave the european union and i believe that it is a duty not just of government but of parliament to ensure that we deliver on that we will be we will be speaking to parliamentarians in my my own party, the DUP, across the House, about uh, finding a way that secures the support of the House uh, for the way forward. But I say to the Honourable Gentleman once again, a vote was taken in 2016, and I believe it is incumbent on this Parliament to deliver on that vote. Judy Harrison. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will remember from her visits to Copeland 
just how capable our nuclear community is and how proud we are of that heritage. Yeah. Would she consider meeting with me and a small delegation of Cumbrian nuclear workers to understand how important Muirside is to Copeland and to also bear in mind the solutions that the Centre of <coughs> Nuclear Excellence can bring to that challenge. Yeah. Yes. Well, can I thank my friend? When I have visited Copeland, it's been very clear to me not only the expertise and skills that uh, in the nuclear industry that, that uh, uh, are there with the population, but also the importance of the nuclear industry. Um, as regards the Moorside site, it, is, uh, it will revert to the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, and we are considering options for its future. It, the site does remain eligible for new nuclear nuclear new build, and we are committed to seeing new nuclear as part of our future energy mix. But uh, can I say to my honourable friend that I think it might be helpful if the relevant minister from the business department were to meet with her and that group to be able to explore this issue further. Seema Malhotra. Mr Speaker, last night in this House, after the biggest government defeat in history, the Prime Minister said... The Government will approach meetings with parliamentarians in a constructive spirit. But it appears that cross-party talks means inviting people in to tell them why her deal is best or to see if they've got any ideas on how to get her deal through. (laughs) Apparently now, Number 10's resistance to a customs union with the European Union after Brexit was a principle and not a red line. So which is it? And if she is genuinely seeking to work with Parliament and hear the will of this House, is she prepared to change any of her red lines and work to bring Parliament and the country together on how we move forward? As I said in the House last night, I will be talking to parliamentarians on, in my own party, in the DUP, in other parties across this House, and will be, and will be ensuring and will be looking to see what it is that can secure the support of this House. But again, I say to the Honourable Lady, as I have said to her Honourable and Right Honourable friends, that what this House must always have in mind is the importance of delivering on the vote of the people to leave the European Union. Mrs Helen Grant. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that if we fail to deliver on Brexit, the public perception of politicians in this country will be at an all-time low? Yes. I I absolutely agree with my honourable friend, and this this is so important. I believe that if we fail to deliver on what the British people instructed us to do in the vote of the referendum, that uh, that the views of the British people of this House of Parliament and of politicians will be at an all-time low because they will have lost they will have lost faith in politicians across the whole of this Parliament. We need to deliver Brexit for the British people. Dr Roberta Blackman Woods. Speaker, the Prime Minister may have created a, bre- a Brexit crisis, but other crises are unfolding too. Chronic health conditions and obesity in the North East are the highest of any English region, and people in Durham over 65 can only expect eight years of healthy living compared to 14 in Windsor and Maidenhead. So why on earth is the Prime Minister planning to cut Durham's public health budget by a massive 40% that will not only worsen health outcomes of my constituents, it will ultimately cost the NHS more and further widen health inequalities. Well, I say to the Honourable Lady, of course, in terms of public health spend, uh, funding, that will be looked at in the spending review. But if she assumes that the only action that is taken in relation to obesity and other uh, conditions in terms of prevention is through public health, that is not the case. If she looks at the NHS long-term plan that has been uh, announced and looks, uh, funded of course by the biggest cash boost in the NHS's history given by this government, what she will see is an emphasis on prevention and an emphasis on ensuring that people are able to lead healthier, independent lives for longer. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I sat through uh, many hours on every day but one of the recent debate and I did listen very carefully to the extraordinary range of views that was expressed on all sides throughout it. 
and it did seem to me that the only clear majorities in this House on a cross-party basis are firstly against leaving with no deal, uh, 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 again in favour of extending Article 50 to give us time to sort out what it is we now propose to do, and in favour of a customs union, some form of customs union, and some sufficient regulatory alignment to keep all our borders between the United Kingdom and the European Union open after we leave. Will the Prime Minister not, just as I have had to accept that the majority in this House is committed to the UK leaving the European Union, that she must accept that she must now modify her red lines, which she created for herself at Lancaster House, and find a cross-party majority, which will be along the lines that I have indicated? My, my right honourable friend started off by saying there were a considerable num- was a considerable number of views across this House. It is precisely because of that that we will be undertaking the discussions with members, uh, with parliamentarians, that I indicated would happen last night. That I indicated would happen last night. He talks about the uh, possible extension of Article 50. Of course, Article 50 cannot be extended by the UK. It has to be extended in in, uh, consultation, in agreement with the European Union. The government's policy policy is that we're leaving the European Union on the 29th of March. But But the EU would only extend Article 50 if actually it was clear there was a plan that was moving towards an agreed deal. That's, that is the crucial element of ensuring we deliver on Brexit, is being able to get the agreement of this House to the deal that will deliver on the referendum result, leave the European Union and recognise what lay behind that vote when people voted to leave. Graham Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my constituency, in the villages of Easington, Colliery, Horden and Blackhall, yeah, yeah. there are colliery roads standing derelict, characterised by low demand, high void rates, many are not fit for human habitation, the neglected by absentee landlords, a magnet for antisocial behaviour and crime. So will the Prime Minister commit to provide the funding required for the housing master plan developed by Durham County Council to fix these issues? And if she can't do that, will she please get out of the way and call a general election? Let us have a Labour government that will address this. To the, uh, can I say to the honourable gentleman, I haven't seen the housing master plan that he has uh, that he has referred to. But of course, it is this government, it is this government that has put more money into affordable homes, that has put more money into uh, ensuring that we're seeing more homes being built, and that is and that has lifted lifted the cap on uh, local councils, so that local councils are also able to build more homes and the homes that people want. Tracy Crouch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker, next month I and my three neighbouring colleagues from Maidstone, Tunbridge Morning and Faversham and Kent will host our second apprenticeship fair, connecting nearly 40 leading organisations with more than 700 pupils from 22 schools. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that apprenticeships offer a viable alternative to full-time higher education, while creating a skilled workforce that benefits business and its future employees? Can I, can I first of all commend my honourable friend for the work that she's doing in her constituency through the jobs fairs? And can I absolutely agree with her? I think it is very important that young people are able to see that there are different routes for them for their futures, uh, different uh, routes into the workplace, and apprenticeships is an important uh, route for some young people. All the apprentices I meet say the best thing they have done is taken up an apprenticeship, and that was right for them. We want every young person to be able to take the route through, be it higher education, further education and apprenticeship, the route that is right for them. Yasmin Qureshi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the 60s and 70s, 1.2 million criminal skills were prescribed to women, including three of my constituents. Each dosage was equivalent to 40 oral contraceptives. Thousands of babies were born with deformities. A recent MHRA review is widely criticised for being a whitewash. Now, Professor Carl Hennigan at Oxford University has published a review of the scientific data that clearly shows that criminals did cause deformities. Will the Prime Minister ensure that any response to this review does not involve the MHRA as we have no faith in them? 
Can I say, obviously, to the Honourable Lady, this is an important issue. It's been raised by a number of members from across the House, and uh, our priority always is on safety of patients, and members, uh, ministers are aware of the new uh, study that has come out. We have a commitment to review any new evidence in this area, and we do that, but we do it by co- with consulting independent scientific experts. And Baroness Cumberledge is leading the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. That's expected to examine what happened in the case of Prima Dos and will determine what further action is needed. But can I reassure the Honourable Lady that we will listen very carefully to any recommendations that come out of the review, and of course uh, that study will be looked at very carefully to see what, comes, uh, what has come out of that study. Dr. Philip Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend, particularly since last night, recognise that in these complex circumstances, that her role as Prime Minister now is to create the political environment in which solutions to the Brexit conundrum can be found, and not to continue with a plan expecting a different outcome? And does she also accept then that if she cannot get what she wants, that she will need to change her mind? in order to secure public confidence. Can I say to my honourable friend that, uh, as I have pointed out today and as I said last night, it is precisely because we recognise that we need to uh, understand rather better where it is that what it is that can command the support of this House and can secure the poise point of this House, that we will be looking and we will be talking to parliamentarians across the House that includes parliamentarians, includes my colleagues, honourable and right honourable friends, includes the uh, Democratic Unionist Party and parliamentarians across other houses, because, as my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Rushcliffe, said, there is quite a variety of views across this House about what is right. Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. Mr Speaker, sir, the deal that was defeated last night is a product of her own red lines. So which of those red lines is she willing to give up in order to get the compromise she seeks. We will be, as I said last night, we will be approaching these talks, these discussions, in a constructive spirit. But underlying what we will be doing is the need to ensure that we deliver on the referendum result and we deliver Brexit. Raymond Chishti. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the recent statement by the Foreign Office. Britain must do more to support persecuted Christians. In light of that, will the government now review its position on the Asha Bibi case and offer her asylum in the UK so she can choose which safe destination she wants to go to and not the UK asking a third country to take her in, which would mean shifting our moral responsibility to another country? And that can't be right. Can I, I hope, reassure my honourable friend by saying that, as I've said previously, our primary concern is for the safety and well-being of Asia Bibi and her family. And uh, obviously the UK's High Commissioner in Islamabad is keeping me and the Government up to date with developments. We have been in contact with international partners about our shared desire to see a swift and positive resolution in this case. And a number of countries are in discussions about a possible alternative destination for Asia Bibi once the legal process is complete. I'm not going to comment on the details of that because this is, uh, we do not want to compromise Asia Bibi's long-term safety. Uh, and on the timing, I think the Foreign Minister from Pakistan has confirmed she will remain under the protection of the Pakistan government until the legal process has concluded. And the Prime Minister of Pakistan has supported the Supreme Court and promised to uphold the rule of law. What matters is ensuring that we are providing for the safety and well-being of Asia Bibi and her family. Ronnie Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said in a recent survey that four million in-work workers are living in poverty. Isn't that a damning report of nine years of this Tory government? And will she stop being so hard and fast and call a general election? I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I I referred earlier to the figures of uh, people in absolute poverty, which are at a record low under this government. Uh, But he talks about people who are in work. What well, this government has taken a number of steps, a number of steps to help those people who are in work. We have been cutting, we cut taxes for 32 million people. We've increased the national uh, living wage. We've helped people by freezing fuel duty. And what happened? What happened in a number of the measures that we have taken to give to give financial help?
help to people who are just about managing, to people the sort of people he's talking about. Unfortunately, in so many cases, the Labour Party oppose those measures. Martin Vickers. Mr Speaker, in an article I posted on my website in November, I I concluded by saying hopefully we will eventually come to a position that both sides who support the agreement and those like me who oppose it can coalesce. I believe this could happen over coming weeks, though there may be more drama before we reach that point. Mr Speaker, I think we've all had our fair share of drama, but would my right honourable friend agree agree with me that it's not both sides, meaning remain and leave, who must coalesce around an agreement, it is the European Union. And can I urge her to continue uh, negotiations with Europe in, in the hope of them showing some flexibility? Can I thank my honourable friend for pointing out a very, what is a very obvious point, but actually has been, not been raised by those who have been talking about the sort of discussions we will have across this Parliament, which is, I want to see what will secure the support of the House, but of course we do have to ensure that that can secure the support of the European Union, because this is a treaty and agreement between two parties. And as I said last night, uh, once we have uh, those ideas from the, uh, from the House, I will of course take those to the European Union. David Crosby. In March 2010, Greater Manchester Police had 8,148 police officers and the Chief Constable wanted 10,000. By June 2018, we had 6,199 and the numbers are still going down. Incidents of crime are rising right across Bolton. And is it any wonder, and more importantly, Mr Speaker, is it acceptable that the police are failing to attend violent attacks and systematic drug dealing locations. I say to the honourable gentleman, as I indicated earlier, we have, as a government, made more money available to uh, police forces. Uh, next year, uh, nearly a billion pounds extra will be available to uh, to police forces. Uh, but. It isn't just, of course, about the money that's available to police forces. It is about the power that the police have. And uh, that is why we have been introducing the Offensive Weapons Bill. It's why we continually take action to make sure that the police have the power they need to keep us safe. Nikki Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Further to her point of order last night and the questions asked so far at this question time, does my right and my friend agree that we all need to maintain maximum flexibility if we are to build a consensus around Brexit in this House? Yes, as I said last night, we will approach the discussions we will have with honourable members and right honourable members across this House with, uh, in a constructive spirit. The, the one, uh, and as I said earlier, what we do need to retain, though, as we're looking at those uh, discussions to find what will secure the support of the House, is to remember that what we are doing is finding a way to deliver Brexit and deliver on the vote of the British people. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I don't like to worry the Prime Minister, but it is notable that I had a question at David Cameron's final PMQs. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, after the Prime Minister's crushing defeat, she said, EU citizens who have made their home here deserve clarity on these questions as soon as possible. Mr Speaker, the clarity is in the Prime Minister's own hands. So will she now show leadership Prove that she values EU nationals, scrap the settled, yep. the settled status yep. fee, and give here, a guarantee here, here. to all EU nationals that their future in the UK is secure. Here. I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, the withdrawal agreement that was negotiated with the European Union set out the ways in which EU citizens' rights would be guaranteed here in the United Kingdom and reciprocal rights for UK citizens in the European Union would be guaranteed. Now, the vote last night rejected that package of the withdrawal agreement and and the, uh, and the political declaration. We have said as a government and made it clear that e- in a no deal situation we would also guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are living here, and we stand by that. Gillian Keegan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No country has ever left the EU using Article 50, so I do not underestimate the challenge. But back in the real world, businesses up and down the country, with the possible exception of Weatherspoons, are extremely (laughs) disappointed with last night's vote. And short-term investment decisions are still on hold or going against the UK. Would the Prime Minister agree that protecting just-in-time supply chains, on which my constituents' jobs depend, must be at the heart of any solution? Can I say to my Honourable 
concerned that she has raised a very important point because, of course, what the deal we put to Parliament last night, one of the things it did do was to protect those just in time supply chain models, and our position on their importance has not changed. Uh, today, as we look ahead to today's vote, backing the government today will enable us to find a way forward on Brexit and on the issues, as she says, that matter at home and ensure that this country has the government it needs to take it forward, uh, to take it forward, to deliver on the referendum and, as she says, ensure that we are protecting the jobs not just of her constituents but jobs around the whole of this country. Yeah. D. Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Will the nuclear power station, is it £20 billion? Pound? UK Japan trade deal of vital importance to North Wales, to North West England, and to UK energy policy as a whole. Did the Prime Minister discuss its difficulties with the Prime Minister of Japan last week? And if not, why not? We have been we have been working uh, with Hitachi. We have been working with the government of Japan. And yes, I did raise the issue of the Wilfa uh, uh, site with the Prime Minister of Japan last week. Of course, the company involved will be making a commercial decision in relation to this matter. The government has been in discussion with them for some time, has been providing uh, support. We do want to see new nuclear as part of our energy mix in the future. We also have to make sure that the cost of any energy that is provided by nuclear is at a, a reasonable level for the consumer. Kirsten Hare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently welcomed the news from the Secretary of State for Defence and his ministerial team that, in fact, 4 or 5 Commando would remain at RM Condor in my constituency. And Zulu Company, part of the 4 or 5 Commando group, recently took part in specialist chemical training, which will ensure they are ready to respond first to any chemical or biological attacks such as the one that we had in Salisbury earlier uh, last year. Can the Prime Minister join with me in congratulating the Royal Marines at 4 or 5 Commando, all the men and women that work at the base, for the tireless work that they do to keep our country safe? Yeah. Well, can I, can I uh, say to my honourable friend, I'd like to thank her for raising this issue. I know uh, she has raised this in her Westminster Hall debate because it's of importance to her, but it's also of importance to many other members around this House. And I would like to pay tribute to all the Royal Marines, past and present, yeah. who served in RM Condor. And I'm pleased to say that we do plan for 4 5 Commando to remain based at RM Condor Barracks in Angus. We'll ensure they continue to have the required facilities for them to live, work and train in Angus. And I'm delighted in joining my honourable friend in congratulating Zulu Company for their hard work in keeping us safe. Mr Cable. Uh, can I first of all welcome the Prime Minister's offer of cross-party talks and she will remember as we're former colleagues that my party has a record of working with others in the national interest. <laughs> but can I... <laughs> say to her that she shouldn't even bother lifting the telephone to opposition parties unless she's willing to rule out categorically a new deal Brexit, unless she's willing to enter into a constructive conversation about a people's vote. Can I say to the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman, as I said earlier, of course, there are two ways of avoiding a no deal. One is to have a deal and one is to stay in the European Union. We will not be staying in the European Union, uh, but I look forward to having. I'm always. I'm always. I'm happy to have constructive discussions with party leaders who want to put the national interest first. Sadly, from everything I've heard, not every party leader wants to do that. Dr. Sarah Wallister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, driving off a cliff never ends well, um, particularly if it results in a crash and burn Brexit with no deal in just 72 days' time. But there's another way that we can avoid this. And that is to be realistic in extending Article 50 to allow us to put a realistic negotiated Brexit direct to the British people, to yeah, ask if it has yeah. their consent, but also to include an option to remain with the excellent deal we already have. Yeah. As I say to my honourable friend, as, as she will not be surprised to hear, because I've said it this, uh, uh, in Prime Minister's questions today. I believe we should deliver on the vote of the referendum in 2016, that we should be delivering Brexit. As I've indicated earlier to her, uh, 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 she and others have talked about extending Article 50. Uh, The European Union would only extend Article 50 in the circumstances in which it was going to be possible to come to an agreement on a deal. The talks that we will be having, the discussions I'll be having with parliamentarians across this House will be aimed at ensuring that we can find a way to secure a deal that will get the support of this House. Order.
Point of order, Hugh Merriman. Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you for your clarity uh, with regard to the behaviour of, of taking photos in this place. It was put to me this morning by my local BBC that MPs in this place didn't quite get the seriousness that the country is feeling when they behave in such a frivolous manner. I take it one stage further. We set rules and laws in this place and expect people to abide by them, but we can't seem to do that ourselves. Not a great look. Can I therefore ask you, sir, not so much a reminder of rules that we already know are in place, but what the sanctions will be for those who have broken them? And if there are no sanctions, then to a certain extent, sir, can I ask that we maybe reflect the position and change it to a position where it's currently being flouted? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order and his courtesy in warning me of his intention to raise it. I take seriously these breaches of privacy, and that is what they are. They are breaches of privacy by one colleague against others, which is why I made my statement earlier today. I do not expect to have to apply or to have to ask the House to apply sanctions on colleagues for breaches of this sort. But as a supporter of England's finest football club, the Honourable Gentleman will know that the referee has several weapons in his arsenal before resorting to yellow or red cards, and he can be assured that the Chair keeps a beady eye on offenders. Uh, th- thank you. I- I'll come to the Honourable Gentleman in a moment. Point of order, Anna Subri. Mr. Mr Speaker, um, a member of my staff was abused this morning as he sought to come to work. There were no police officers outside the embankment entrance to PCH. Uh, it wasn't just a random piece of abuse. Um, He was called a spineless C-U-N-T. I will not use that word uh, in in any circumstances. He he and no other member of staff, there is no excuse for them to be abused in this way. Some of us have broad shoulders and, you know, I'm not going to make a fuss about that. We all know what happened last week and I'm grateful that the police are finally doing something about it. But it can't be right that people are standing outside this place. This man who abused my member staff had been spoken to on three occasions this morning by police officers. They then had left their post to go somewhere else. Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to the police who keep us safe and you know the sort of conversations I and many others have had with them and I don't doubt they want to do a good job. But unless the Metropolitan Police at the most senior level now do their job and make sure that our staff have exactly the same rights as any other worker in any other business, trade or profession, it will, we will have a situation where our members of staff will simply no longer work for us. Mr Speaker, what more can we do? Let me say to the Right Honourable Lady that I was shocked to hear of that incident, and I concur entirely with everything that she has said to the Chamber today, as on a number of recent occasions. No one should be subjected to vile abuse of the kind that the Right Honourable Lady has described. I hosted a meeting in Speaker's House last week with the Commissioner for the Metropolitan Police, and I referred to the fact of that meeting in the Chamber I believe last Friday. I had written to the Commissioner and I have received a very full and encouraging reply from Cressida Dick. I won't read it out to the House, but she, whilst quite properly explaining how seriously she and her officers take their responsibilities, went on to seek to assure me of an increased police presence and, to some degree, a changed mindset in terms of the importance of proactive measures. Quite why there were no police outside Portcullis House at the time, I do not at this point know, but I intend to raise the matter because it is absolutely vital that the aspiration to achieve security is realised, if at all possible, 
in every particular case. Uh, does the leader want to come in on that? No, not at this stage. Thank you. Um, a point of order, Bob Seeley. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, may I ask for, for clarification? Are you intending to alter the standing orders of the House to change the way that business is conducted in the upcoming days and weeks? Or are you going to allow, by vote of the House, those standing orders to be changed? I ask, and excuse my ignorance on this, sir, I ask because if control of business is, for example, taken away from government on the issue of Brexit, for example, that has very significant ramifications for how we do business in this House and what is likely then to happen in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you. To the honourable gentleman, and I can answer him very simply, no, I have no intention of trying to change the standing orders of the House, and with the very greatest of respect to the honourable gentleman, whom I have known for a long time and for whose intelligence I have a very high regard, that isn't a power of the Speaker. The House is in charge of its standing orders. But insofar as the Honourable Gentleman... No, I'm not debating it with the Honourable Gentleman. He raised the point, and I am furnishing him with an answer upon which he can reflect. What I would say to him is that the later parts of his point of order were frankly hypothetical, and I cannot be expected to treat of hypothetical questions. He asked a specific point in the first part of his inquiry, and I have given him a specific reply, and we will leave it there. Thank you. Uh, point of order, Angela Regal. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, does he agree with me that the way that this House's rules have evolved and the way that the current Government has taken to ignoring opposition motions, not even deigning to vote on them, uh, coupled with the very difficult circumstances we now found, find ourselves in as a House of Commons in the aftermath of yesterday's crushing defeat of the Brexit deal, demonstrates that our standing orders, um, whilst he can't change them, probably are in need of some evolution. And I wonder whether he would agree with me to go back and think about perhaps bringing the procedure committee into play at some stage so we can take back some control from a dysfunctional <laughs> government yeah. and make certain that the will of this House can be properly put into effect. Yeah. It's not for me to bring the Procedure Committee into play. However, I am in the hands of the House, and the House can take a view on these matters and may well choose to do so. More widely, I think it is fair to say that quite a number of members of Parliament on both sides of the House, particularly some very senior and experienced members, have relayed to me over the last several months their disappointment, concern, and in some cases I would go so far as to say distress, that what they previously regarded as givens seem no longer to apply. A number of members, I simply make the point factually, a number of members, a number of senior members on the government benches have said to me that whatever they think of a particular vote, they think that if there is a vote, for example, on an opposition motion, it should be honoured because they are putting their commitment to Parliament in front of their commitment to party. So I put that out there. And these matters will be aired in this chamber and ultimately decided upon in this chamber if members want that to happen. The idea that that can be blocked, for example, I'm not saying that this is what is intended, but for example, by executive fiat, is for the birds. Thank you. Point of order, James Heapy. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's entirely understandable you won't want to answer hypotheticals, but for those of us who are trying to understand what might be afoot and to explain that to our constituents, could you confirm, Mr Speaker, is it the custom or the rule that rulings on money resolutions are the sole domain of the Chairman of Ways and Means? the position clear about money resolutions in the past. I'm not going to entertain hypothetical questions. I've tried to be cut. Order. Order. I'm not debating the issue with the Honourable Gentleman. He's made a point on a number of occasions of raising points of order. And if the Honourable Gentleman wants to have a discussion at some stage, he's perfectly welcome to come to see me. I'm not going to detain the House 
just now by endless exchanges on this matter with people who want really to stage a form of question time. That, no, I don't require any gesticulation from the Honourable Gentleman. I'm telling him that that is the situation. Thank you. The presentation of Bill, Mr Dominic Grieve. European Union Referendum Preparation Bill. Second reading what day? Monday, 21st of January. Monday, the 21st of January. European Union Referendum Bill. Second reading what day? Monday, 21st of January. Monday, the 21st of January. Thank you. Order. We come now to the 10 minute rule motion. Vicky Ford. that leave be given to bring in a bill to amend building regulations to require letterboxes in new buildings to be positioned above a certain height and for connected purposes. And thank you so much to all the members of this House who have come here today to support this bill. The purpose of the bill is to improve the health and safety of workers, particularly postmen and women, paper boys and girls, and other deliverers. I met the Communication Workers' Union. They told me the key issue for their members, and it's not Brexit. It is low-level letterboxes and dangerous dogs. Now, I am not asking homeowners to retrospectively change their existing letterboxes or replace their front doors. When it comes to front doors, Mr Speaker, a lot of people are very fond of their knockers. (laughs) This bill simply wants to stop developers from building swathes of homes, each with a letterbox placed near the ground. And I hope that this will be a moment of unity in British politics. support from members across the House. And you know what? We all do need to declare a bit of an interest. We politicians have been known to deliver an occasional leaflet ourselves, maybe. Many members of this House visited their own Royal Mail sorting offices in the run-up to Christmas, and I enjoyed visiting the one in Chelmsford. Our posties have deep knowledge and care for their local communities. They are resilient, and they are having to adapt to the digital age. These days, they deliver fewer letters, but many more parcels, because of so many people ordering goods online. There are over 95,000 postmen and women working for Royal Mail. They deliver to 30 million addresses. They serve each of our communities six days a week, every week of the year. And I asked our postal workers what I could do for them, and they asked me to help with the issue of low-level letterboxes, particularly because of the strain this puts on the deliverers' backs. Back injury is the primary cause of sickness in the Royal Mail. They have introduced better trolleys and training schemes to improve how the staff lift. But despite this, the Royal Mail re- recorded over 16,800 back-related absence spells last year. And the very act of having to bend or stoop to deliver mail to low letterboxes is a significant factor. It cannot be overlooked. The occasional low-level box is not a big issue, but where developers fit row after row of front doors with ankle-high boxes, the deliverers face repetitive stress. Low letterboxes are also associated with an increased likelihood of injury from dogs or cats. Each week across the UK, there are on average 44 dog attacks on postal workers and 50 attacks from cats every year. Low level boxes are much more difficult for the deliverers to see, which results in more hand injuries and more damage to mail, especially to packages. And post that has been delivered into the low level letterbox is also easier for thefts, thieves to steal. In many cases, it is not until the new doors are already in place that the local post workers know that they have an issue, and then the trade union takes up the issue. The CWU CWU repeatedly challenged developers to retrospectively change the boxes. This is difficult to do, time-consuming and a waste of money. Some of us know how difficult to do time-consuming and waste-of-money issues can be somewhat annoying. 
Uh, the union have been campaigning on this issue for many years. Uh, indeed, back in 2005, 97 <coughs> members of Parliament signed an early day motion asking for change, but it didn't get much publicity. Well, colleagues, we are certainly letting our postal workers have the spotlight today. The bill has a huge amount of support. I'm especially grateful to the specific support for the members for Coatbridge, Christian and Bells Hill, the member for North Cornwall, and the member for Banff and Buckingham, all of whom have been post workers themselves. It's been a pleasure to discuss this with the Minister responsible, who's been most encouraging. He's held in huge regard by postal workers for the work that he did prior to coming to this place on the issue of dangerous dogs. I understand the Government may be consulting on changes to the building regulations later this year, so I hope the Minister will take the messages from this Bill seriously and make sure that the necessary changes come into force. Mr Speaker, health and safety matters. Sometimes those of us on this side of the chamber are told that we don't care enough about health and safety or about the conditions of our workers. And indeed, in the past few days, I've even heard some colleagues on the other side of the chamber say that it was because they were concerned that we didn't care enough about health and safety that they would not vote for the government in the withdrawal agreement last night. But I do believe those concerns are unfounded. Every time I talk to my Conservative colleagues, they tell me they do care about health and safety, they do care about the conditions workers face. And I do hope the fact that so many members on this side of the House support this bill may go some way to assuage the concerns of colleagues and others. Other nations have taken action in Ireland, in Portugal, in Belgium. And colleagues, there is a European standard. The European standard suggests a minimum height of 70 centimetres. It's a shame that the member for North East Somerset isn't in his chair, because in old money that's two foot three and a half inches. <laughs> Mr Speaker, not all European standards are evil. <laughs> and on this special day, wouldn't it be nice to find one, at least one, we can all unite about? Uh, the National House Building Council has been recommending that developers and builders adopt this European standard since 2005, and they've also suggested that sta European standard for the aperture of boxes should be followed so that they can fit these small parcels. But despite these recommendations, the problem still persists. There are some issues for which recommendations are simply not enough. We need regulation. Mr Speaker, back pain is the most common cause of chronic pain. Any of us who have ever suffered from back pain know how debilitating it can be. Every day, every day, our postal workers deliver for us. Let us now deliver for them. The question is that the Honourable Member believed to bring in the bill. As many as I've heard of it say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Scott Munn, yeah, yeah. Mrs Pauline Latham, <laughs> Victoria Prentice, Bob Blackman, Tom Tugendhat, Craig Tracy, Mr Edward Vasey, Richard Bennion, Tim Loughton, Maria Caulfield and Kelvin Hopkins. There were many more volunteers. And myself. And myself. Vicky Ford. <laughs> Low level letterboxes prohibition bill. Second reading, what day? Friday the 8th of March. Friday the 8th of March. Thank you. Order. The business of the House, brackets today, close brackets, motion. Minister, the Leader of the House, or a whip to move. I beg to move. Thank you. The question is the business of the House, motion as on the order paper. As many as other opinions say aye. Aye. 
On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. We now come to the motion of no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. The motion in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition to move the motion, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move the motion that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. Last night, the Government was defeated by 230 votes, the largest defeat in the history of our democracy, the first Government to be defeated by more than 200 votes, and indeed the Government itself could barely muster more than 200 votes. Last week, they lost a vote on the Finance Bill. That's what's called supply. Yesterday, they lost a vote by the biggest margin ever. That's what's regarded as confidence. By any convention of this House, by any precedence, loss of confidence and supply should mean they do the right thing and resign. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has consistently claimed that her deal, which has now been decisively rejected, was good for Britain, workers and businesses. If she is so confident of that, if she genuinely believes it, she should have nothing to fear from going to the people and letting them decide. In this week, in 1910, the British electorate went to the polls. They did so because Herbert Asquith's Liberal Government had been unable to get Lloyd George's People's Budget through the House of Lords. They were confident in their arguments and they went to the people and they were returned to office. And it's still how our democracy works. When we have a government that cannot govern in the absence of a written constitution, it is these conventions that guide us. If a government cannot get, if a government cannot get its legislation through Parliament, if its government, if a government cannot get its legislation through Parliament, it must go to the country for a new mandate. And that must apply when it is on the key issue of the day. Isn't the Leader of the Opposition engaging in a piece of shameless political opportunism? Which puts which puts party interest ahead of national interest. And isn't he simply trying to disguise the fact that on this great issue he has no policy? Mr Speaker, in 2017, the Prime Minister and her party thought they could call an election and they would win it. They thought they'd return with an overall majority. And there was an enormous, indeed the biggest since 1945, increase in the Labour vote during that campaign, when people saw what our policies actually were. So, Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister asked to be given a mandate, that's what she did. She bypassed the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which was, as my right honourable friend, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, pointed out, designed to give some stability to the Tory Lib Dem coalition government, to ensure that the Lib Dems couldn't hold the Conservatives to ransom by constantly threatening to collapse the coalition. The Fixed Term Parliament Act was never intended to prop up a zombie government. And there can be no doubt that this is indeed a zombie government. The right honourable gentleman, if he's successful in this motion this evening, there may be a general election in a few short weeks. In that Labour Party manifesto, will they state whether they will be a party of Brexit or a party against Brexit? It's a simple question. What is the answer? Mr Speaker, we are a democratic party, and our party will decide what policy we fight the election on. In the meantime, we are very clear there has to be a customs union, there has to be access to European trade and markets, there has to be a protection of rights, there has to be a rejection of a no deal Brexit. And as I was saying, Mr. Speaker, last week this government became the first for more than 40 years to lose on a finance bill and a shocking first for this government, a shocking first. It forced 
a heavily pregnant member of this House. My friend, the member for Hampstead and Kilburn, to delay a scheduled caesarean to come to vote, all because of their cynical breaking of trusted pairing arrangements. I think we need to examine that and examine our procedures to ensure such a thing can never happen again. Point of order, Anna Subri. Mr Speaker, could you assist the House, please? This is an important matter. I say this as a woman, but we need to establish once and for all was the honourable lady offered a pair? Yes, we, I need. I think Absolutely. all of us yeah. and the public yeah. need to know something. Yeah. Clark reminds me that's not a point of order. My understanding is that there was a pairing opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, order, I don't need anybody else. No, no, my under, order, or, order, order. My understanding is that there was a pairing opportunity, but the issue was aired in the chamber on Monday and again yesterday. The right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, is absolutely entitled to highlight his concern about this matter, which I know is widely shared. But it should not be subject now to further points of order. I hope that that satisfies her. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nothing demonstrates the sheer incompetence of this government quite like the Brexit negotiations. Yesterday's historic and humiliating defeat was the result of two years of chaos and failure. It's now clear this government is not capable of winning support for its core plan on the most vital issue facing this country. The Prime Minister has lost control and the government has lost the ability to govern. Within two years, they have managed to turn a deal from what was supposed to be, I remember this very well, one of the easiest in human history into a national embarrassment. In that time, we have seen the Prime Minister's demands quickly turned into one humiliating climb down after another. Brexit ministers have come, Brexit ministers have gone, but the shambles has remained unchanged, culminating in an agreement which was described by one former cabinet minister as, and I quote, the worst of all worlds. Let's be clear, the deal the Prime Minister wanted this Parliament to support would have left the UK in a helpless position facing the choice of either seeking and paying for an extended transition period or trapped in the backstop. The Prime Minister may claim the backstop would never come into force. Uh, order, order, order. No, I'm sorry. There are, order. There are courtesies in this place. A member can seek to intervene. He or she should not do so out of frustration by shrieking an observation across the floor. Well, whether we say shriek or yell or bellow or shout, it was very noisy and it was disorderly. And the right honourable gentleman knows I hold him in the highest regard and I have great affection for him, but he must behave better. No, I'm not in. Uh, yes, but who takes an, whether an intervention is taken or not? No, there's no all right about it. I say to the right honourable gentleman, the person who has the floor decides whether to take an intervention. That's life. That's the reality. That's the way it has always been. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But who has confidence in this government's ability to negotiate a future trade deal with the EU by December 2020, after the shambles we've all witnessed over the past two years? This Frankenstein deal is now officially dead, and the Prime Minister is trying to blame absolutely everybody else. I give way. Can we to intervene? In modern British history, Prime Ministers, when faced with even a fraction of the titanic and calamitous margin that was uh, faced by the Prime Ministers yesterday, they have done the right and honourable thing, resigned and called a general election. Would my right honourable friend agree that in the pursuit of power and in the trappings of office that she has now forgotten what is right and honourable? 
I thank my friend for the intervention. As I've made it very clear, all the precedents are that when a government's had the defeat that this government has had, it's time to resign and allow the people to elect a new parliament to deal with the issues facing this country. Mr Speaker, let me be clear. The blame for this mess lies firmly at the feet of the Prime Minister and her government, which time after time has made hollow demands and given what turned out to be false promises. They say they want this Parliament to be sovereign, yet when their plans have come up against scrutiny, they have done all they can to obstruct and evade. The Prime Minister's original plan was to push through a deal without the appropriate approval of this Parliament, only to be forced forced into holding a meaningful vote by the courts and by members of this House to whom I pay tribute for ensuring we actually got the meaningful vote last night in this House. Yes. I'm grateful to the Leader of the Opposition for giving way. As I understand it, he will allow his party to decide whether or not he will deliver Brexit should he become Prime Minister. His party has already decided that if he is not successful in getting a general election, he should support a people's vote. If he does not win the vote tonight, will he then support moves in this House to give us a people's vote? I'm sure the member is fully aware of the decision made by my party's conference that, uh, uh, as the next phase of it, all options are on the table, including the option that he has referred to. I give way to my friend at the back. Would my honourable friend confirm whether, in this national crisis, the Prime Minister has telephoned the Leader of the Opposition to ask for a meeting to discuss the way forward for our country? Um, I haven't had such a call as yet, Mr Speaker. I have my phone. Mr. Speaker, I think we should proceed with this debate. I think we should proceed with this debate. And the Prime Minister's original plan, original plan was to push through a deal without approval, as I pointed out, and forced into it by the courts. But since losing its majority in the 2017 general election. The government has had numerous, numerous opportunities to engage with others and listen to their views, not just here in Westminster but across the country. Their whole framing of the EU withdrawal bill was about giving excessive power to the Secretary of State for Brexit at the expense of Parliament. It was a bill that Henry VIII would have been very proud of. Yesterday's decisive defeat is the result of the Prime Minister not listening, ignoring businesses, unions and members of this House. She has wasted two years recklessly ploughing on with her doomed strategy. And even when it was clear, even when it was clear that her botched and damaging deal a botched and damaging deal could not remotely command support here or across the country, she decided to waste even more time by pulling the meaningful vote on December the 11th on the empty promise, and it was an absolutely empty promise, of obtaining legal assurances on the backstop. Another month wasted before the House could come to its decision last night. Some on the government side have tried to portray the Prime Minister's approach as stoical. Mr Speaker, what we have seen over the past few months is not stoical. What we have witnessed is the Prime Minister acting in her narrow party interest rather than the public interest. Her party, her party is fundamentally split on this issue. Fundamentally split, Mr. Speaker, when less than 200 of their own MPs would pre- were prepared to support the Prime Minister last night. This constrains the Prime Minister so much that she simply cannot command a majority in this House and on the most important issue facing this country without rupturing her party. And it's for this reason, this reason, the government can no longer govern. Yesterday, the Prime Minister shook her head 
when I said that she had treated Brexit as a matter only for the Conservative Party. Yet, within half an hour of the vote being announced, the Honourable Member for Grantham and and Stamford commented she has conducted the argument as if this was a party political matter rather than a question of profound national importance. How right he was, how wrong she was to threaten him before the vote took place. I know many people, Mr Speaker, across the country will be frustrated and deeply worried about the insecurity around Brexit. But if this divided government continues in office, the uncertainty and risks can only grow. The Leader of the Opposition for giving way. When those cross-party talks start, would he tell the House which of the Scarlet Pimpernel will come? The Leader of the Opposition who campaigns for Remain in London and the South East or the Leader of the Opposition who campaigns for Brexit up north? We need to know. Mr Speaker, there has been no offer of all party talks. There has been no communication on all party talks. All the Prime Minister said was she might talk to some members of the House. That isn't reaching out. That isn't discussing it. That is not recognising the scale of the defeat they suffered last night. Mr Speaker, it's not just over Brexit that the Government is failing dismally, letting down the people of this country. There has, been, there has been a Windrush scandal, the shameful denial of rights, the detention and even deportation of our own citizens. The Government's flagship welfare policy, universal credit, is causing real and worsening poverty across this country. And just yesterday, under the cover of the Brexit vote, they sneaked out changes that will make some pensioner households thousands of pounds worse off. Those changes build on the scourge of poverty, causing measures inflicted on the people of this country, including the bedroom tax, the two-child limit, the abominable rape clause, the outsourced and deeply flawed work capability assessment, the punitive sanctions regime and the deeply repugnant benefit freeze. People across this country, Mr Speaker, whether they voted leave or whether they voted remain, know full well that the system isn't working for them. If you're up against it and you voted remain, and you're up against it and you voted for leave, this government doesn't speak for them, doesn't represent them, and cannot represent them. Food bank use has increased almost exponentially, and more people are sleeping on our streets, and numbers have shamefully swelled every year. The Conservative Party used to call itself the Party of Home Ownership. They are now called the Party of Homelessness in this country. Care is being denied to our elderly, with Age UK estimated Age UK estimating at 1.2 million older people not receiving the care they need. Seven billion cut from the adult social care budgets in the past nine years. Our NHS is in crisis. Waiting time targets at accident emergency. I'm talking about waiting times at accident emergency departments and for cancer patients that have not been met since 2015, and they've never been met under the government of this Prime Minister. Not yet. The NHS has endured the longest funding squeeze in its history, leaving it short-staffed to the tune of 100,000 and NHS trusts and providers in over one billion in deficit. The human consequences are clear. Life expectancy is now going backwards in the poorest parts of our country and stagnating overall. This is unprecedented. Another shameful first for this government. Another reason this government should no longer remain in office and why this motion of no confidence is so important. The Leader of the Opposition 
he's making some powerful arguments. Not very well, but he's making some very powerful arguments. I don't know if he could help us, though, with this. I I saw an opinion poll at the weekend. If there was any merit in his arguments, could he explain to the House why it is that this party is six points ahead in the polls? Could it be that it's because he's the most hopeless leader of the opposition that we've ever had? I thank the member... I thank the member for Broxtow for her intervention. I look forward to testing opinion in a general election in the ballot box when we'll be able to elect a Labour government in this country. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He's right to put on record current concerns about uncertainty in the country and absolutely right to talk about poverty. Can he confirm that it is the position of the British Labour Party to rule out a no-deal Brexit? And can he understand why the party that claims to be the traditional party of business won't do the same? I can absolutely confirm that. We have voted against a no-deal Brexit. Apparently, the business secretary thinks that's a good idea. The Prime Minister was unable to answer my question on this during Prime Minister's question time. No deal Brexit would be very dangerous and very damaging for jobs and industry all across this country. I know, I know some mem- One more time. I thank, I, th- I thank my honourable friend, and he is absolutely right. Under this government, we see our NHS in crisis, education underfunded and our communities have been devastated through their austerity agenda. More people homeless, more people living in poverty, more people uh, uh, using food banks. If they disagree with that, why don't they call a general election? I thank my friend for that intervention and for his work representing his constituency. On this side of the House, we are determined to force this government to accept the reality of the defeat last night and to force this government to go to the people so that they can decide whether they want a party in office that promotes inequality, poverty and injustice in Britain or the Labour alternative, which is bringing people together however they voted in the referendum. I know some members of this House are sceptical, and members of the public, I believe, could be also described as sceptical, but I truly believe that a general election would be the best outcome for this country. As the Prime Minister pointed out in her speech yesterday, both the Labour Party and Conservative Party stood on manifestos that accepted the result of the referendum. Surely any government would be strengthened in trying to negotiate Brexit by being given a fresh mandate for the people to follow their chosen course. I know many people at home will say, well, we've had two general elections and a referendum in the last four years. And for the people of Scotland, it's two UK-wide elections, one Scottish parliamentary election and two referendums in five years. So while Brenda from Bristol might gasp, not another one, spare a thought for Bernie from Butte. But, Mr Speaker, the scale of the crisis means we need a government with a fresh mandate. A general election can bring people together. Focus on all the issues that actually unite us, the need to solve the crisis in our NHS, our children's schools and our care for the elderly. And we all have a responsibility to call out abuse. And that has become too common. That, Mr Speaker, has become too common. Whether that's the abuse of members of this House going... Whether that's the abuse members receive or the mem- abuse that is... O- order. No. O- o- order. Apologies. No, Mr Morris, don't yell from a sedentary position like that. If you seek to intervene, you seek to do so in the usual way. That's the only way to do it. Just because you're angry doesn't justify you behaving in that way. Stop it. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No, I'm... Mr Speaker, I'm sure we can all unite. I'm sure we can all unite. 
that we can all unite in condemning racist abuse in any form whatsoever within our society. And too many of our constituents have faced that since the toxic debate in the last referendum and, if I may say so, the Government's hostile environment policies on the Windrush generation. Mr Speaker, many media pundits and members of this House say there is currently no majority in this House for a general election. Let the members of this House decide. But, Mr Speaker, it's clear there is no majority for this Government's Brexit deal, and there is no majority either for a no deal. I want to pay tribute to all members of this House who, like the Labour front bench, are committed to both opposing the Prime Minister's bad deal, which we voted down last night, and ruling out the catas- catastrophe of no deal. But I do believe that following the defeat of the Government's plan, a general election is the best outcome for this country, as the Labour Party conference agreed last September. A general election, Mr Speaker, would give new impetus to negotiations, a new Prime Minister with a new mandate, and not just to break the deadlock on Brexit, but to bring fresh ideas to the many problems faced by our constituents. The problems that people face, such as very low pay and insecure work, of in-work poverty which is increasing, the problems of trying to survive on universal credit and living in deep poverty, the the scandal of inadequate social care, which might not concern the member opposite, but it does concern millions of people around this country. The crisis, Mr Speaker, in facing local authorities, health services and schools starved of resources. The housing and the homelessness crisis where so many of our fellow citizens have no roof over their head night after night. They are looking to Parliament. They are looking to Parliament for for them a better and fairer society. Is the Honourable General just pausing? Yes, yes, quite right, absolutely. Uh, Very reasonable, very sensible. Thank you. Point of order, Mark Francois. Is it not... Well, give give me a go. Is it not often the practice in this House that if someone speaking from the dispatch box refers to another member and challenges them, they then normally take an intervention? Commonplace, but it is not in any sense obligatory. Commonplace, but not obligatory. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, if the House backs this motion today, then I welcome the wide-ranging debates we'll have for the future of our country and the future of our relationship with the European Union with all the options on the table. As I said before, Mr Speaker, a Prime Minister confident of what she describes as a good deal and committed, as she claims, to tackling burning injustices should have nothing to fear from such an election. But, Mr Speaker, if the House does not back this motion today, then surely it's incumbent on all of us to keep all the options on the table, to rule out the disastrous no deal and offer a better solution than the Prime Minister's deal, which was so roundly defeated yesterday. Mr Speaker, this Government cannot govern and cannot command the support of Parliament on the most important issue facing our country. Every single previous Prime Minister in this situation would have resigned and called an election. It is the duty of this House to show the lead where this Government has failed and pass a motion of no confidence so that the people of this country can decide who their MPs are and who their Government is and who will deal with the crucial issues facing the people of this country. I commend my motion to the House. The question is that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. The Prime Minister.
Mr Speaker, last night the House rejected the deal the Government has negotiated with the European Union. Today it is asked a simpler question. Should the next step be a general election? I believe that is the worst thing we could do. It would deepen... It would deepen division when we need unity. It would bring chaos when we need certainty. And it would bring delay when we need to move forward. So I believe this House should reject this motion. At this crucial moment in our nation's history, a general election is simply not in the national interest. Parliament decided to put the question of our membership of the European Union to the people. Parliament proposed to abide by the result, promised to abide by the result. Parliament invoked Article 50 to trigger the process. And now Parliament must finish the job. That's what the British people expect of us. And speaking to my constituents and to voters right across the country, that is what they demand. I will give way in a, just in a moment. That is what they demand. But a general election would mean the opposite. Far from helping, I will just in a, in a moment. Far from helping Parliament finish the job and fulfil our promise to the people of the United Kingdom, it would mean extending Article 50 and delaying Brexit for who knows how long. I will give way to the honourable gentleman. And then... Grateful to the Prime Minister for giving way. She has lost a quarter of her cabinet. 170 members of her backbench want her gone. She has experienced the biggest defeat in parliamentary history. What shred of credibility has her government got left? For goodness sake, Prime Minister, won't you just go? The gentleman might not have noticed that what we're debating today is a vote of no confidence in the government. He has his opportunity to express his opinion in that vote. As, As someone who was only defeated last night by 230 votes, may I encourage the, <laughs> may I encourage the Prime Minister to KBO and never tire of reminding the country that our good economic and one nation record will be put at risk by a very extreme left wing and high taxation party. Can I say to my honourable friend, he is absolutely right. I will speak about this later in my speech, but it is over the last uh, years since 2010 with Conservatives in government that we've been able to turn this economy round, provide, ensure jobs are provided for people and give a people a better future. Now, to forgive me, why? I totally agree with the Prime Minister that a general election would solve nothing. It's merely a tactical device by the opposition to cause chaos. But would she also agree with me that one thing we also need to rule out is a second referendum on our membership of the EU, which would be highly divisive and would not resolve the issues that we currently face? My, my honourable friend is absolutely right in that a general election would cause the sort of delay that I've just been talking about. Uh, but he is also right. We had a referendum in 2016. I believe it is incumbent on this Parliament to deliver on the result of that referendum and to deliver Brexit. And as regards those issues, the choices we face as a country won't change after four or five weeks of campaigning for a general election. There's no indication it would solve the dilemma we now face. And uh, not only I will give way to my honourable friend, not only is there no guarantee an election would deliver a parliamentary majority for any single course of action. I give way to my honourable friend. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. Unlike some, she is clearly not afraid to debate. It is not exactly a secret that on European policy she and I have not seen entirely eye to eye. <laughs> and it is possible... <laughs> well, so is everybody else, Simon. So. Not everybody. But, and it is possible we will continue to disagree, but I am a Conservative first and last. Yeah. Yeah. And I know opportunism when I see it. Exactly. So can I tell her when the bells ring, the whole of the ERG will walk through the lobbies with her to vote this nonsense down? Yeah. 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 Can I 
can I thank, can I thank my honourable friend for his intervention? And uh, I know what he said. I'm happy to carry on discussing with him uh, our different views that we have had on the European issue. But it is absolutely clear that what the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, is trying to do is not going to help to resolve the issue of ensuring that we deliver on Brexit for the British people. I'll give way to the honourable lady. I thank uh, the Prime Minister um, for giving way. Um, in 2017, she went to the country and asked the country for a mandate. She lost her majority. Last night, she asked the House to back her deal. She saw the biggest defeat for a government vote in the history of this House. Last night, she said she wanted to open dialogue with the whole of this House, and yet she has refused to open that dialogue with the front bench. Does she not agree with me that this looks like more of a strategy to divide and conquer rather than take this House and the country together and work out how we move forward? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, what I said last night was that we would be uh, opening, opening discussions, having discussions across uh, this House. There are many different opinions on the issue of how to deliver Brexit across this House. There are some views not to deliver Brexit across this House. I believe we should be delivering Brexit for people. What I made clear was that the first priority should the Leader of the Opposition put a motion of no confidence down, would be to debate that motion of no confidence. I am confident that the Government will retain the confidence of this House, and when that happens, I will set, further, set out the further steps we will take on discussions with members across the House. If members will uh, just be a little patient, I have taken a number of interventions, I will make a little progress, but I will be generous in taking interventions. I think members know from the number of hours I have spent in this House answering questions not afraid to answer questions from members of this House. But, Mr. but what we see when we look, I will in just a moment, I, if the Honourable Gentleman listen to what I said, <laughs> just help sometimes. Uh, we do not even know. We do not even know what position the Labour Party would take on Brexit in an election. Now, it's barely 18 months, barely 18 months since this country. Uh, if my honourable friend would just allow me one. It's barely 18 months since this country last went to the polls, an election where well over 80% of voters, almost 27 million people, backed parties whose manifestos promised to deliver Brexit. That's what the Government intends to do. That's what's in the national interest, not the disruption, delay and expense of a fourth national poll in less than four years. I give way to my honourable friend. Thank you. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way to me. Does she not agree with me that if the Leader of the Opposition himself wrote on a note exactly what he wanted, passed it to the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister adopted that, he would still vote against it? <laughs> is absolutely right, because, of course, the position uh, that the Leader of the Opposition took was that however good a deal for the United Kingdom the Government brought back, he would vote against it. Yeah. However bad a deal the EU offered, he would vote for it. Yeah. So he has no real national interest in getting the right answer for our country. I promise the Honourable Gentleman. I thank the Prime Minister for, for giving way. And my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, is absolutely right to call for a general election today because it's not just the government's record on Brexit which is at stake tonight. And I want to ask the Prime Minister a direct question. Is she surely saying that her record on policing and crime is one that she's willing to stand on? Because we have seen over 20,000 police officers cut since 2010. We see rising crime, we see rising knife cream, and we see money, money being diverted, money being diverted, instead of playing for police, paying for a no-deal Brexit, which nobody in this House wants to see happen. The, the, the Honourable Gentleman talks about paying for police. Of course, we put more money into, uh, made more money available to police forces. And what did the Labour Party do? The Labour voted against that. Yes, that's what they did. They voted against it. I will just... I... I will just make a little more progress and I will take some more interventions. Now, last night the House did indeed speak clearly and I heard the message that they sent. I heard the concerns of my colleagues and from across the House and I understand them. And as I told the House last night, if the Government secures, and I've just repeated, if the Government secures the confidence of this House, then my first priority will be to hold meetings with my colleagues, with our confidence and supply partners, the DUP, and with senior parliamentarians from across the House. But our, our principles... 
Our principles are clear. A deal that delivers a smooth and orderly exit, protecting our union, giving us control of our borders, laws and money, and allowing us to operate an independent trade policy. These are what deliver on the will of the British people. I, would have the order. I tried this with her earlier during, during question time, so I'm going to give her one more chance. Which of the red lines... Which of the red lines that she set that caused the defeat that she had last night is she willing to compromise on to get the agreement through? Sensible question. And the honourable gentleman will not be surprised to hear that I will give him the same answer as I've just given in my comments. Because what the honourable gentleman, I think, what I would point out to the honourable gentleman is that the key thing that this House needs to do, that this Parliament needs to do, is to deliver Brexit for the British people. That is what we need to do, and we need to do. I will in a minute. We need to deliver a Brexit that actually respects and reflects the vote that was taken in the 2016 referendum. I will give way to the honourable gentleman to come back, and then I'll give way to my honourable friend. I'm trying to be helpful to the Prime Minister, believe it or not, but this is pure robotic fantasy. It's her deal that has to change, and the deal is a product of the red lines. Yep. So when she has that meeting with my right honourable friend, which of the red lines is she willing to give up on? Yeah, exactly. And I repeat that we will approach these discussions in a constructive spirit. We want to hear the detail from the House of what it is that they want to see, such that we can secure the support of the House for a deal. I give way to my honourable friend. My right honourable uh, friend for giving way, unlike the Leader of the Opposition, does she share my concerns that too many people in this House are trying to scupper the mandate given to us by the British people? For centuries, for centuries, this House has taken arbitrary power from kings and queens and peers and grandees and has put that power in this House for the public good. But we now appear to be becoming that arbitrary power that is taking away and removing that mandate that we gave the British people. Will she fight to deliver on that mandate and to protect and preserve our democracy? My my, my honourable friend puts his point very powerfully indeed. This Parliament voted to ask the British people to say to them it is your decision, not tell us what you think and we might think afterwards whether or not we like it. It was, it is your decision and we will act on that decision. And what we want to do is, I will just make a little more progress if honourable members and right honourable members will. That is what we want to do, deliver on the will of the British people. As I said, I'll approach the meetings in a constructive spirit, focusing on ideas that are negotiable and have sufficient support in this House. And the aim is to identify what would be required to secure the backing of the House. And if Please, if just a, a, I will just make a little more progress. I have been already generous in interventions. If these, and if these talks bear fruit, as I said earlier in Prime Minister's uh, questions, there would be in no doubt I will go back to Brussels and communicate them clearly to the European Union, and that's what members asked for. Uh, the leader of the SNP MP said we should have talks with all the leaders of the opposition parties and work together in all our interests. The chairman of the Brexit Select Committee said if the deal was defeated, I would like to think that she would take a bold step, that she would reach out across the House to look for a consensus, and that's exactly what I propose to do. So I, I, can I say, I, I, think it would be, no, I think it would be a little strange for them to vote against that approach later today and in favour of a general election that would make that process of reaching out across Parliament impossible. I'll give way to the Honourable, the honourable Lady, who has been standing several times. Uh, I thank the Prime Minister for her generosity in giving way. But with all due respect to her, she's come to the House today after suffering a very, very large defeat indeed with the same lines. Absolutely. And she's making the same assertions as she was making before the vote, like the vote never happened. Her Downing Street spokesperson said that any discussions would have to start and proceed from the red lines that she established herself. Mm -hmm. Doesn't she realise, in all honesty now, that the time has come for her to show some flexibility on those red lines and get us into a genuine discussion rather than just repeating the lines to take that we've heard for the last five months ad nauseam. What I am doing is setting out what the British people voted for in the referendum in 2016. That is our... And that 
is our duty as a parliament to deliver on that. Now, I know that to serve, again, I will just make little progress. I know that to serve in government, in, in just a moment, I know that to serve in government is a unique privilege. The people of this country put their trust in you, and in return, you have the opportunity to make this country a better place for them. Uh, just in, in a moment. When I became Prime Minister, and that is what I pledged to do, yes, to deliver Brexit, but also to govern on the side of working people right across the country for whom life is harder than it should be, and to build on the progress that had been made since 2010. I'll give way to the Honourable Lady and then to my honourable friend. To the Prime Minister for giving way. The problem is the Prime Minister seems to be talking as if she'd lost by 30 votes yesterday, yeah. Yeah. not yeah, 230. Yeah. Yeah. Her refusal to even consider changing any of her red lines when the EU and Irish Government and others have made clear that the deal she got was dependent on those red lines is making this impossible. Yeah. Can I ask her to clarify? Is she saying she will rule out in in any circumstances, a customs union. I'm saying that what I want to see is what the British people voted for. They want to see. No, this is this is this is this is very important. They voted for an end to free movement. They voted for an independent trade policy. They voted. They voted to end the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. And it is incumbent on this Parliament to ensure that we deliver on that. And I think we should build on the progress. Oh, I said to my own friend, if the Fox will just, if the Fox will just uh, allow me, I did say to my honourable friend that I would take him first, then I will take him. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. Um, she's being criticised for setting and sticking to red lines, but don't those red lines simply represent the promises that were made prior to the referendum? My honourable friend, that's the, the, the point I have been making and repeating is that when people voted to leave, they voted uh, for certain things. They voted to ensure that we could have that uh, independent trade policy and that we would end free movement, for example. And it's our duty to ensure we deliver those. I'll give way to Father. Mr. Speaker, I've asked many people for the referendum why they voted on one side or the other. Got a very wide range of replies, but I have to say. No one has ever told me they voted to leave in order that we could leave the customs union or that we should be able, they wanted us to erect trade barriers between ourselves and the rest of Europe. Now, as she's committed as I am, I entirely support her aim of keeping open borders between ourselves and the rest of Europe. Is it not the case that there's nowhere in the world where two developed countries in any populated area are able to have an open border unless they have some form of customs union. <laughs> my, my right honourable and learned friend refers to obviously the, the various reasons. There were various reasons why people voted to leave the European Union, um, but when they were doing that, I believe that they did vote to ensure that we continue to have a good trading relationship with our nearest neighbours in the European Union. I want, uh, but also to improve our trading relationships with others around the world. That is what we were uh, uh, searching for. That is what was in the political declaration for the future. That uh, package was not voted through this House last night. I now, as I say, will talk to uh, parliamentarians across the House to determine where we can secure the uh, support of the House. But while delivering Brexit is an important and key element of government, it is also important that we build on the progress made since 2010 and build this lead this country towards the brighter, fairer, more prosperous future it deserves. And I, no, I'm not, won't take, I'm going to get, make some progress before I take any further interventions. I believe that this government has a record to be proud of, a record that demonstrates that our policies and principles are more than words. In 2010, we inherited the gravest of economic situations, a recession in which almost three quarters of a million jobs were lost, a budget deficit of one pound borrowed for every four pounds spent, and a welfare system that did not reward work. But in the nine years since, thanks to the hard work and sacrifice of the British people, we have turned this country round. Our economy is growing, 
The deficit is down by four fifths. The national debt has begun its first sustained fall for a generation. The financial burden left for our children and grandchildren is shrinking by the day. And that, that is a record to be proud of. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank the Prime Minister for allowing me to intervene. Under her leadership, this government has become the first in British history to be found in contempt of Parliament. It has become the first in British history to lose by more than 200 votes on a primary policy matter. Homelessness has spiralled out of control. The usage of food banks has risen exponentially and much more besides. So surely it is now time to act with humility and to do the right and honourable thing and to resign and call a general election. The whole point of this debate today is to determine whether this House has confidence in the Government or whether it thinks there should be a general election. Now, I say that our record is a record to be proud of, but I know it's not enough. A strong economy alone is is no good unless we use it to build a fairer society, one where wherever you are, wherever you live and at every stage of your life, you know the Government is on your side. We're growing up. Where growing up, you will get the best possible education, not because your parents can afford to pay for it, but because that is what every local school provides. Where your parents have a secure job to go to, that pays a decent wage, where they get to keep more of the money they earn each month. That when you finish school, you know that you can go to university, whether or not your parents went. Or you can have an apprenticeship. That when you want to buy your first home, enough houses are being built so that you can afford to get a foot on the housing ladder. That when, you, that when you want to get married, it doesn't matter whether you fall in love with someone of the same sex or opposite. And that when you have children of your own, you will be able to rely on our world-class NHS. That both parents can share their leave to look after their baby. And when they're ready to go back to work, the government will help with the costs of childcare. And that when you've worked hard all your life, you will get a good pension and security and dignity in your old age. And that is what this government is delivering. I thank her for giving way. I thank her for giving way, and I acknowledge that she wants to paint her government in a good picture. But isn't it true that precisely because a lot of people are unhappy, they also voted for Brexit? And isn't it the case that we need to clarify with the British people what exactly they they voted for and need to put a precise deal in front of the people and not just make a general assumption why people voted for Brexit? People also voted for Brexit because they were generally unhappy with the state of this country. So isn't it, par- isn't it the, uh, uh, the case now we need to put a precise Brexit deal in front of the people so all people can say, but actually Brexit will make a difference? Well, as the Honourable Lady might recall that when I became Prime Minister, I made exactly that point, that people in voting for Brexit, there were various reasons people voted for Brexit, but I do think for some they wanted a change in the way politics delivered for them. I think that they were concerned that they felt that politicians weren't listening to them. And that is precisely why it is so important that on the result of the referendum we listen and we deliver to for the people of this country. And this government is delivering in a whole range of ways. I, give way to I, I thank the Prime Minister for giving way, and I appreciate the positive, confident and optimistic picture of the future of the UK that she painted. What a contrast to the Leader of the Opposition, who takes every opportunity to talk Britain down. Yeah. How on earth can somebody claim that they aspire to be Prime Minister if they have such utter lack of confidence in Britain and the British people? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody anybody who wants to be Prime Minister should believe in this country and believe in the talents of our people. And that is so important. I'll give way to you. I know the Prime Minister, thank you, thank you so much for being around this. I know there's so little time to get in all the achievements, but on the same note. You may colleagues. Right, right. Here, here. Colleagues may laugh, but it is this government who is taking the environment more seriously than any other sustainability first and that is more important even than Brexit because if we don't have a healthy environment and our record on this is second to none microbeads, ancient woodland protection the clean air strategy and more we would be lost Can Can 
I thank my hon. Friend, she has indeed set out an area where this Government has been taking important action. I would like to commend the work that she has done on that and the work of my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State, in this area, because we are indeed leading the way on an, in a number of ways on this. I will take, I will take um, my... I'll take my right honourable friend, and then I'm afraid I must make some progress because a number of people want to speak. I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister. She is giving way uh, considerably more than the leader of the opposition does. She, She has just mentioned the stewardship of the NHS under her leadership. Would she like to remind the Leader of the Opposition that it is this Government that has just pledged through the NHS long-term plan 50% per annum more funding than was pledged by him at the last general election? That is absolutely right. The biggest cash boost to the NHS in its history, a long-term plan that ensures its sustainability for the future. That is being delivered not by a Labour Party, but by the Conservatives in Government. And if we, if, if, we'll, if honourable members, if honourable and right honourable members will forgive me, I am conscious that the time is getting on, and there will be many members. And the, the, the right honourable member for Exeter is encouraging me not to take so many interventions and to get on with the uh, thing. But we are building a country that works for everyone. But there is, there is much more to do. Investing in our industrial strategy so we're creating the jobs of the future in all parts of our country, not just in London and the South East. Delivering our long term plan for the NHS that my right honourable member has just referred to, so that our that friend has just referred to, so that our most precious institution is equipped for the future. Tackling the lingering injustices that for too long have blighted the lives of too many people. Women being paid less than men. Mental health being treated with the same seriousness and resource and physical health as physical health. A criminal justice system that has poorer outcomes if you're black than if you're white. And an education system that has left white working class boys as less likely to go to university than anyone else. These are issues we need to tackle and the mission of this government will not stop. This is a government building a country that is more prosperous, a country that is fairer, and a country that works for everyone. And with the confidence of this House, we will go on delivering for Britain, driven by a passionate belief in doing what is right for our country and right for our people, acting not in self-interest, but in the national interest. And that is the simple mission that has underpinned our approach to the Brexit negotiations. And as we enter the next stage of that process, I have made clear I want to engage with colleagues across the House. Now, the question now is whether the Labour leadership will rise to the occasion. But I fear the answer is no, because as the Labour leader himself has indicated, Brexit is the biggest issue this House and this country has faced for generations. What it demands from senior politicians is responsible leadership and pragmatic statementship. The Leader of the Opposition, as yet, has shown neither. His failure to set out a clear and consistent alternative solution is the third reason why this House should comprehensively reject this motion. Indeed, the Shadow Brexit Secretary has uh, described Labour's position on Brexit as one of constructive ambiguity. I think the Shadow Trade Secretary called it something slightly more succinct, but definitely not parliamentary, and therefore I cannot repeat it. But I call it not being straight with the British people. Because for more, than two, for more than two years, the Leader of the Opposition has been either unable or unwilling to share anything other than vague aspirations, empty slogans and ideas with no grounding in reality. And when the President of the European Commission said Labour's Brexit ambitions would be impossible for the European Commission to agree to, the Right Honourable Gentleman simply shrugged and said, that's his view, I have a different view. <laughs> but I have to say, well, if my Honourable Friend will just forgive me, I have to say last night, just for a moment... I thought that the Leader of the Opposition might surprise us all, because he told this House it was not enough to vote against the withdrawal agreement and that we also have to be for something. So surely that was the moment. That was the point at which, uh, after months of demanding that I stand aside and make way for him, he was going to reveal his alternative. We waited, we waited, but nothing came. He still faces both ways on whether Labour would keep freedom of movement, and he won't even be drawn on the most basic point of all. I referred in PMQs to the fact that on Sunday, 
when challenged as to whether, if there was a general election, he would campaign to leave the European Union, he refused to answer that question five times. He's refused to answer that question in response to members of this House today. The Government has no doubt about its position. Under this Government, the United Kingdom will leave the European Union, and we will respect the decision of the people. I will give way to my I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. She's quite right to point out the yawning chasm at the heart of Labour's policy. But the Prime Minister also said we need to come up with a constructive alternative. And speaking to colleagues around the House, it strikes me very powerfully that there is, there is one element of the currently proposed deal which, if changed, would make it much more likely to pass, and that is the backstop. Would the Prime Minister therefore consider contacting the European uh, Commission's officials in the coming days and over the weekend and ask them to make legally binding changes to that backstop, which I believe would then have a very good chance of passing this House. Well, can I say to my hon. Friend that the, the purpose of the various discussions we are going to have is to, identify, is to identify the issues that will secure the support of this House, and I will take those issues to the European, uh, to the European Parliament. Um, I will... I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman and then I am going to make progress so that others can speak in this debate. I am extremely grateful to Hoging Wei. She has been generous. She has talked about engagement with this House and yesterday she referred to this House as the fulcrum of our democracy. Can I gently point out that she is the Prime Minister who went to the Supreme Court to stop us having her having engagement with this House? And the vote that we had yesterday was on the back of an amendment that she herself voted against. She talks about engagement with this House, but we have experienced nothing but hostility from the Prime Minister. Going forward, going forward, will she put her words into action? If not, she doesn't deserve to have the job in the first place. Can I say, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I think he has been in this House on many occasions when I have uh, come to listen to this House and have taken questions and answered questions from this House. In fact, in fact, a whole uh, it is pounded uh, from October through to December to a whole 24 hours spent answering questions in this House. But vital though Brexit is, vital though Brexit is, there's much more to being the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And that is, after all, the job to which the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, aspires. Um, if I may just, uh, if my Right Honourable Friend will just uh, bear with me. I do just want to make some progress. I understand a significant number of members have put in to speak. And uh, by putting forward this motion, the Right Honourable Gentleman is asking this House to accept that he could be the next Prime Minister. So how would he have faced some of the big challenges that I have faced over, as Prime Minister over the last two and a half years? When Russia, when Russia launched a chemical attack on the streets of Salisbury, I worked with our allies to degrade Russian intelligence capabilities and hold those responsible to account. His contribution was to suggest that we ask Russia to double-check the findings of our own scientists. When the Syrian regime used chemical weapons to murder innocent men, women and children in Douma, I stood with our allies to uphold the international consensus that the use of chemical weapons should not be tolerated. He wanted to give an effective veto on action to President Putin and the Russian government, the very government that was supporting the Syrian regime. This is the, le the leader of the party of Attlee called for the dismantling of NATO. The leader of the party of Bevan says Britain should unilaterally disarm herself and cross our fingers that others follow suit. The leader of the party party that helped deliver the Belfast Agreement invited IRA terrorists into this Parliament just weeks after their colleagues had murdered a member of this House. His leadership of the Labour Party has been a betrayal of everything that party has stood for, a betrayal of the vast majority of his MPs and a betrayal of millions of decent and patriotic Labour voters. And I look across the House and see backbench members who have spent years serving their country in office in a Labour government. But I fear that today this is simply not, that is simply not a party that many of its own MPs joined. And if we want to see what he would do to our country, we can do no better than look at what he has done to his party. Before he became Labour leader, before he became Labour leader, nobody could have imagined that a party which had fought so hard against discrimination could become the banner under which racists and bigots, whose worldview is dominated by a hatred of Jews, could gather. 
but that is exactly what has happened under the leadership of the right honourable gentleman. British Jewish families who have lived here for generations are asking themselves where they should go if he ever becomes Prime Minister. That is what has happened under the leadership of the right honourable gentleman. What we have also seen is a Jewish Labour MP who had to hire a bodyguard to attend her own party conference under the leadership of the right honourable gentleman. What he has done to his party is a national tragedy. What he would do to our country would be a national calamity. Very, very grateful. Very grateful to the Prime Minister for being so generous and engaging in a debate, and as ever, she could teach a few people lessons on that. Can I just go back to the, the question or the intervention from the Honourable Member for Hove, though? He, he makes, if I may suggest, a very important point that whilst the Prime Minister has been very generous, Mr Speaker, in coming to this place and answering questions, the complaint is that we have been excluded in a meaningful way at the outset in helping to determine the principles upon which a Brexit deal should be negotiated. And for many of us, Prime Minister, in seeking to be true to the oath and the promises to our constituents and, and voting for things against our own government, we have been threatened with deselection, threats against our safety and even death threats. And I know how seriously she takes that and I thank her for her kindness last week in the note she sent to me. Would she now make it clear to anybody listening to all of this that we here, especially on these benches, but it, it applies also to honourable and right honourable members opposite, given the very wise words and observations just, she's just made about the state of the Labour Party, that it would be wrong for anybody to be intimidated or bullied in any way at all, simply for coming here and being true to what they believe in and what they believe is in the national interest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I say to my right honourable friend, I think what she experienced uh, I think last week was appalling. I understand that she has experienced other incidents more recently. Uh, and can I just say to her, I absolutely agree. Everybody in this House holds their opinions and their views with passion and commitment. And it should be right for everybody in this House to be able to express those views with passion, with commitment, and not feel that they are going to be subject to intimidation or harassment or bullying. I think that is very important. I'm sure that is a sentiment that commands uh, approval across the whole of this House. And once again, I'm sorry to my right honourable friend for the experiences that she has gone through. Well, I will give way to the right honourable gentleman on this point, and then I am not. I am going to uh, conclude. And uh... I'm grateful to the Prime Minister, but she must recognise that she has built a cage of red lines that produced a deal that was overwhelmingly rejected by this House. We rejected the deal because we rejected the cage. Now, this afternoon, she has yielded nothing about how any single one of those red lines will change. If she is not prepared to change, how on earth can we in this House continue to place a shred of confidence in her? To the right honourable gentleman, uh, that, um, first of all, the point I have made last night, the point I have repeatedly made here today, is that I will be talking to people across this House, uh, talking to my own colleagues, talking to the DUP, talking to other parties, talking to there are different groups of people within this House who have different views on this issue, and hearing from people and finding what will secure the confidence of this House in terms of securing the support of this House for uh, the way in which we deliver Brexit. But actually, I, I, I noticed that perhaps it was serendipity that I uh, uh, allowed the Right Honourable Gentleman to intervene on me, just at the point at which I was going to say that if the Leader of the Opposition wins his vote tonight, uh, what he would attempt to do is indeed to damage our country and to wreck our economy. And of course, it was the Right Honourable Gentleman who left that note, there is no money left after the last Mr Speaker, was naive to honour a Treasury tradition that went back to Churchill with a text that is pretty much the same. But I was proud to be part of a team that stopped a recession becoming a depression. And this is the government. Hers is the government. Order, order. Stop trying to shout other honourable or right honourable members down. Calm yourselves. 
Liam Byrne. She was, of course, a member of the party that backs Labour spending plans up to late 2009, and she is the one who's presided over a government that has doubled the size of the national debt. I say to the right honourable gentleman that, of course, yes, we did see what was happening in terms of the financial crisis and the impact that had. But, of course, what had happened was that a Labour government, a Labour party in government, had failed to take the steps to make sure that the party was in the government, part, uh, country was in a position to be able to deal with those issues. Uh, what would we see? What would we see if we saw Labour win this vote tonight? They would wreck our economy. They'd spread division, undermine our national security. And, as we've said earlier, as I've said earlier, on the biggest question of our times, he provides no answers, no way forward, and nothing but evasion, contradiction, and political gains. This House cannot and must not allow it. No, I'm I'm about to conclude, so I'm not going to take any more interventions. We're living through a historic moment in our nation's history. Following the referendum that divided our nation in half, we dearly need to bring our country back together. And last night's vote showed that we do have a long way to go. But I don't believe a general election is the path to do that. And I don't believe that a government led by the Leader of the Opposition is the path to do that either. We must find the answer among ourselves in this House. And with the confidence of the House, this government will lead that process. Because this is the government that has already delivered record employment, put more money in the pockets of ordinary working people, and given the NHS the biggest cash boost it's ever received from any government of any colour. This is the government that is fighting the burning injustices of poverty, inequality and discrimination that for too long have blighted the lives of too many of our people. And it's the government that's building a country that works for everyone. And as we leave the European Union... We must raise our sights to the kind of country we want to be, a nation that can respond to a call from its people for change, a nation that can build a better future for every one of its people, a nation that knows moderation and pragmatism are not dirty words, but are how we work together to improve people's lives. That's our mission, it's what we're doing, and with the backing of the House, it is what we will continue to do. I'm proud of what we have achieved so far. I'm determined that the work will go on. In that, I know we have the confidence of the country. We now ask for the confidence of this House. Reject this motion. Ian Blackford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It is a pleasure to follow the Prime Minister. Of course, I wish her no ill will, and if she does choose to resign today, can I wish her all the best for her future career? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, in many respects, this is not a debate that we should be having. If we reflect on what happened last night, it is a government that brought its Brexit deal in front of Parliament, and it lost by a majority of 230. Mr Speaker, something which is quite unprecedented. A defeat for the government with her own backbenchers and the opposition in a united manner voting against this government. And if we go back just a short few weeks to December, of course there was a motion of confidence in the Conservative Party. And in that situation, a majority of government backbenchers voted against the Prime Minister. And let me say, when I go back and I listened to the intervention for the Honourable Gentleman from Rayleigh and Whitford. He said that the members of the ERG would be going through the lobbies to support the government tonight. And, Mr Speaker, that does indeed say it all. It's the ERG that has captured the Prime Minister. Exactly. And the real reality of where we stand today is that when the Prime Minister went to the United Kingdom in an election in 2017 in anticipation of getting a majority, they got a bloody nose and she came back as a minority Prime Minister. Well, you know, I can, you know, this is, you can only, I, I will give way in a second. I would say, I would say to the government, I would say to the government benches, if you just settle down a little, you would love to be in the position that the Scottish National Party are in because we have a majority of seats from the people of Scotland. I give way to you. I'm grateful to the right gentleman for giving me. I thought perhaps he could just inform the House. How many seats in Westminster, how many Westminster MPs did the SNP have 
before the 2017 election, and how many do they have after the 2017 election? I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister for that intervention. Can I say to the Prime Minister, there are 59 seats in Scotland. The Scottish National Party hold 35 of them. A majority of seats. We have won every election to the Scottish Parliament since 27. The Prime Minister could only dream of being in a situation where she has a majority. But let's come back to the fundamentals of this. We have a Prime Minister that is captured by a right-wing Brexiteers. Because the issue is, when you have a minority, you have to be able to work across party. But we've got the, I will in a second. But we've got the situation that the Prime Minister is beholden to the DUP, but the DUP will only support her in very certain circumstances. This is not just, Mr. Speaker, about the defeat of the government last night on Brexit. It is a government that is stuck that can't get its legislative programme through. It has no majority support in this House. It is a government that it's past its time. And if the government had any humility, had any self-respect, it would reflect on the scale of that defeat last night. We shouldn't be having this motion of no confidence. The government should recognise it has no moral authority. The government, quite simply, should go. Yeah, yeah. Jacob rees uh, Right, honourable gentleman, for giving way. But I think his speech is a little eccentric, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> he, 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 seems, he seems to think that the ERG and the DUP control the Prime Minister. Why, why then did 120 of us vote against the Prime Minister yesterday? If we're in such control, we're clearly not doing it very well. <laughs> Exactly. Well, 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 perhaps, perhaps let me explain. The Honourable Gentleman, in supporting a motion of no confidence against the Prime Minister, as he did, clearly expressed that he does not have yep. the confidence What's of the Prime Minister. And what the ERG is seeking to do is to make sure that the government delivers what they want, which is a hard Brexit, a no-deal no deal. Brexit, perhaps, yeah. against no the interests of the majority of the people in the United Kingdom. But here is the reality. Having listened very carefully to what the Prime Minister has said today, there is no change to the government's position. Yeah. The red lines yeah. remain Nothing in place. Changed. And I fear that what is really going on is that we have a government that is seeking to run down the clock yeah. in the knowledge that they have, and I will in a minute, safe in the knowledge that the Withdrawal Act has gone through, seeking to drive Parliament to the margins and to make sure that we do crash out of the European Union with no deal as a serious prospect. All of us, all of us, Mr Speaker, should recognise the risks of no deal that no sane person in this House would support. And the government should unilaterally take that risk to all of us and to all our constituents off the table. I happily give way. I thank my, uh, the right Honourable uh, Gentleman. Uh, he must agree that the Prime Minister is a record setter <laughs> record levels of poverty, record levels of homelessness, and now, and now record, a record defeat in majority that any government has had. Now, maybe not in our lifetime. Do you think that majority will ever get beaten? Well, I, I, would, I would say to my honourable friend, because he is my honourable friend, it's a record level of lack of humility that we see from this government, and he's absolutely right. We have had 10 years of austerity from this government. People are hurting. We can see that through the poverty figures. We can see it through the forecasts of the increase in poverty that will take place. And the harsh reality, I have to say to the honourable gentleman, we know from the government's own analysis that in any version of Brexit, that the economy of the United Kingdom will be weaker than it would be Absolutely. than if we stayed in the European Union. Yep. That is the fundamental point of this. And I, I, I say respectfully to the Prime Minister, I understand the issue of respecting the vote in 2016. But when the government knows that the economic circumstances of its citizens are going to be negatively affected, we have a responsibility to say to the people, on the basis of the information that we now have, we have a duty to go back to you. Because nobody, nobody, Mr Speaker, irrespective of how they voted in that referendum, 
voted to make themselves poorer. And I have to say, and I say it with respect to the Prime Minister, that it is shameful that we are not being honest with the people of this country. We need to waken up. We need to waken up. And let's take the announcement from Jagger Land Rover. Now, I know there are many reasons why Jagger Land Rover are restructuring. We know it's to do with diesel cars. We know it's to do with China. But at the same time, Jaguar Land Rover made it absolutely crystal clear that Brexit is a fundamental issue which is driving that restructuring. No government, Mr Speaker, should should be in the situation that it wants to put unemployment on the table, that unemployment is a price worth paying. That's what happened under Thatcher, and this government at its peril would take the risks with the economy and the livelihoods of the people of the United Kingdom. Honourable friend, for giving way. And it's really not the time come for the country to see that the Tory party, not by their words, but by their actions, are now enacting a policy of moving us towards a no-deal Brexit. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I am very, very grateful from my dear and honourable friend for that point, because I, I have to say to this House, and I have to say to the people of the United Kingdom, I am worried. I am really worried about what we are doing. And the risk of a no deal is something which is unthinkable. I need, I need, I need to make, I, with, with respect, I know, there are, I know there are many people that want to speak, and I, I do have to make progress. I will take interventions later on. But we have to be honest with people as to what these risks are, and I can say to this House that we in Scotland want no part of it. If the Government and the Prime Minister wants to drive the bus over the cliff, we will not be in the passenger seat with this government. Neither are you, mate. Mr Speaker, you know, we often, um, we, of, we often hear about the travails of the European Union, the nasty European Union, but I can tell you as someone that lives in the islands of Scotland that the European Union has been fantastic for our region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I contrast the behaviour of the European Union with this government, people in the Highlands are right to be angry. Mr Speaker, the European Union agreed to give convergence uplift funds to yes. our farmers and yeah, crofters yeah, 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 yeah. on the basis of the low level of financial support that was in place. Yeah. £160 million pounds that should be handed over to Scottish crofters. Where is it, David? And where is where it? Where is it indeed? It hasn't been handed over. Where has been the Secretary of State for Scotland in the and defending the interests of Scottish farmers and Scottish crofters? Scottish farmers and crofters that will pay a heavy price for Brexit, and the institution that has been standing up wanting to support them is not this House, it is not this Government, it is the European Union. I know where I would put my... I I will happily give way. Mr Speaker, I would like to thank the Right Honourable Member, first of all, for letting his party give me a seat in this place, but that is not for today. Mr Speaker, what the Right Honourable Member says is quite correct. And it was a question that I put to the Prime Minister yesterday, which is that so much in terms of infrastructure projects would not have happened in my constituency had it not been for the European money. And this was crucial in halting the terrible drain of our brightest and best from the Highlands to leave and never return home again. That, I say, Mr Speaker, is an issue that is hugely important to me and it remains as such. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, I thank, the, thank the honourable gentleman. May I say to him it's the people of Caithness and Sutherland that give him a seat Absolutely. in this place and that we all serve with exactly. the goodwill and the ongoing support of our constituents, something anyone should ever, yes. ever take for granted. Yeah, but, yeah. Mr Speaker, I, want, I, I do want to make progress. I apologise. I have talked about Brexit, but I want to go on to about the record of this government. This, the Prime Minister talked about delivering a fairer society. Oh, my goodness. Those of us that live in the Highlands have been in the pilot of universal credit, the damage which has been done to many of our people in many of our communities. I look at my colleagues on these benches, when I look at my honourable friend from Adrian Schotts, the member for Glasgow Central, if I look at the member for Inverness, Nairn Badenoch and Strathspey, that day after day, week after week, have had to stand up and highlight the issues with universal credit, highlight the issues with the rape clause, highlight the issues with a two-child uh, policy, and this government has simply not listened to the damage that has been done. It is a government obsessed with inventing a cruel and hostile environment for immigrants, their families and their children, and a government 
that continues to die, deny the rights of 1950s women. When I first came into this House, I was the SNP pension spokesperson. I lost count of the number of debates that I called and spoke in, highlighting the injustice that millions of women faced. Women that had worked all their life on anticipation that there was a contract between them and the state that they would get their state pension. Women, in some cases, were given as little as 14 months' notice that their pensionable age was going to increase by as much as six years. That's the heartlessness and the cruelty of this government that left many of them in poverty because they ripped up the contract because, Mr Speaker, that's what it was between those individuals and the state. And I've appealed to the Prime Minister on many occasions to write that right. This government could easily have put its hands into the Treasury coffers. The National Insurance Fund sits at a surplus. I will happily give way. Member for giving way, and I would ask him: Does he also agree with me that it is appalling that this government has slipped out in amongst all the news of yeah. Brexit, yeah, yeah, that they're absolutely. making further changes to pensions, yeah. and that pensioners who have a partner under uh, under the age of pensions, they will have to claim universal credit instead? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, my honourable friend is, is correct, and she's highlighted what this government's been doing, sneaking out these kind of. Announcements. I know that she is a doughty fighter for pensioners, as she will for young people, and we will stand up in this House for those that are affected that way. Um, I, I, I will give you one more time. Very grateful. Um, he said earlier in his remarks that he's worried about economic growth, and I quite understand that, share that, uh, those concerns. But um, is he also therefore worried that the Scottish econ economic growth is slowing? now growing at half the rate of the rest of the UK. And what is his party doing about that north of the border? It's the wrong person, the wrong person to challenge without having done your homework. Oh, good grief. And I have to say the, the honourable gentleman is mistaken that what has happened over the course of the last year, that growth in Scotland has overtaken that of the United Kingdom. But, um, but you know, Mr Speaker, the majority of the controls of the Scottish economy don't sit with the Scottish Government, they sit with the Parliament yes. here in it's London. We would dearly love to have full control of our destiny in Scotland, because one of the reasons that we desire independence is because our economic interests simply have not been looked after by Westminster. And I, well, you know, I will in a second, but let me, let me just say this. When I look in the rearview mirror, and I look at Scotland over the course of the last hundred years. Our population has barely grown. Generations of young people have had to leave Scotland because of lack of economic opportunity. That's not the Scottish Government that's responsible for that, it's for Westminster. And I am delighted that there's a report which has come out from Highlands and Islands Enterprise over the course of the last few days. For the first time, the trend of young people staying and living in the Highlands has turned around. That's because of the investment that the Scottish Government is putting in young people, despite the challenges that we face of austerity from this Conservative Government. I'm very grateful to my right hon. Friend for, uh, for giving way, and I, I do hope that uh, the motion laid by the Leader of the Opposition is successful this evening. Um, today, I believe, I was uh, reminded today, uh, is the uh, uh, 100th uh, well, Neil, it's an anniversary from 1913 of the Home Rule Act, the fir one of the first Home Rule Acts for Ireland, which was agreed for by this House but defeated in the other place. And in terms of control, yet again, and that's with due def reference to the Democratic Unionist Party, are in control of the government opposite. If the vote is successful this evening, can my right honourable friend assure me that the Scottish National Party will have no truck with any government funding the Democratic Unionist Party and their type of politics? Yeah. I'm very grateful, and there's a very simple answer to that, and it is yes, of course. Mr Speaker, I, I have been generous in taking interventions. I need to move on because I when I glance at my notes, I see I'm only at page two, and I'm sure that honourable members will want me to make some progress. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and the Conservative Government have let us all down. Westminster, once again, 
has proven that it can only let Scotland down. The Scottish National Party has no confidence in the UK Government. Mr Speaker, Scotland voted to remain. I want to say it again. Scotland voted to remain. I often hear... I often hear... I often hear the Prime Minister and others talking about the national interest. I would ask the Prime Minister to reflect on the fact that this is our nation of Scotland exactly. and a family of nations. Historic and when we were told in 2014 that if we stayed in the United Kingdom that our rights as European citizens would be respected, <laughs> what we find is that this government completely ignores the wishes exactly. of the Scottish people and wants to drag us out of the European Union against our will, to take away our rights that we have as EU citizens. Mr Speaker, it can be no surprise that the contempt shown to Scotland by the Tories over the past couple of years has strengthened and reinforced the case for Scotland to be an independent country. Mr Speaker, every reasonable attempt to compromise and to protect Scotland's interests by the Scottish Government has been spurned. The powers of the Scottish Parliament have been eroded. This place has taken back control. Well, I can, I can hear the scoffing from the Tory benches, but when the Withdrawal Act went through, the SNP membership went up by 10,000 the next day, because the people of Scotland know that the Secretary of State for Scotland sat and did nothing, as the powers of Scotland over fishing, over farming, over agriculture, over the environment were taken back against the wishes of the Scottish Government. Uh, order. The House is overexcited, and although the right honourable gentleman is well able to look after himself, he must be heard. Sometimes there is a concerted and excessively noisy apparent attempt to interrupt, and that should not happen. Stuart Malcolm Macdonald. <laughs> They are a curious bunch, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask my right honourable friend? Can I ask my right honourable friend, indeed all members uh, across the House, to reflect on the fact that in 2014, sure, the Scottish people voted to stay in the UK, but two years later, but two years later, they voted to stay in the EU. These two things are fundamentally incompatible because of the Prime Minister's desire to drag us out. So at some point. At some point, one will have to give. She might be able to delay that, but independence is inevitable, is it not? Absolutely. Here, here. Can I just say to the honourable gentleman, it's coming yet for all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to. I will say this. I hope she's an officer because I, I, can, I can hear from a sedentary yeah. position yeah. about this issue about whether we can demand a referendum. I'll simply say to the Tory benches, that you have to respect the sovereignty of the people of Scotland. That's right. Because however you, however you dress it up, when the Scottish National Party went to the people of Scotland in 2016, we won the election on a mandate if there's a material change of circumstances that we may seek to have a referendum on independence. There is a majority, the majority in the Scottish Parliament. Parliament. Parliament in Edinburgh voted for it. This House in July debated a motion on the claim of right that recognised the sovereignty of the Scottish people. This House accepted that motion. That's right. yep. If and when the Scottish Government comes to Westminster and asks for, sec- ask for a Section 30 agreement, this Government should respect the democracy and the sovereignty of the Scottish people and allow it. Mr Speaker, Scotland will never, never, not ever forget or will we forgive the utter contempt shown to our nation by this Prime Minister and the Government. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and her Government cannot escape the reality. Her Government has led to political collapse in this country, hamstrung. This Government is completely frozen in its own failure. We have reached a dangerous impasse. With the clock ticking down, we need to remove this shambolic Conservative Government, extend Article 50 and, yes, give the people of the United Kingdom a say. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, and as ever, he is giving a stunning account of the current situation. But does he agree with me 
that this Prime Minister has painted herself into this corner. Yep. She is going to have to give on at least some of her red lines. And it is deeply regrettable that she has waited till the 11th hour to reach out across the House. Yep. Mm. And that history will judge her on her deeds, not her words. I, I, ab I absolutely agree. And of course, if I can make the reflection that in Scotland we do have a parliament which is elected by proportional representation. We are used to minority government. We are used to having to reach a consensus. And indeed, if I look at the motion which was passed by the Scottish Parliament on the issue of Brexit, it was supported by the Scottish National Party, by the Labour Party, by the Liberal Democrats, by the Greens. Prime Minister, that's how you do it. And the Prime Minister in this House has simply misunderstood the challenges of trying to reach a consensus across Parliament. She is working with her own Brexit extremists and failing to work to build a consensus across this Parliament. Mr. No, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I must make progress, I'm sorry. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister does survive today, she must now act to extend Article 50 and legislate for a people's vote. Now, I, I must turn to the Labour Party. The Scottish National Party were the first to table a motion of no confidence, supported by others, by the Liberal Democrats, by Cymru and the Greens. We asked for that to be debated before Christmas. Now, we knew yesterday that the Government was giving active consideration to allowing a debate to have that, have that vote today on the motion that was laid down by the Scottish National Party and others. The Labour Party have been shamed into bringing this motion, a motion that we should have discussed before Christmas. I welcome that we are having this debate today, but on the basis of what happens today, I appeal to our friends and colleagues in the Labour Party that we have to work together to hold this government to account. And if we are to do that, then we have to recognise the harm that Brexit is going to do Absolutely. to all our constituents. It is time for the Leader of the Opposition, and I say respectfully to him, to recognise that there is no such thing as a jobs first Brexit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That we have to recognise that if we want to protect the interests of our citizens, then it has to be a people's vote. We don't He's have time. He's doing a jobs we thing. don't have time, Mr Speaker. The Labour Party have to join us in that campaign today. And I say this to the Leader of the Opposition. All the young people that voted Labour in England in 2017 will be paying a price from the Labour Party if Jeremy Corbyn does not give that leadership. So I say to the Leader of the Opposition, get off that fence, come and join us. Take that opportunity today. Tell us once and for all that Labour will back a people's vote. No. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> uh, I'm grateful to the right hon. Gentleman for giving way, and he mentioned the shame of the Labour Party. I wonder would he reflect on the shame of the Scottish National Party in Edinburgh on a day when college lecturers in Scotland are striking, when teachers in Scotland are considering industrial action, when waiting lists are going up and our educational standards are going down? That is the record of the SNP government in Scotland. Is he ashamed of that as well? You know, Mr. Speaker, you never said the honourable gentleman used to sit in the Scottish Parliament. If he wants to debate devolved matters, I suggest oh. he tries to get a seat back there again. But the, you know, the issue. Order. Uh, you always have a very amiable disposition, Mr. Kerr, but but you are becoming a mildly exuberant denizen of the House. Dare I say it, even in your conduct a tad, to deploy the word used by the honourable gentleman from North East Somerset. Eccentric. Now, calm, zen, restraint. Try to cultivate the air of the elder statesman. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am proud of the record of investment in public services by my government in Scotland. But the situation we face is austerity from Westminster. And we have taken the hard decisions, on the one hand, to ameliorate Tory austerity but also to invest in our public services. And it's their Tory colleagues in the Scottish Parliament that want to cut taxes, that want to harden austerity, that will damage the interests of the people of Scotland. Keep going. Mr Speaker, I want to move on and begin to conclude. 
the people of Scotland wish to remain in the European Union. We want a country of opportunity, a nation free from poverty, a country where immigrants are welcome and where refugees are given refuge. We want a Scotland without austerity, a Scotland where pensioners are paid their fair share, where workers have fair and equal pay, a real living wage, a Scotland where all children are treated equally, where our health service is protected and valued, a nation that will be healthier, wealthier and happier. Mr Speaker, the choice is clear. The United Kingdom is on a path to self-destruction. Without a change of course, Brexit will see our economy smaller, weaker, poorer. Mark Carney from the Bank of England said that Brexit had already cost each family £600. That's what's already happened. And we know that a hard Brexit will cost each household in Scotland £1,600, pushing struggling families to the brink and already poor families into destitution. Without single market and customs union membership, the future relationship can only be FTA, introducing barriers to Scottish companies' ability to trade. This will damage jobs, investment, productivity and the earnings that will hit the most disadvantaged in society hardness. As we know, Mr Speaker, that, that people who choose to live and work in this country, on these islands, are net contributors to our economy. If net migration is reduced by a significant number, we will be poorer economically and fiscally. That would be catastrophic, not just for workers, but for our economy. Mr Speaker, after a decade of Tory austerity, our economy has already suffered enough. The SNP will not stand by and allow the UK Government to ride roughshod over Scotland's future. This yes. Government must go, and it must go today. But, Mr Speaker, I have said it before, and our First Minister of Scotland has reiterated it today. The only way for Scotland to protect its interests yep. and for our nation to thrive is to once and forever be rid of this place and instead be an independent nation in the European yeah. Union. Order. On account of the level of demand, a five-minute limit on backbench speeches will now apply. Sir Christopher Chope. Uh, Mr Speaker, when my right honourable friend was uh, winding up the debate uh, yesterday evening, she said that our country could ultimately make a success of no deal, although, of course, she was emphasising that she didn't believe that that was the best outcome. That was, of course, before the vote. And when we had the vote a few minutes later, uh, then I think that the outcome of that vote is one that the Prime Minister certainly must respond to. Because the feeling in this House, 432 people, and I was one of them, is that the Prime Minister's deal, however good she thinks it is, we regard it as a bad deal. And, and I, I haven't heard anything from the Prime Minister that implies that she accepts the verdict of the House last night that we regard her deal as a bad deal. And the Prime Minister was right to anticipate a, such a scenario, because in her Lancaster House speech two years ago, she feared that the European Union would only offer us a bad deal, a punishment deal, as, as she put it. And she therefore emphasised that no deal would be better than a bad deal, and she emphasised the benefits that would come from a no deal, including our ability to be able to trade freely uh, across the world, our ability to be able to enter into a, a new economic model, all the benefits that would come from being masters of our own destiny as an independent uh, nation. And those were the benefits of no deal which she set out. Obviously, she, like everybody else, wanted to get a good deal. But as we have not got a good deal, I plead with my right honourable friend to ensure that she does not close the option of no deal. And indeed, she yeah, yeah. intensifies the preparations for no deal, because that is the best way of concentrating the minds of those in the European Union that we are serious about an alternative. If you go into a negotiation you say uh, the only alternative is to accept your deal or stay in the European Union, uh, then what's going to happen? The European Union are holding us to ransom on that. What we need to be saying is that we are confident and believe in ourselves that we could be able to make a really great success of yeah. no deal. 
Unfortunately, that has not been the negotiating stance of the Prime Minister and her advisers, and we are suffering as a a consequence of that. Last uh, Saturday, Mr Speaker, I had a public meeting in my constituency, and it was attended by over 200 uh, people. There was a lot of anxiety expressed at that meeting about whether or not the Brexit that we had been promised would actually uh, be uh, delivered. And it's great to hear the Prime Minister reasserting her commitment to deliver uh, Brexit. But if she doesn't deliver that on a deal that was rejected last night, then how is she going to deliver it if she rejects the no deal alternative? And my constituents were very, very worried about the fact that they could see uh, the referendum commitment to leaving the European Union somehow being undermined by the Prime Minister and by the Government, and that in turn was undermining their trust. I'll give way very quickly. He's making a compelling case that we should go back to Europe and renegotiate. He knows we're at the end of the process. Time is running out. He also knows, and I think regrets, that we're not ready for no deal. Isn't he actually making a case then to extend Article 50 in order to get the right deal that he will support? Uh, No, no, I'm not, because uh, two years ago we were told by the Prime Minister uh, that nothing was agreed till everything was agreed and that everything was going to be agreed within two years. And uh, we now know that nothing has been agreed effectively, certainly so far as the future relationship is concerned. Just trying to buy more time is not going to solve this problem. What needs to happen is that we need to leave the European Union on the 29th of March and then we can have negotiations following on from that when we will be standing on a level playing field, able to stand up for our own interests and we will have called the European Union's a bluff because what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, undermine our ability to be able to do what we want to do in this situation. You expect, after, if you are unsuccessful in a, in a conflict, that the victor will impose conditions upon the vanquished. What is happening here is that the European Union is seeking to impose conditions upon us because we have got the temerity to want to leave the European Union. That is wholly unacceptable, and the government's negotiating position, I think, has been a supine throughout. OK. OK. In terms of imposing conditions, if we go to no deal, we will go immediately to default WTO terms, including tariffs, for example, on lamb exporters of 40%, 12.5% of car, and we won't have a trade bill, it's not going to pass at the moment, to, to enable us to even do anything about it. Does he right. not see there are serious risks in that no. going down that route? Blind I, 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 I engage in trying to respond to all the scaremongering, and the, my honourable friend is good, is, is, is good at the scaremongering. Let's recall the fact that our Prime Minister herself has said that no deal is better than a bad deal. The House of Commons has said that this is a bad deal. Therefore, why don't we go nap on no deal and get on with it and actually thereby deliver for the people the result that they wanted in the referendum? And certainly my my constituents are looking eagerly towards the prospect of being able to have no deal on the 29th of March. I asked... No, I'm not going to give you any more. I, I asked that the... Uh, Brexit committee, I asked the uh, Secretary of State responsible for leaving the European Union, I I, I asked uh, what would happen on the Irish border on the 30th of March, and it was conceded that there wouldn't be any difference to the current arrangements on the 30th of March. That is an example of the scaremongering that's going on about uh, no deal. I regret that the government did not prepare more actively and further in advance for the no deal option. But now we must not let the government benefit from its own incompetence by saying we don't think that we're ready for no deal. We should be ready for no deal on the 29th of March and that's why we need to accelerate the preparations uh, for it. If asked by my constituents, Mr Speaker, if they have confidence in the government, (coughs) their reply would be not a lot but a heck of a lot more than in the Labour opposition. And certainly they will have even more confidence in the government if they are confident that the government is not ruling out no deal, is stepping up the preparations uh, for no deal, and is 
able to confirm unequivocally again that we will be leaving the single market, the customs union, and we won't uh, be in a situation where we have to have people coming into our country without any control over our borders. Thank you. George Howarth. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's a great pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Christchurch. And I think he just demonstrated why the Prime Minister's uh, offer to reach out to every section of the House, every section of opinion on Brexit, isn't going to work. There is nothing the Prime Minister could do that the Honourable Gentleman, other than a hard Brexit, that the Honourable Gentleman would accept. And that, I think, encapsulates part of the problem that the Prime Minister has to deal with. Um, on, in the Prime Minister's statement to the House on Monday, I opened, uh, I said by, uh, that um, she had the real problem that she had and the statement she had uh, made uh, didn't alter the fact that she had, first of all, no majority, and secondly, because she had no majority, no authority, and thirdly, because she had no authority, she had a government effectively uh, were of no use to the country as a whole. I think I didn't quite use those words, but that's what it amounted to. I listened very carefully um, to the Prime Minister over the, in, the, in the intervening periods, and she has offered nothing really that anyone could work with. Had she been in the mode uh, she was in uh, following the vote last night, two years ago, or even 18 months ago, reaching out across the chamber to different parties, different strands of opinion, might have produced something different that would have been acceptable to the vast majority of people. I voted for Article 50, like many others, in the hope that we would come up with a Brexit that would meet the expectations and hopes of my constituents. The problem is that the Prime Minister's deal didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are now in the position we're in. Now, I, I, there's been a, a lot of um, comments about historical precedents in terms of Parliament um, and how long it is since a government was defeated by such a margin. And I decided, um, in a conversation I had last night, that I would look for other historical precedents that weren't about Parliament but were about treaties or deals or bilateral agreements. And I came across this one, uh, Mr Speaker, um, for, and it's the Treaty of Tordesillas of um, 1494. And I think probably even the Honourable Member for North Somerset would struggle with that one. <laughs> but was it was a treaty, effectively, <laughs> between... <laughs> it was a treaty, effectively, between Spain and Portugal, which tried to carve up the rest of Europe uh, and, in t and decide who would get which colonies. And guess what, uh, Mr Speaker? The rest of Europe didn't agree with it. And it was eventually became defunct and never was implemented... And I rather think that the Prime Minister's deal rather resembles that treaty. Now, the Prime Minister fought the last general election on the slogan, we, Britain needed a strong and stable government. Well, after last night's events, I mean, we haven't had a, a strong and stable government since the election, but after last night's events... It certainly isn't strong. And all the speculation that's going on around what's going to happen over the next few weeks, it certainly isn't stable. And that's why I think this vote of no confidence is timely, but also necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I just want to take uh, issue with something the Prime Minister said in her speech, um, which I think, I'm sure she meant it sincerely, but it doesn't represent what is the reality of life on the ground and in my constituency. She said in a speech that the government was, in justification for why the government wanted to go on, that she was fighting against poverty 
and inequality. Um, now, you know, look, I, I, it simply isn't true. My right honourable friend, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, went through a long list of problems of, uh, in terms of policy and the delivery of public services as to why that's not true, and I won't repeat those. But in my constituency, this is, this is a government that's um, extremely grateful to the right honourable gentleman. I apologise for interrupting him. The opposition is very considerably disadvantaged by the malfunction of the timekeeping facility. Yes, I'm well aware of that. It's very... Oh, do they need to stand up? It is very unsatisfactory. Unfortunately, as I said to the House, I think, yesterday, those who put it right cannot do so while the House is sitting. But it is disadvantageous. I can appeal to the whips to try to keep members informed. And in deference to the seniority of the Right Honourable Gentleman and in the expectation that he's approaching his peroration, and I will happily allow him a further sentence. George Howarth. The sentence. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, um, the further sentence is simply this. Just to say, say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I do appreciate it is difficult. I appreciate it's difficult, but members do know what the minute situation is when they stand. They might not know the second situation, but they do know the minute situation. George Howarth. Mr Speaker, you know I always try to satisfy the demands you place on me, and I will do so now. I just want to say that the Prime Minister said the government was fighting poverty and inequality. She might try telling that to the 8, 000, uh, over 8,000 people in my constituency who had to resort to food banks yeah. last year, yeah. 3,000 of which... Uh, the parcels of which were distributed were for children. Is that a government that is fighting poverty and inequality? I think not, and it's a government that has run out of ideas and run out of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the Right Honourable Gentleman's cooperation. Neil Parrish. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to speak in this debate. I have absolutely full confidence in this government, and I shall be voting yeah. Yeah. against yeah. this motion yeah. tonight. Yeah. As I have been recently surveying canvassing in Axminster, in Seaton, in Tiverton, in Columpton and many of my other towns, I am, am, I am amazed at the true support for the Prime Minister out there on the street. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really is quite amazing. Absolutely. They recognise that she is a lady who has taken on an almost impossible job, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah, yeah, yeah. to actually fulfil the referendum result. There was a people's vote, and that people's vote took place in 2016. Yep. It was the largest vote in a generation, and there was a clear majority to lead the European Union. And that is precisely what we must do. But what is interesting, let's analyse this wonderful vote that happened last night. Let's actually analyse how we got to this massive figure of some 230 against. Because on one side, you had a number of people on the Labour benches um, that don't come clean with the fact that they want to stop Brexit altogether. I do have to pay tribute to the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish Nationalists. While I disagree with them fundamentally, the one thing they do do is come out in the open and actually say they are in favour of remaining in the European Union. But if you want to deliver Brexit, it is the Prime Minister that can actually do it. So on the one side, we have people voting because they want to thwart Brexit on the other side. On my own side, we have people people who wanted to make sure it was the toughest Brexit ever. Those two lots of people have absolutely nothing in common, Mr exactly. Speaker, whatsoever. Because when the Leader of the Opposition, I will in a minute, when the Leader of the Opposition stood up at the end and said, of course, what we need now to do is stay in the customs union, immediately huge groans from my own side, because that's precisely what they didn't actually want to do. So therefore, the Prime Minister has to get this deal through. Now, I very much support the, the Democratic Unionists and the, the border in, in Northern Ireland to make sure that the whole of the United Kingdom is actually treated in the same way. So, therefore, there is work to be done. But does a hard Brexit actually help the Northern Ireland Irish situation? Does it help food processing? Does it help agriculture? It certainly does not because of huge tariffs potentially and huge problems in the border. And I know very well and on the island of 
Ireland, there is always a huge mix of processing from the pigs in the north to the lambs in the south to the milk going all the way round the, uh, the island of Ireland. So, therefore, let's be absolutely sensible and, and let's decide to have Brexit, not go back to the people's vote. I will, I will give way. No. You're okay. Right. <laughs> well, you, you, asked to, you, asked to, you asked to intervene. He did ask to intervene just now. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will my honourable friend give way? I will. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to, uh, to, to give my honourable friend the opportunity to reflect on the next part of his speech by intervening on him, and I'm grateful to him for giving way. Would he also agree with me that in the light of the parliamentary arithmetic last night on the vote, uh, and the vote that we are faced with today, that it would be infinitely better for this country to have the continued leadership of a Prime Minister that has the experience of negotiating so far, because it's only somebody with that experience and that knowledge of the detail that can in fact reach out successfully across this House to try and find a solution to this intractable problem. The right honourable lady is absolutely, absolutely right because we have a prime minister with experience. We have actually a prime minister that has actually stuck to her guns. That's what she is hugely criticised for, the fact that she has. We've got a leader of the opposition who actually can't work out whether he's in favour of a referendum, another referendum or not. He's not quite sure which way he would vote if there was a second referendum. And he also doesn't know when, if there was a, to be a general election whether the Labour Party would take uh, Britain out of the European Union or keep them in. So, therefore, this is, a, this, is a, this is a leader that would actually negotiate with the European Union? Certainly not. It would never happen. And so, therefore, we need to actually deliver. And when I talk to the people in my own constituency, and all of you across this House, whatever party you do, you do, most people think, what on earth are we getting so worked up about? Why haven't we actually done it? And for goodness sake, get on and do it. And so, why is it that you know, the Prime Minister is wrong and this House is right. Because I, I voted in campaign remain, but I actually accept the result of the referendum. But this, this, this House is not representative in any shape or form of the opinion of the people of this country, because people may have changed a little bit. You may have a second referendum, and it might turn out that the, the re result is 48%. To, to leave and, and, and 52% to stay. What does that cure? Absolutely nothing. Let's have a third referendum, you know, or let's have a fourth referendum. We have had a referendum and we need to deliver that. And I, I say in all sincerity, while I disagree entirely with the opposition, and I disagree entirely with the opposition for bringing forward this motion, what I do also say to my own side clearly, Mr Speaker, is that we are the party of government. We were elected to govern this country, and so therefore we have to make a decision. Yes. And we can't sit contemplating our navels forever as to whether we are going to make a decision or not. Because this idea that you just drive us and drive us and you'll get the hardest Brexit possible, and it'll just about destroy British agriculture, because I know that the, 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 the Brexit ministers and others are just waiting to pour cheap food into this country because they will actually want to see cheap food delivered under Brexit. And that will hugely affect our farmers. So, for goodness sake, come together. Let us all as a party govern this country properly and get a deal and get out of the European yeah. Union. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sir Vincent Gable. Speaker, uh, we have adequate justification in this no-confidence motion in the numbers yesterday night, but I want to address not the numbers which speak for themselves, but the arrogance that lies behind it. I mean, yeah. The reason why we are in this position is that when the referendum was conducted and concluded, this was treated as entirely a matter for the Conservative Party and totally disregarding the 48 per cent, naturally now a majority, who voted the other way. And we had, um, unfortunately, in the Prime Minister's response today, we had that same arrogance, unwillingness to listen, which has brought us to this position. Uh, I mean, not only that, but we, we have a very badly divided country. But we need to ask, why are they divided? Who divided them? They were promised 
not by the Prime Minister herself, but by her colleagues who have departed from the responsibility of government for the most part, things that cannot now be delivered. There are a lot of very, very angry, frustrated people out there, and whether we have Brexit or no Brexit, whether we have a referendum or no referendum, they are going to remain very angry. My view, which I think many colleagues share, is that the mature and British way of dealing with this is actually to go back and reason with them, to put the government's case and to accept what they're willing to, the verdict they're willing to pass on what the government has negotiated, possibly with variations. But the no confidence motion today gives us, us another route, and I think a very welcome one. We could have a general election <coughs> that would help resolve this issue. And it would be if the Leader of the Opposition was willing to say clearly, I lead my party on the basis that we will have a people's vote and or that Brexit will stop. And that would be a very clear dividing line which we could debate as a country, rather than a completely spurious debate about whether we have a semi-permanent customs union or a permanent customs union. Yeah. But my, my, my concern of no confidence is not simply about the handling of the Brexit negotiation. The simple truth is that the, the country has ground to a halt. Government is not functioning. As I reminded the House, I was part of a government that did work. It may have done unpopular things, but it worked. Decisions were made. Decisions were made. They're now not being made. Hundreds of civil servants have been taken off the work they should be doing for Brexit preparations. So crises are simmering in the background around housing, the funding of local government, social care, the prisons and much else. They are not being dealt with. The big mistakes the government's made around the universal credit or the apprenticeship levy are not being rectified. There is no effective government taking place. It's not just that there isn't no government. We're having this horrendous waste of public money. Uh, I, I spent five years with um, the, uh, my colleague, my former colleague I face, scrimping and saving for million pound savings. The same people are now spending four billion on an exercise which has no purpose. They know, they are, they are saying, half the members of the cabinet say publicly, that the no deal isn't going to happen. We're not going to use this money. It is a complete, utter waste of money. I went through five years in government and I think not a single minister was censured with a ministerial directive. I think so. Within the last few weeks, civil servants are refusing now to authorise government spending because of the recklessness involved in it. We've had confirmation for the Department of Transport and I believe that there are other cases involved. So we're having reckless financing, we're having damage to the economy. Uh, when I left government, it was, uh, we'd been through a very difficult time, but it was the most rapidly growing country in the G7. It's now the slowest. Yeah. We're now promised, even the government acknowledges, that Brexit, however done, is going to damage the economy. So what has to happen now, I think two things. First, we have, a, have an absolute clarity around the issue of stopping no deal. We've got half the cabinet who are going around telling business and others it won't happen, and they're absolutely right to do it, but the Prime Minister herself has got to say it. It's a ludicrous, damaging proposition. And this glib idea that you can somehow have world trade rules, world trade organisation rules. I've written an article yesterday in their favourite Liberal newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, explaining why this is absolutely absurd. But no deal has to be stopped. Yeah. And then we have to move on to the fundamental question <coughs> of how we get the endorsement from the public as to how we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. It's Justine Greening. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will be supporting the government today. This is absolutely no time for a self serving general election called by the Labour Party when what the British public need this House to do is now focus our efforts on finding a route through on Brexit. The challenge on Brexit is not about whether it's Labour or Conservative. The challenge is precisely that Brexit is above party politics. And that's one of the principal reasons why this House has had so many challenges in finding a route through that people can coalesce behind. And actually, I think it comes on the back of the British electorate that has steadily 
grown more and more tired of some of the dysfunctional party politics that they see taking place in our country, and a party politics that too often prioritises short-term press release politics playing to its core base, irrespective of whether that reflects where the British public are at, instead of being able to work across party if necessary to take the long-term decisions that actually deliver on the ground for the British people and for future generations. And I may have had my criticisms about my own government and its strategy on Brexit. I think it was wrong to disenfranchise the 48% and then tactically inept to disenfranchise the 52% by not delivering the Brexit that they clearly felt they were voting for. But the reality is, all we've seen equally from the opposition across uh, the Green Benches is absolutely, as one of their own said yesterday, dither and delay. And I think many people, when they look back on this time in our history, will feel like it was actually both front benches that failed to rise to the challenge of delivering on Brexit and a route forward. The reality we all have to understand is that uh, party politics won't solve Brexit. And in fact, every single minute that we spend in this chamber today debating whether or not we should have a party political general election is a minute lost when we could have been talking about what kind of a consensus there is in this House for some sort of route forward on Brexit. And all the time, the clock is ticking down. I think the big question we all have to ask and answer is how do we chart a route through as a Parliament through this now? What I would say to the front bench and the Prime Minister in particular is that this is not her Brexit process. The process on Brexit belongs to all of us, it belongs to our communities, and we have to now work together to find a path forward. And that means two clear things. First of all, it is now imperative that the Prime Minister doesn't just talk to the House and to parties, she listens to what MPs are saying, but it needs to go beyond that. She simply needs to allow this House to have a vote on the clear different options we have ahead of us in the way we were able to have a meaningful vote last night on her deal. That is how you ultimately find out if there is a consensus for anything. There are many members in this House who clearly feel that delivering on Brexit, if necessary, now means we should depart with no deal. We should have a proper vote on that to test the will of the House. There are other members who feel that a different version of soft Brexit, they may call it Norway Common Market 2.0, that that is now the route forward that we could find consensus on. The House should be allowed to vote on that and we should find out. Talks will not ultimately clarify this, but they will risk wasting time that we simply don't have. And I believe that in the end, if it turns out that there is gridlock in this place and that very much like the British public, it is hard to coalesce around one route that we can actually vote for in this House, then I think we do have to go back to people and ask them, but not in the form of party politics and an election that doesn't fundamentally deliver, but ask them the question that we need an answer to, which is which of these three routes forward do they want? Do they want the Prime Minister's deal? It may be that this House did get it wrong and the people want that deal, in which case they should be able to vote it through. Do they want to have a hard Brexit, getting on with it, leaving on WTO terms, but if that's what they want, they should be able to have that? Or do they think the existing deal is the best one that we've got. We don't know. This House won't find a route forward and therefore we should allow them their say and have confidence to do that. Angela Regal. Uh, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker, I rise to support this motion of no confidence because at this critical time in our history, I believe we have a government which is incapable of governing, let alone doing so in the national interest. Yeah. Never have I witnessed in all my 27 years in Parliament a government as inadequate and incompetent as this one. I've never witnessed a Prime Minister so inept that she has squandered all personal authority and goodwill, and yet, like a broken record, she continues to insist on her right to carry on regardless. 
This, Mr Speaker, is a government becalmed in a sea of its own troubles, neglecting the country and presiding over increasing levels of poverty, homelessness and inequality, ducking crucial reforms on social care, leaving millions relying on charity to eat. The deep splits in the Conservative Party consume all of its energies, and Brexit is like a black hole which devours all light, out of which literally nothing can emerge. This is a government that's failed badly, even in its own terms. It has failed catastrophically on Brexit. It's failed to unite a country, its obsession with the EU divided in the first place, and it's failed to deliver on the Prime Minister's personal promise to deal with burning injustices, instead providing us with a parade of incompetent ministers, unparalleled in any administration since the Second World War. I give way to my honourable friend. She makes a very telling point there, because whilst the, the government dithers over Brexit, Meanwhile, back home, we've got a whole range of issues that she's just talked about, <coughs> like food banks, unemployment, problems with the health service, education and so forth. That's one of the reasons why we want a general election, to deal with those things. Oh, I agree with my honourable friend. This government is paralysed um, dealing with its own obsessions and not dealing with the real need and policy, uh, crucial policy issues in the country. Uh, Mr Speaker, yesterday's defeat on the draft withdrawal agreement was a catastrophic loss of the Prime Minister's own personal plan to engineer a hard Brexit in the UK, and it was entirely deserved. The Prime Minister has been humiliated by losing a vote on a plan she devised after little or no consultation with her own Cabinet. She finds herself in this position because of a series of colossal misjudgments which were entirely her own and for which she must now take personal responsibility. She has, I... An extremely good friend obviously always making such an informed and detailed speech. Would she agree with me that it's only because of David Cameron's botched legacy around a fixed-term Parliament Act is why the Government are able to ignore the will of this House? In any other circumstances, losing on those figures, the Government would and should fall. I agree completely, and I think some of the imbalances caused by that Government in the way our unwritten constitution works <coughs> need to be addressed. Uh, the Prime Minister decided that she would kowtow to her own extremists rather than reach out. And so she tried to exclude Parliament from the process completely. She triggered Article 50 without a plan, and then she called a general election which shattered her own majority. But of course she's doing her best to avoid a general election mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. The UK is now angrier, more divided and fearful for the future than I have ever known it. <coughs> and democracy itself is being questioned. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to bring the country back together by reaching out, the Prime Minister has set herself up as the embodiment of the Leave voters, ignoring those who voted Remain. Yesterday, she even dangerously claimed that she is now the champion of the people against Parliament. She has failed to unite the country because her only interest is in uniting the Conservative Party, and that has proved to be impossible. This is a government that doesn't seem to understand that demanding people unite around your own partisan viewpoint can never heal divisions. It's a government which is not capable of reaching out, listening, compromising and responding to genuine fears, and as such it is not fit for purpose. Upon taking office, the Prime Minister promised to tackle burning injustices which made life difficult for those she called just about managing. She failed to acknowledge that much of the suffering in our country has been caused by the previous governments of which she was a senior member. This government refuses to acknowledge that years of cuts in public expenditure targeted most heavily on the poorest have resulted in much of the suffering and burning injustice she promised to end. The government has issued countless press releases, has held a series of never-ending consultations on everything from social care, restaurant tips, road landlords, domestic violence, but nothing has changed. Instead, the country has been presented with a parade of incompetent ministers who were simply not up to the job, a Home Secretary forced to resign over the Windrush scandal and the hostile environment which saw UK citizens treated like criminals and deported back to countries they'd left as small children, a Transport Secretary handing out shipping contracts to a company with no ships 
and no access to commercial ports, Absolutely. who presides over the chaos of a railway timetable disaster and blames everyone but himself. This is a man who cannot even organise a fake lorry jam on the M20. Three Brexit secretaries in two years, each of them undermined by her, and perhaps the Prime Minister's crowning achievement, appointing the right honourable member for Uxbridge and South Ruslip as Foreign Secretary, and she wonders why the UK is now a global laughing stock. This government is paralysed by the, its own obsessions. It's proved incapable of addressing a country crying out for change. It's time for it to go. Yeah. Thank you, Sam Gima. Mr Speaker, my, uh, the right honourable member for Putney hit the nail on the head when she said in her speech that at a time of a constitutional and political crisis in this country, every minute we spend on politics as usual and business as usual is a disaster for this country. And as far as the issue of Brexit is concerned, the opposition has been completely absent from the field. In fact, it seems to me that the leader of the opposition has been gambling on chaos so that that will present him with the perfect opportunity to get into government and fo focus on his single-minded approach to introduce a Marxist utopia for this country. So on the issue of Brexit, Labour is not a government in waiting. It is an opposition in hiding. But Brexit is not the only issue, as the opposition have said today, that we need to be debating. I believe, Mr Speaker, that there are certain things that no Prime Minister of this country should ever do. No Prime Minister of this country, irrespective of the political party they represent, they should not do. One of those, of course, is do anything to interfere with the territorial integrity of this country. No Prime Minister has the right to do so. But, Mr Speaker, the other thing is that no Prime Minister should side with our enemies and should be an enemy of our institutions. Now, if we, want, if we are wondering what the Leader of the Opposition would be like as Prime Minister, and it is important because if you vote no confidence in the Government, you are suggesting that he should be the Prime Minister of this country. You only need to look at what happens to members on the opposite side who have a dissenting voice. Yeah. Members on the opposite side who have a dissenting voice are threatened by a mob and the leader of the opposition pretends it's got nothing to do with him. Now, on this side of the House, there are many of us who disagree with the Prime Minister. In fact, I am one of those, and we say so on the TV studios every now and again. But at least we say so in the confidence that we will never need police protection disagreeing with our Prime Minister on our principles. That is what has happened on the other side of the House. I'll take that intervention. I'm most grateful to the Honourable Gentleman giving way, and he's absolutely right. The first duty of the state is to protect your citizens. Now, looking at the comments made by the Leader of the Opposition previously, not having an army and the position on Trident, imagine that person running this country. Our country's security will be completely destroyed. What does he say to that? I'm going to come on to the security point in a second, but it's not just members on the other side who feel threatened by the mob. Journalists have needed protection at the Labour Party conference. It is one of their own MPs who called their party institutionally racist. 40% of British Jews will consider leaving this country. And why? Because the leader of the opposition has spent a lifetime hanging around with the likes of Hamas and Hezbollah. I, I need to carry on. So, Mr Speaker, that is one thing no Prime Minister should do, be an enemy of our democracy, but also our institutions. I was surprised when the just Shadow Justice Secretary said, we need to make sure that our judiciary represents society. Now, what could go wrong when politicians start trying to make our independent judiciary representative of our society? And Mr Speaker, the next thing is security. During the 2017 general election, when I spoke to people on the doorstep and mentioned things like the IRA, there were some people who said to me, that was 30 years ago, or I don't know the difference between the IRA and the IMF. But most recently, we had a test case. 
Russian agents, mur- Russian agents murdered an innocent British person, Brit person on British soil. <laughs> Russian agents murdered an innocent person on British soil. In response to this, 147 Russian uh, uh, intelligence officers were expelled. Moldova, Estonia, Hungary, very small countries, also expelled Russian agents in their country in support of us. To this day, we do not know whether the leader of the opposition supported that action. In fact, what he said is we should send the samples to the lead suspect in that murder case for them to tell us whether or not they did it. Now, this is very serious, and it is serious, it is serious because it sends a green light to every gangster that if this motion of no confidence goes through and the leader of the opposition is the prime minister of our country, they have a free pass. Putin and Assad will have a free pass. Also, it suggests to the Western alliance to which we are committed, we are members of NATO. We the order, at the moment, the, the honourable gentleman is not giving way. Sam Jima. We are members of NATO and we believe that an attack on one is an attack on all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are committed to defending our allies. So what happens if we have a prime minister who is not committed to NATO? The entire Western alliance and what it is based on is completely undermined. So, Mr Speaker, I will vote with the government today. And I will vote with the government today on the principle that there are certain things that no Prime Minister should ever do, and we cannot trust the Leader of the Opposition not to do that. And that is why we should all vote to support this government. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And uh, can can I say that I have been... I've been struck uh, by how many honourable members uh, since yesterday evening have been very assiduous in their entreaties that uh, I and my honourable friends should be present for this debate to speak and to vote later in the lobbies in support of the government and to prevent a general election. And indeed, some of those entreaties have even come from the government side of the House. (laughs) I I I don't... Never, 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 mind, never mind the uh, people in the country not wanting a general election. If, uh, in terms of indicative votes, I think if people had a real choice here privately and a secret ballot, there would be an overwhelming majority against a general uh, election. Be that as it may, Mr Speaker, we have arrived where we are at this debate in the aftermath of the Prime Minister. And it really was the Prime Minister's uh, proposition uh, that has been defeated by a record majority. Uh, in terms of the withdrawal agreement. And last night's verdict was emphatic, and it does require lessons to be learned if the Prime Minister is to secure meaningful changes uh, to the withdrawal agreement. And I trust the lessons are being learned and will be learned. Our view has been entirely consistent that we want to deal with the European Union. We want an agreement uh, to achieve an orderly exit from the European Union in March, but the backstop has been fatal to the proposed withdrawal agreement, uh, and that needs to be dealt with. Now, following the general election, we entered into the confidence and supply uh, agreement with the uh, Conservative Party in the national interest to pursue the agreed objectives as set out in that agreement. Can I say that the support that we have secured for Northern Ireland in relation to the extra investment for health service, education and infrastructure, regardless of constituency, regardless of political affiliation, has been widely welcomed by all fair-minded people uh, in the province. And on Brexit, we agreed to support the government where it acted on the basis of our shared priorities. That's what the Confidence and Supply Agreement actually states in terms. And, of course, for us, (laughs) one of our shared priorities, of course, is the preservation of the integrity of the United Kingdom and that we leave the European Union as one country, not leaving part of it behind in single market regulation while the rest uh, is not subject to such rules made in Brussels. (coughs) 
So we supported the Prime Minister when she said that she would secure a deal that would deliver on the verdict of the referendum, take back control of our money, our laws and our borders and ensure that we left as one United Kingdom. We have delivered on our side of that agreement, Mr Speaker, ensuring the government has had the necessary supply, ensuring a majority for the government on the EU withdrawal bill and other important pieces of legislation as well. But on this issue of the Brexit backstop, as this House well knows, we have had, of course, a big difference with the Prime Minister. And so do the majority, of course, of the Conservatives in this House, Conservative members uh, who are not on the government payroll. The majority of Conservative members not on that payroll oppose the Prime Minister's deal as well. And it is because the draft withdrawal agreement breaches the shared priorities for Brexit that we signed up to that we haven't been prepared to support it. So now we have this no-confidence motion before us. We believe it's in the national interest, Mr Speaker, to support the government at this time so that the aims and objectives of the confidence supply agreement we entered into can be achieved. Much work remains to be done on those matters. Mr Speaker, as I said, I don't think the people in this country would... Uh, rejoice that they prospect tonight if a general election were to be called. I'm not convinced that a general election would significantly change the composition of the House. And of course, it doesn't change, whatever the outcome, it doesn't change the choices that lie before us all. The timing of this motion, as we well know, has got much more to do with the internal dynamics of the Labour Party than a genuine presentation of an alternative programme for government. So we will support the government tonight this evening on this uh, motion so that the Prime Minister has more time and has the space to focus now on acting in the national interest on Brexit. And it's important that the Prime Minister now does listen and does deliver a Brexit that ensures that the whole of the United Kingdom leaves the European Union together. Thank you. George Freeman. It's a privilege uh, to follow the Honourable Member for Belfast. North. Mr Speaker, uh, we gather this afternoon to debate the Leader of the Opposition's motion that he should be Prime Minister. That, I think, will unite this, this party on this side of the House more than any other motion, and indeed unite the nation long overdue after the divisions of Brexit. Mr Speaker, if you will forgive me channelling my inner Monty Python, I want to ask what have the Conservatives ever done for us? Let's ask. What has this great party ever done for us? You're right. I, I mean, our record, uh, our record may not pass scrutiny. When you think about the mess we inherited from the opposition, stabilising the public finances, cutting the labour deficit by 80%, leading a jobs-led recovery, creating over a million jobs from 2.5 million unemployment we inherited, the opposition are barracking because they don't like to hear it or hear it broadcast to the nation. But the nation should hear it. We've created over a million jobs in an extraordinary jobs-led recovery yeah, yeah. applauded by the IMF. I will give way when I finish this point. We've introduced the national living minimum wage, helping over 2.4 million workers. You'd think they'd cheer that on the benches opposite. No, they're not cheering because they want this election for a different reason. I will continue the list, Mr Speaker. We have introduced apprenticeships, giving a whole generation of young, non-academic youngsters access to workplace, over three million apprenticeships. We have introduced welfare reforms, which I do not think we have got totally right. But you, I am sorry, Mr Speaker, the opposition have taken every opportunity not to introduce sensible and positive reforms and work with us, but just to vote against every single welfare reform on principle, flying in the face of the public's wish for a welfare system that is there for those who need it, but is not taken advantage of. Not only that, we have introduced tax cuts Mr. Speaker, for the lowest paid, not the highest paid, on whose earnings we rely on funding public services, but the lowest. 32 million of our lowest paid workers have benefited from Conservative and Liberal Democrat led tax cuts in the coalition. I have not finished, Mr. Speaker, on NHS spending. Not only have we put in the money that the Labour Party was saying at the last election, we have put in more a £20 billion, £20 billion funding for our NHS, always safe under this party's leadership in its history. We have introduced a massive commitment on mental health, and I pay personal tribute to the Prime Minister on this. This party, not the opposition opposite, this party 
that made clear that the, the parity between mental and physical health must be achieved. We have introduced Mr. Speaker, a pioneering industrial strategy welcomed by Peter Mandelson, a once distinguished member of the front bench of that party, and which I was proud to play my part in. And we put 2% commitment into defence, so launched two new aircraft carriers, a new fleet of fighters. It's not enough, but defence is safe in this country, and even on housing, where I think we've not achieved all we should. We've built 1.3 million homes, 400,000 affordable homes, more than the party opposite who now complain ever did in their 13 years. And on education, we've led to a renaissance of education with over 1.9 million children now in schools judged by Ofsted as good or outstanding. 1.9 million more people than under Labour. That is not a record that anyone should be ashamed of. It's a record to be proud of if you want to have a vote of confidence in this government. I'll happily give way. way. He's making a very good case as to why this should be a vote of no confidence in Her Majesty's occasionally loyal opposition. But does he also agree with me that this should be a vote of no confidence in the EU negotiators who have continually failed to provide the legally binding annex on the backstop that would make all the difference to this deal? Well, he's probably right, but I don't want to be distracted from focusing on the issue at hand. Meanwhile, the Leader of the Opposition, our putative future Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, has broken promise after promise on tuition fees. He promised a young generation that he was going to reverse them and then reverse the promise. On debt, a thousand billion extra borrowing and spending, taking us right back to square one in tidying up the mess we inherited. Mayor Khan has presided over a knife crime epidemic in London. He talks about it but doesn't deal with it. The Shadow Home Secretary, Diane Abbott, can't add up, let alone defend the police when they try and clamp down on crime. The truth is that the Labour front bench is exploiting the Brexit divisions. I hear the heckling from the party opposite, Mr Speaker. They don't like it. They don't like it. But I'm afraid they're going to have to hear it if they want to have a vote of no confidence. And I won't dwell on the appalling unleashing of bigotry and intolerance on the Labour front bench that's turned a once great party into a disgrace. Yeah. And on Brexit, on the point, and the point at hand, Mr Speaker, the truth is Jeremy Corbyn, the Leader of the Opposition, is the Scarlet Pimpernel of Brexit. In the North, they seek him here, the champion of Brexit for the Northern Labour seats. In the South, they seek him there, the, the Scarlet Pimpernel champion of Remain. The truth is, the Labour front bench heckling me now have got more positions on Brexit than the Karma Sutra. <laughs> Will the real Jeremy Corbyn please stand up, Mr Speaker, in the pa- pantomime politics? I wonder, I wonder, this tendency now of members on both sides to refer to members of the House by name is quite wrong. Stop it. George Freeman. Mr Speaker, the member for Islington North, will the real member please stand up? I was speaking this morning to channel my inner leader of the opposition to Mark from Castleford on talk radio, who said to me, we don't need an election because we don't have an opposition, they don't have a policy, there is no choice. We need Parliament to get on and implement Brexit. In contrast to the cowardice of the Labour front bench, can I highlight the bravery of many Labour backbenchers, in particular those members who had the guts last night to stand up for their constituents and vote for a moderate, sensible Brexit. The members for Dudley North, for Bassett Law, for Rother Valley, for Birkenhead, for North Down, for Eastbourne, members who know that if we break our promise to the British people, this place's credibility will be damaged. Mr Speaker, Parliament has to sort this out. I welcome the Prime Minister's conversion to cross-party discussions, and I hope that the real member for Islington North enters the room. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support this motion, not simply because the Government has made a mess of Brexit, although it has, but because of the damage it has inflicted on people in constituencies like mine and to the fabric of our society. Both of those things are linked in the character of the Prime Minister, who is so narrow in outlook that she could not reach out across this House to get a Brexit deal we could all support, but instead chose to draw red lines to appease the extremists on her own backbenches. She talks of the national interest. In fact, she acts in her own interest of retaining power. And just as she cannot see further than that, she is unable to appreciate the circumstances in which many of our fellow citizens live. There are people in constituencies like mine 
who go out to work every day of their lives and are still having to go to food banks to feed their children because they earn so little or are on zero hours contracts. And there are others too that we see every week in our surgeries. Elderly people who have worked all their lives and cannot get the social care they deserve in their old age. A lady who came to see me recently who cares for a sick husband, who has now taken on the care of her two grandchildren, both incredibly damaged in their early lives, and who is now denied the adaptation she needs to her home because there is no money left because local government funding has been cut so much. Another lady I saw, a victim of domestic violence, asked to take on her two children because it was feared her former partner was now abusing them. She did, but she is now trapped in a one-bedroom flat because of the scarcity of affordable social housing. These are not the shirkers and the shysters of Tory imagination. These are people doing the right thing, going out to work every day to earn their poverty. And that has come about not by incompetence. I, mean, I, I could probably forgive them for being incompetent. Mm, yeah. It has come about as a result of deliberate policy of cutting back the services on which so many people in our society depend. Yeah, yeah. They boast of spending records amounts on schools, but that's because there are more pupils. <laughs> in fact, they have cut the spending on pupils Absolutely. by 8%. It's 25% in six forms. Yep. And who suffers? Those who are dependent on state education. Who suffers from the lack of affordable housing? Children who are trapped in unsuitable accommodation, who can neither study and improve their prospects, nor even grow up healthy. And they accuse this party of putting the burden on their future. The burden put on people's future is by what they are causing now, the lack of opportunities, the lack of opportunity to get a decent education, to grow up properly, to make the best of your life. And that is done by them. I mean, there's a constant attack on public services that they have endured. They have loaded nurses with the burden of debt when they abolished bursaries. They chose to wage a war on the junior doctors. They sacked thousands of police and prison officers and PCSOs. This was a deliberate policy, let's remember. And it is not just individuals they target, but whole regions of this country. Only a government which did not care about the North could wash its hands of the chaos that was Northern Rail. Only a government which does not care about the North could maintain a system of local government finance that imposes the biggest cuts on the poorest local authorities, mostly in the North. And then it tells them to raise the precepts, without knowing, of course, that in the North West, 42% 42% of the properties are in Band A, and in Surrey, 75% are in Band D or above. They cannot raise the same amount of money on the same rising council tax because spending has been totally divorced from need. I have no confidence in this government, not just because it's incompetent, but because it has no com- confidence and no faith in the people of this country. Before I call the next speaker, who will be the first, and she's been advised subject to a four-minute limit, namely the Honourable Lady, the Member for Maidstone and the Weald, I have first to announce the results of the deferred divisions. On the question relating to energy conservation, the ayes were 330, the noes were 240. Of those members representing constituencies in England and Wales, the ayes were 302, the noes were 233, so the ayes have it. On the question relating to UK participation in the EU Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation, the ayes were 577, the noes were 20, so the ayes have it. Mrs Helen Grant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm very confident that a great future awaits the United Kingdom after we have left the European Union. We're the fifth largest economy. We have a judicial system revered the world over. 
We have time zones that allow us to trade with Asia in the morning and the Americas in the afternoon. We have the greatest diplomatic service in the world. And crucially, nations across the globe want to do business with us, thanks to many of the achievements of this government since 2010. But in order to seize those opportunities, Mr Speaker, as we leave the EU, this House and indeed our country needs to come together. And that coming together will require determination, effort, spirit and compromise from us all. We need to treat each other with more respect and, and work harder to understand the different points of view. Yes, sir. There are a number of reasons why I will be uh, supporting the uh, motion of confidence tonight. I could go into any number regarding universal credit or any other areas. But one of the key areas as to why I think the Prime Minister has let uh, our constituents down is because this was her plan for Brexit. This was her, uh, this was her red lines, and she has failed to get that through. Doesn't she believe, the Honourable Lady believe, that she has to take some responsibility, accept some blame, and stop blaming everybody else? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the point that the Honourable Gentleman raises has been covered a multitude of occasions already today and in previous debates. I'm not going to eat into my time here now because I've got some important and different points to make. There is also, Mr. Speaker, a well known expression that if you're shouting, you're losing. And at the moment, many of us seem to be shouting on both sides of this House. On a daily basis, Mr Speaker, like many other colleagues, I've witnessed taunts and lurid language as I've gone about my business near the parliamentary estate. Sadly, with an ever-present apprehension of a brick being lobbed or someone being punched. <clears throat> as a former domestic violence lawyer, I know too well that when tensions reach fever pitch, as they are right now, it's so easy for a situation that starts with some shouting and some, and some jeering to escalate into physical abuse and worse. All of this needs to stop. I believe that it is our duty and responsibility as parliamentarians to find a solution which ends this Brexit deadlock and delivers for the British people. They need it and they deserve it. The answer is not a vote of no confidence in this government. No one could have worked harder and more patriotically than our Prime Minister yeah, to deliver yeah, this yeah, Brexit. Yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is not a second referendum with all the division and uncertainty. And the answer is certainly not a general election. We were all recently elected and re-elected in 2017. Our jobs are to take difficult decisions, find answers. That's what we're here to do. Our constituents rightly expect us to deliver. It is for this House to find a solution that works. We must come together. We must stop playing party political games. Be willing to compromise. Put the interests of our constituents and country first. And I will be supporting the government today. Yeah. Ben Bradshaw. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted that my right honourable friend has tabled and secured this uh, motion. I shall, of yeah. course, be wo voting for it, and I hope it wins because my constituents in the country desperately need a Labour government. I was proud and privileged to serve in the last Labour government, and I know what transformative power for the better a Labour government can be. We also desperately need a Labour government to steer this country through and out of the current Brexit crisis. So I hope we win tonight's vote and get a chance to change the government. But we need to be honest with ourselves and the public. If we do secure or win an election, we will still be facing the worst crisis in our peacetime history because of the mess the Tories have made of Brexit. And a general election in the current circumstances, and whether we like it or not, would be a Brexit election. We would need to be absolutely clear what our position was and what we would do in government. I have heard some suggestions that we should promise to deliver a better Brexit. Given the overwhelming views of Labour members and voters, I am not convinced that would be a winning strategy. I would hope that we would listen to our members and voters and to the country, which is tiring of this Brexit shambles, and that we would either campaign on a policy of staying in Europe or, failing that, 
promised to try to renegotiate a better deal before putting that back to the people in another referendum. The likelihood, however, Mr Speaker, let's be frank, is that we do not win tonight's confidence vote. And in those, those circumstances, it is vital that we all put the national interest first and find some way out of this current crisis. More no confidence motions, as some have suggested, are not the answer, and the Shadow Chancellor was absolutely right to rule this out on the radio this morning. There is no time for any more can kicking at this moment of national crisis. We need decisions and we need leadership. The Government, if after tonight it is still the Government, has the main responsibility here. And it doesn't seem to have learned anything from last night's catastrophic defeat. It's still sticking to its red lines. It's still failing to reach out to the official opposition. It is absolutely extraordinary that after last night's assurances from the Prime Minister, she hasn't bothered to pick up the phone to the Leader of the Opposition. It's a disgrace. The Leader of the House was also indulging in yet more fiction this morning when she claimed on, claimed on the radio that the Opposition didn't have a policy. We do. She might not like it, but that we do, and if the Government's serious, it needs to talk to the Opposition about it. I'm extremely doubtful. Uh, I'll give away. It's hitting it absolutely the nail on the head of the Prime Minister's attitude. In the response to the member from my colleague from Glasgow South at PMQs today, where she couldn't even think of a compromise in her red lines, shows the Prime Minister really isn't in that mode. She's still in the mode she was yesterday afternoon before she was thumped in the vote last night. She's, she's in a total state of denial, and we're not going to get anywhere unless that uh, changes. I'm extremely doubtful, Mr Speaker, that there is the time or the votes in this House for a renegotiation of the withdrawal agreement and on, along Norway lines or any other Brexit alternative. But if people think there is, let us put that to the test in votes next week. And if, when all these other options are tested, none can command a majority and Parliament remains gridlocked, the only option left will be to give this decision back to the people, as the Shadow Chancellor also said on the radio uh, this morning. No, I'm not giving away. This also has the advantage, Mr Speaker, of actually being official Labour Party policy, agreed unanimously at our conference in September. And there would be bewilderment and dismay among Labour members, voters and the wider public who are looking to us for leadership if at this critical time we failed to provide it. I'd like to say one final thing to those in my own party who still fear or oppose another referendum. A public vote to get out of this Brexit mess is also the surest fire way to secure the general election we on this side of the House desire. Because when the public, as they will, rejects the government's botched Brexit deal, no government depended on the votes of the hardline Brexiteers and the DUP would survive. Thank you. Johnny Mercer. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Now, yesterday was clearly a tough day. It was a tough day for the Prime Minister. It was a tough day on this side of the House. But today is not a tough day. By calling a vote of no confidence uh, and looking for a general election, the Leader of the Opposition has proved what I have always considered his view that politics is just a game, that all that matters is this posturing and the endless uh, clipping of TV clips to shout at the Prime Minister, and actually the reality is people just want to get on with this and get it done. There is no appetite for it, and there is a huge challenge now. If people continue to think that this is a Conservative problem, that only the Conservatives can deal with a Brexit, then they are fundamentally misunderstanding why people voted to leave the European Union. This is a challenge that has been presented to the political class that we must find a way of answering, but for which there are absolutely no answers coming from the Leader of the Opposition. That I will give way. He talks about politics being a game. But I think this is all about more a little bit about self-interest. And does he not agree, 18 months ago, calling a general election was apparently in the national interest, but now they have no interest at all? Why is that? Whoa. My honourable friend knows uh, my views on uh, a lot of uh, what has gone on, including the calling of, uh, of that general election. But this about today, this is a different moment. We are 18 months down the line. And let's be honest about what would happen in a general election. Let's be honest, you wouldn't have the normal general election between a centre-left and a centre-right party. You have the front bench at opposite advocating a hard-left programme that has singularly destroyed almost every single country that it has been practised in. It's true. 
and on the back of what can only be described as sincerely held dishonesty, on the back of some of the most impoverished people in this country, claiming that they will look after them when it is in fact they who will pay the biggest price from any government represented by the members opposite. I will give way. The gentlemen agree with me that there is no social mobility in bankruptcy, and it is only if you have a prosperous economy that is generating opportunity that we can deliver that kind of social mobility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My honourable friend Charlton absolutely hits the nail on the head. The rank hypocrisy that comes out of members opposite when it talks about social justice and how we equalise life chances, that fantastic phenomenon that no matter where you are born in this country, whether it's Manchester, Plymouth, London, Chelsea, you're gay, black, white, whatever, the circumstances of your birth are irrelevant, your opportunities are the same. That fundamental principle is in no way advanced whatsoever by the hard left policies of massive government, massive tax, taking over private companies and sucking the money out of, out of people's pockets who go out and work hard in this country every single day. I will give way. Thank for giving, giving way to myself. And would you not agree with me that every Labour government in history has left the country in bankruptcy? Yeah. Look, I totally agree with my honourable friend. I do think this, you know, we just uh, had to sit through quite a bizarre rant from a member of the opposition who is now not here. This idea that people like me turn up in this place to impoverish people in the north of this country and the southwest is a repulsive suggestion. It plays to the fantasy uh, that uh, most of the members opposite live within, and it's a complete and utter load of rubbish. I won't give way any more. I've given way enough already. I think we should stick to the facts. I really do. The Prime Minister spoke earlier. One million less children in absolute poverty. 300,000 less children in absolute poverty. One million people less in absolute poverty. You've got two million children in this school, in this uh, two million children in this country who are going to better uh, good or outstanding schools under Ofsted. If you look at the policies that are genuinely affected, the lowest paid in this country, that the members opposite pretend to care about, you look at income tax thresholds, they are now keeping more of their money than they've ever kept before, and the minimum wage, which has consistently gone up as a result of policies on uh, this side of the House. And I don't want to get on to the welfare state today, but if there is one issue that made me join this side of the House from a fairly uh, agnostic political space, which I'm afraid is the majority of this country. We could think everybody's fascinated with politics. I assure you they are not. The majority are agnostic. But if you design a welfare state that saps the ambition for millions and millions yeah. of young people in this country yeah. by making people better off out of work on benefits than in work, and at least we have the courage on this side of the House to actually try, to actually try and correct that injustice in this country. You're simply not going to get it from the opposition who have been bribing people for votes for as long as I can remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel no shame. Believe me, I feel no shame. I feel absolutely... The, the opposition shouted at me as much as want. I feel no shame when they called that out. We must do better. Okay, on this side, we must do better. Everybody gets that. The Prime Minister, we, you know, we have to work together better and come together under one banner. We need a different approach. Nobody can misunderstand that. The Prime Minister, you cannot keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Okay, the Prime Minister must change, change course. We must meet this challenge. But politics is changing. Politics is changing. We're either on the front of that wave and we're crafting it into something that we can then uh, work with and produce policies that change lives in this country for those people we come to work for, or we can laugh at it, sneer about it, and be uh, changed by events. We have to change with politics. It's an exciting time. See Brexit as the opportunity yeah, that it is, yeah. not the hospital pass that some would make us think. It's an opportunity. Yeah, Seize yeah, those yeah, opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Change the country. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker, and I'm grateful for the chance to speak in this debate this afternoon, and I thought the essence of our argument was laid out with force and passion and eloquence by the Leader of the Opposition this afternoon. The truth is the Prime Minister is charged this afternoon 
with the greatest political failure in modern times. Yeah. On the most important question that this country faces, she has secured the biggest defeat that our country's parliament has ever delivered. That, Mr Speaker, alone should be grounds for her to go. How on earth, how on earth does she think she is going to command a majority in this House when she cannot command a majority on the biggest question of the day? But the truth is, Mr Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition made this point eloquently this afternoon, her failure of leadership stretches well beyond the failure of her policy on Brexit. It's often said that we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. For me, the best definition of our poetry was set out back in 1945 when we offered that plan to reconstruct a war-weary nation and win the peace. We said what we need in this country is industry in service of the nation. Do we have that today? The Chancellor himself is the first to berate the terrible rates of productivity growth in our industry. The rates of productivity growth in our industry today are worse than they were in the late 1970s when we used to call it British disease. We said that everyone in this country should have the right, through the sweat of their brow, to earn a decent life. Yet, Mr Speaker, half of the people in poverty in the West Midlands are in poverty. Half the people in work are in poverty. We now have people going to food banks who never thought that they would be in this position. And above all, we said to the people of this country that they should be able to live and raise a family free from fear of want. Well, on the doorstep of this parliament, people are dying homeless. One of the 5,000 people who have died homeless over the last five years. Many people in this House, Mr Speaker, know that I recently lost my father with a lifelong struggle with alcohol after he'd lost the woman he loved to cancer a few years older than me. I know firsthand how a twist of fate can knock you down. But for millions of people in this country, a, knock, a twist of fate knocks you onto the streets, onto the pavements, into the soup kitchens where I work in Birmingham on a Sunday night. That is not the sign of a civilised and decent country, and it's something that this government should be ashamed of. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister took her seals of office, she had the temerity to stand on the steps of Downing Street and say to an anxious nation that she was going to tackle the burning injustices of this country. She said that she was going to tackle the burning flames, and yet those flames now rage higher than I have ever seen in my lifetime. She now leads a government of shreds and patches, and we on this side of the House say that this country deserves better, and she should do the decent thing and resign. Yeah. Yeah. Anna Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable yeah. Member for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Now, I don't agree with his, conclu uh, his conclusion in, in any uh, sense at all, because I think it would be grossly wrong <laughs> for us to have a general election, but I do agree with him when he talks about some of the very real problems that are existing in our country and which we have an absolute duty uh, as a government to start to address properly, ruthlessly in many respects and thoroughly. And I'm delighted that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for um, Work and Pensions, is already beginning that work, the honourable yeah. member for Hastings. And she's already looking at universal credit to make sure that we are delivering a system that is absolutely fair. Yeah. Fair not just for the taxpayer, but fair for the person who comes to rely upon universal credit. And I agree with my, uh, uh, right, the right honourable gentleman. It cannot be right that we live in a country where if you are in work, you are relying on food banks. That is wrong. That is not the sort of country that I think we should have in 2019. And equally, I think we have a system which, again, can't be right that when you're in need, you are given food vouchers and not often cash, which you also might need. But those changes are beginning to be made, and I think that's good and that's right. I think there is another problem, if I may say, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, the government is undoubtedly set on the right course, but it's often being diverted because of Brexit. It has swamped almost everything that we want to do and I know that we can do. 
But there's also a real democratic deficit that's opening up in our country. And I agree with my right honourable friend, the member for Plymouth Moorview, when he talks about the state of British politics and the extremism that is undoubtedly taken o- taking over. Now, anybody trying to suggest that the Labour Party hasn't been taken over by the far left is frankly living in fantasy land. Yeah, 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 we yeah, all yeah. know, uh, we only have to go and look on social media if anybody's got any doubt about it. Look at the comments that are made from the far left momentum and all the rest of it. The whole tone of British politics yeah, yeah. has been grossly uh, diminished, but also we know, we all know about it. Let's try and be honest. There are many honourable, right honourable members sitting on the back benches uh, opposite who are in fear of being deselected, who fear the far left all the time. And more importantly, this country should fear the far left who've taken over the front bench of the Labour Party and God goodness help help us if we were ever in a situation where they would go into government because they would undoubtedly cause the most appalling damage, especially to our uh, economy. And of course I'll take the extra minute. Very grateful, Honourable Lady, for giving away. The problem that she's on at the moment and the problem that she was there at the beginning of her speech when she talked about fairness, I would suggest it's not so much fairness as resources. There's plenty of resources in this country. It's the distribution of resources that's the problem. And that is why the Honourable Member there, the Honourable Member there is in the soup kitchens of Burmy on a Sunday night because of the inadequate fairness of distribution of resources in the UK. That's where the problem is. That's why people reach to Brexit. That's why people are looking for weird places on the far left because of that issue. Without analysis at all. The problem is, is that if we don't get the economy of our country sorted, if we don't have a good, strong economy, then we absolutely don't have the money to pay for the services that we absolutely need. We know we need to tackle the great uh, problems, almost a crisis that we have in social care, but there are no magic money trees. And the great danger is, and I would say this given my views on Brexit, that if we don't get Brexit right, then, and we know what the consequences of Brexit is going to be, whichever way you cut it, because the Treasury analysis has told us it's it's going to make our country's fortunes less prosperous. It is not going to be good for the economy of this country. But I do want to return, if I may, to this problem about democracy, Mr Speaker, because I am concerned. I've, I think everybody's almost given up on the Labour Party. But if I look upon my own party, we too have got to get it right. And, and I think the Prime Minister has done her best. I don't doubt that for, for one moment. But I have to say, she's had many opportunities, and honourable and right honourable members on both sides of this House have talked about it. I spoke about it earlier today. She had the opportunity at the outset to reach out, especially into the 48%, and to make sure that she formed her consensus at the beginning, working cross-party. Because undoubtedly there was a time when we could get a consensus. We could have got a majority in this place. But unfortunately, she pandered to a part of my party, which has been there for a very long time, banging on about Europe. In my opinion, they do not represent the moderate, one-nation, pragmatic Conservatives that I certainly, and a party that I certainly join. And unfortunately, she has pandered to that side of my party and with great harm to our party. Because if we ever lose that centrist, sensible, moderate, pragmatic, one-nation conservatism, then we will not succeed in winning again, and especially amongst young people. So I hope the Prime Minister changes her tone. The problem, Mr Speaker, is her deal. She, she wants to get Brexit sorted and deliver it. She has to change her deal. She has to rub out her red lines and work with everybody. Laura Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I think it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Broxtow, although I must put on record that I do completely disagree with the lines that she peddled out about my party. Um, Mr Speaker, we all came to this place knowing that each of us have been given a mandate to represent the communities that elected us. No one party won the general election in 2017, but the Prime Minister was clearly able to command a functioning majority in the House of Commons, and we have all had to acknowledge that reality. I didn't expect much from a Prime Minister that had promised a dementia tax, more grammar schools and an end to the ban on fox hunting, but I did, Mr Speaker, have some hope that there were at least one or two policy areas where we might be able to park our party politics and begin to address the issues that matter most to those communities we represent. 
For example, I know that there are honourable members of the party opposite who share my concerns about funding for our schools, and the Prime Minister included funding for our schools as a priority in her foreword to the Conservative Party manifesto in 2017, which also committed to a real terms increase in funding for our schools. And yet, This Government replaced one unfair schools funding formula with another, leaving schools in Crewe and Nantwich amongst the lowest funded in the country. Cuts have meant that head teachers are using the pupil premium to keep their budget afloat and parents are being asked by cash-strapped schools to pay for teaching resources. Mr Speaker, I also welcome the commitment to tackle unfair executive pay and to build a Britain in which work pays, to quote the Prime Minister. Yet, while CEOs managed to scoop themselves an average 11% hike in their pay this year, ordinary working people's real wages remain lower than where they were in 2010, and millions of working families are set to be worse off under their deeply flawed universal credit system. During the 2017 election, I was pleased to hear the Prime Minister promise to fix what she admitted was a broken care system and bring a social care green paper. In July of that year, the Government said, we cannot wait any longer, we need to get on with this. By the time we got to November, they told us that it would be here by the following summer. By the time we got to the summer, they told us to expect it in the autumn, and then before the end of the year. Well, we're a long way from 2017 when it was first promised, and there's still no sign of a green paper. And in the meantime, Mr Speaker, care providers in Crewe and Nantwich have been placed in special measures, care workers have all been ignored, and the elderly and most vulnerable in our communities have been neglected by this government whilst they pull themselves apart over Brexit. This government hasn't just failed people with the way it has handled the Brexit negotiations, they have failed on the economy. They have failed on our public services. They have been riding roughshod over Parliament, repeatedly ignoring the expressed view of this House. I am sure there are honourable members sitting opposite who will be deeply disappointed with this government's record. They get the casework, they see the effects of this government's policies that and what effect that has on their constituents, and they should not vote against this motion today out of self-preservation. This isn't simply about the government pursuing policies that I disagree with or failing to meet my expectations. This is about a government that isn't even coming close to delivering on its own promises. And what's more, we have seen more than once that the Prime Minister cannot command a majority in the House, and we have got to break this Brexit deadlock. This government has failed our communities and left a trail of broken promises in their wake, and I think it's time we gave those we represent a chance to turn their back on these failed policies, just as this government has turned its back on their future. Kerr. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. Yeah, it is a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady, the Member for Crewe in Nantwich, and I rise to make a short contribution to simply state that I have full confidence in this Conservative and Unionist Government. And I have full confidence in my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. She personifies duty. She is a patriot and a servant of our country and its people. She's a woman of integrity and continues to serve the national interest with all diligence and is leading a government which is dedicated to serving our national interest. We should be no under illusions. We have given, she was given the toughest job ever handed to a peacetime Prime Minister. She has been asked to circle an impossible square. But I have every confidence that under her leadership we will honour the instruction of the British people and leave the European Union in an orderly and managed way. We must not lose sight of the real achievements of the last nine years of Conservative-led government. The mess that Labour left, and they always leave a mess behind them, Mr Speaker, is being cleared up. The deficit is down by four-fifths. The public finances are being restored. The hard work of the British people is paying off. 
A thousand new jobs have been created every single day of this government. Employment is at record levels, unemployment at a record low, and there is real growth in household earnings. We are delivering on our promise to make the United Kingdom the best country in the world to set up and scale up a business. We have the right approach. But he also confirmed that it escapes me whether in the manifesto it also said we will increase food banks, increase child poverty and cut cut in education real time. Absolutely absolutely not. Um, We have the right approach to industrial strategy, the right approach to clean energy strategy, the right, right approach to new and evolving technologies. This government is tackling the grand challenges of our times. We are on the side of our people and our planet. We are rolling out the most important reform of welfare services ever undertaken, investing in our NHS for the future and resolved never to compromise on the defence of the realm against the background of an evolving threat to our freedom. We have a proud record on delivering practical help to the poorest people on the planet. In my constituency, this government has delivered on a £90 million city deal, giving our city and district a bright economic future for all. And beyond this, Mr Speaker, and this is core to who I am and what I stand for, we have a Prime Minister who believes in the union, and it is heartfelt. Other Other people may have the words. She has the conviction and our government is committed to strengthening the union. And I would remind colleagues, and this we must never forget, the nationalists and the socialists sitting opposite are waiting in the wings. And we have a duty to our country to never allow them anywhere anywhere near the seat of government. Vernon Coker. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I wish the Honourable Member for Plymouth was still in his chair, uh, still in his seat, because we'd have the clash of opinion that we want in this House. When he sort of says to me and people like me on this side of the uh, of the House that defending, saying something about child poverty, saying it's an absolute horror to walk past people who are homeless on the street as we walk into this this Parliament, the fact is a matter of public policy. This government drives people to food banks, yeah, not as a charity, yeah, yeah. not as something that good people do as volunteering, but something that is public policy. I'll tell him, Summit, if that's a hard left programme, I'll stand on that in my constituency yeah, 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 in Gedlin, yeah, yeah, and I'll stand yeah. on that across this country. Yeah, yeah. We're not frightened of saying that, Mr Speaker. We're not frightened of saying that we believe this country deserves better, and we're not frightened of saying that we can do better. One of the things that the government has to accept, and I really want to come on to Brexit, one of the things I just wanted to say that the government has to accept, and my honourable friend made the point earlier on, I accept that uh, members opposite aren't people who are uncaring about homelessness, or I wouldn't suggest that for one moment. What I'm saying, and the indictment of the government, is that pupils in schools who cannot get the special needs support they want, the people in hospitals who cannot get the care that they want, these things don't land from the moon. These things don't just happen. They are as a consequence of the policies that people in this House vote for. I'm not going to give way because loads of people want to speak, and so it's only fair to them. It's only because of those policies that that happens. And that is the realisation that comes across the country. I'll stand on the record of what my honourable friend from the front bench has said is important for this country. I'm perfectly happy to do that. But what I will also do is I will list the voting records of every single member of the Conservative Party and list to the the people of this country what they've actually voted for, because we see the consequences of those policies every single day. Let me just say this, Mr Speaker. Uh, with respect to the Prime Minister. We are debating a no-confidence motion, and it is likely that this no-confidence motion will be passed. Uh, Sorry, this no-confidence motion will be lost. Let me just say this, and this is the constitutional and political (laughs) dilemma for this country. We are going, as a Parliament, to say we have confidence in a Prime Minister that we have no confidence in. It is a complete and utter 
constitutional fiasco. It is 230 members of Parliament. Uh, the majority was uh, yesterday. And yet the Prime Minister carries on, clings on. The Prime Minister says she is the person to deliver a Brexit. There is a parliamentary majority, I think, for a, uh, for a sensible way forward. What there is not is a Prime Minister who can deliver that parliamentary majority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is the problem that she's got. She's in hot to part of her per party that stops her building that consensus across this party, uh, across, across this Parliament. Let me also say this. It is as much, I just wonder what the result of the no confidence motion would be if it were no confidence in the Prime Minister to be able to deliver the Brexit this country uh, needs or to take this country forward. That would be the question that would actually pose a real dilemma for many people rather than a no confidence motion more generally in the government. So let me say this. The Prime Minister needs to reach out. She needs to build consensus. She needs to start with our front bench, with other parties in this Parliament. And in that way, she may be able to bring the country together and take us forward in the United Way. It should drax. Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm a, a former soldier, and in my military career, we were given an aim, and then we had an execution to carry out that aim. The government was given an aim, the aim by the people of this country was to leave the EU. The execution of that aim sadly has gone wrong for many reasons. I'm not going to stand here today and overly criticise my government, although I would say one point. I would wish some members of our front bench would stop accusing the likes of me for possibly ruining a no Brexit. That is not my aim. The reason I voted against the government last night was because the deal was not in the national interest and did not deliver Brexit. It kept us half in, half out, with no one in the chair to actually stand up for our country, plus many other reasons, including the backstop. The problem we have, in my humble opinion, is there is a disconnect. I have heard many members, honourable members in this House, on both sides, give their perfectly reasonable uh, uh, speeches in uh, consequence to the vote last night, which was a huge defeat for the government. But what I'm hearing, there is no consensus in this House, in most cases, to follow through what the people of this country told us to do. We were told to leave the EU. And in the vote last night, which was a catastrophic defeat, 117 of my colleagues voted against the government. The rest of those, the majority who voted against the government, did so for a, majority, for a number of reasons. There were some who don't want Brexit at all. There were some who want a second referendum. There were some who want a general election. I'm delighted to give way to Honourable Friend. Does my Honourable Friend share my concern? On those that are asking for a second referendum, why should anyone ever trust referendum or any electoral yeah, yeah. process if, when we're given an, a mandate to do something, we don't follow it yeah. through? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I agree with my Honourable Friend, and in my short speech on Monday, I made that exact point. Why should any of us, Honourable Members in this place, go into our constituencies with our political uh, manifestos and tell people this is what we're going to do, when quite clearly we don't do what we said we're going to do. Who on earth in this country is going to believe us? I don't think this is about people's personal views and many personal views, which I respect in this House, hugely diverse and different, 650. And I suspect every member of this House has a view on something. But the people of this country, who we gave the vote to, have told us to execute it. And it is to leave the EU. Now, what to do next? Can I suggest to my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, that she gets back on her feet? And I do. I have great sympathy for her. She has been handed a can of worms, a very, very difficult issue, which no one, I would suspect, in this House could manage either better or worse. What I would say is that had she been firmer with the EU, and this is what we've got to do now, I believe had we stood as the United Kingdom like a rock to say we want a deal, 
Of course we do. We want to be your friends and your allies, but we want to be in charge of our destiny. I think the EU by now would have said, we hear you. You are one of our major trading partners. Of course we want to deal with you, remain friends with you, because you are friends of ours, and they will continue to be so. So can I advise the front bench to go back to the EU as fast as they can? People say there's no time. The EU has a wonderful way of moving quickly, if indeed it needs to. To say we have the voice of this uh, house or home of democracy, uh, I cannot get this deal through. We need to have far more flexibility from the EU than you're prepared to offer. For example, removing the backstop. I think then she can come back, get agreement on the House, and we can get on with this uh, Brexit, which is antagonising millions of people around the country, as we all know. All my honourable friend. I'm delighted to be with I would just like to ask my honourable friend this. How does he interpret what the Prime Minister said last night about reaching across to the other side of the House? Because if we are to take both sides of the House with us, bearing in mind that there are a majority of honourable and right honourable members in this House who are for remain and not for leave, does that not mean that she will end up with an even softer Brexit than the one that she has proposed? Well, I, I, nothing would delight me more, Mr Speaker, if every single MP in this House said, let's get behind the Prime Minister, let's deal with Brexit, let's get out of the EU while remaining a good trading partner with them and get on with our lives. Well, I am absolutely convinced this country will do well and prosper and flourish as an independent country. We were for many hundreds of years before we joined the EU, and when we leave, we will flourish. Of that I have absolutely no doubt. And I'd like to also inform my right honourable friend that I have a message from the Chief Whip this morning, who I asked to confirm that the date of March 29th is still very much government policy. I have it here in black and white that it is. Now, no one wants a no deal. I've been accused of being an extremist and this and that, and I want to crash out and all this cliff edge nonsense. I don't. But we've got to have a stick to wield to the EU if we are to negotiate properly. And if ultimately they can't give us a deal, yes, we leave on WTO terms, which most of the world trades on peacefully and effectively. It'll be bumpy, yes. Leaving a place after 44 years is going to be. But we will manage because we're a great country. And we will survive. We will. And we will flourish and do well. So can I not survive? Flourish is the word I used. But according to the doomsters, we're all doomed. I'm saying we will not be doomed. We will flourish. So, front bench, let's get on with it. Deliver. Greeting. Speaker, it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for South Dorset because, if I may say so, it's that level of detachment from the absolute reality of the complexity of the Brexit negotiations and what the Prime Minister is trying to achieve that has led to so many members being divorced from reality. The reality of the negotiations, the reality of the consequences for the people we represent, and the reality of the conditions that people are already living in in this country. Because, Mr Speaker, we will survive. There will still be food on the table. There will still be Mars bars and packets of crisps. was not the promise made to people during the of the referendum, they were promised something better. And just like the rats fleeing the sinking ship of the cabinet, they deserted, so the promises went with them. And now, Mr Speaker, my constituents who voted leave are being offered something far less optimistic than the rosy prime pie in the sky promises made during the referendum. But, Mr Speaker, this debate is not about the referendum. This is about whether we have confidence in Her Majesty's Government. And it is striking. Not only are there so Few members coming along this afternoon to defend the government, so few have even bothered to talk about the government's record. There was one speech during the debate on the withdrawal agreement, Mr Speaker, that I think captured perfectly why so many people voted to leave, and it was made by the Honourable Member for Bournemouth West. He said, I think Brexit was a great cry from the heart and soul of the British people. Too many people in this country feel that the country and the economy are not working for them, and that the affairs of our nation are being organised around a London elite.
They look at the bankers being paid bonuses for their banks that their taxes help to rescue. They look at our embassies in the Gulf that are holding flat parties to sell off-plan exclusive London properties when they worry about how they will ever get onto the housing ladder. They worry that they may be the first generation who are not better off than their parents, and they want to see a system that spreads wealth and opportunity. Well, Mr Speaker, what he neglected to say, and what so many people opposite won't acknowledge, is that every single one of those problems was made in Britain. Yes. It is yeah, this place yeah. that is responsible for the gross inequality of the country, and it is the party opposite that has prosecuted the policies that have led a half a million children more living in poverty than when we left government nine years ago. It's the party opposite that has left four million working people living in poverty. It is the party opposite that has pursued punitive benefit policies that leads to people not just sleeping rough on the streets of our constituencies, but sleeping rough on the doorstep to the entrances to this palace, literally dying under our feet, Mr Speaker, and not a single bit of responsibility taken and not a single offer of hope. And, Mr Speaker, it is not just the most... I will give way. The Honourable Gentleman for giving way. During the Remain campaign, both the Honourable Gentleman and I were on the same side of the debate. I am sure he remembers then the right Honourable Leader of the Opposition not turning up to events, not willing to contribute to the overall UK Remain campaign, and not playing his part to keep the UK in the European Union. So I asked my Honourable Friend what is he going to do this time differently to get the right Honourable Gentleman to participate and take part in this debate. Mr Speaker, if, if I may say, this is not the afternoon for the Honourable Gentleman to lecture me about holding my leadership to account. This is an afternoon for him and every other member of the team to hold their rotten government to account for the policies that are making his constituents poorer and my constituents poorer. You know, we've heard a lot about the Leader of the Opposition this afternoon, Mr Speaker. If they think he is as terrible as they have said, maybe they can explain why it is that having confidently called the general election yeah. with the promise of a huge sweeping majority, yeah. so many Conservative members lost their seats. I will tell them why. Because when it comes to tackling the chronic housing crisis, the crisis in our schools, the crisis in the NHS, the crisis that hits people in their pockets, the Leader of the Opposition is more in touch with people in this country than the Prime Minister and the Tories opposite will ever be. That's the truth. I will give way once more. Indeed, for giving way. If, if that is the case, will, my, uh, will the right honourable member explain why so many of his uh, side, I think 173 MPs on, the, on, on, on your side, on, on the right honourable, on the honourable uh, gentleman's side, uh, refused to back him in his leadership? The to the Privy Council, and I trust his note of appreciation to the honourable member for the Isle of Wight will be the internal post today. We're treating. I may say it's been a long time coming. Yeah. And, and can I just say again, with some humility to the member opposite, this really is is not the afternoon for members opposite to talk about motions of no confidence because not only did more than half of their backbenchers declare no confidence in the Prime Minister and her leadership, this afternoon is about confidence in the government and he should be defending the government's record. Finally, Mr Speaker, it is not just about gross inequality and what is going on to the very poorest in our society. It is about the fact that the majority of people now, even those who believed nine years ago that we had to tighten the belt, that things would be difficult and there were difficult choices to be made and people accepted that and they voted uh, in the way that they thought best. Nine years on, it is now the experience of people who use and rely on our public services that things are demonstrably worse now than they were nine years ago. Our schools less well funded than they were when Labour left office, with per pupil funding down by 8% and teachers walking out of the profession in droves. Two and a half million more people waiting longer than four hours in accident and emergency departments and the number of people waiting more than two months for cancer treatment doubled. And unbelievably from a Conservative government, a situation where people in my constituency describe a state of lawlessness because they have cut the Metropolitan Police to the bone with more than a billion pounds worth of cuts in funding. 21,000 police officers lost, almost 7,000 PCSOs and 15,000 police staff. Officer numbers at their lowest levels for 30 years and the highest rises in crime in decade. It is no wonder, Mr Speaker, that this afternoon they don't want to stand up and defend the record 
record of this government. It is not a record that they are able to defend. But it is now right, in fact it is past time to acknowledge, that the government has lost control of Parliament, lost control of the ability to govern and have lost the confidence of the British people. It is time for members opposite to do the right thing and declare, as we will, no confidence in Her Majesty's yeah. Government. Yeah, double. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and it, it is a pleasure to follow the uh, Honourable Member from, uh, uh, for Ilford North. Um, it is well documented, Mr Speaker, that I have had my differences with the Prime Minister in recent weeks and months, um, and it uh, was with regret that I found I could not support her deal through uh, the lobbies uh, last night and, and had to vote against it. But I can uh, assure the House I will be voting against this uh, motion of no confidence uh, uh, this evening, because I want to see a Conservative Government con to continue to uh, be in office in this country. Um, the Prime Minister has many qualities, and those qualities have come to the fore in recent times. People across the country admire her resilience, her fortitude, her determination. And I would uh, join in, in saying that these qualities are great qualities that she has demonstrated. And I would, with respect, say that if she now takes those qualities and directs them towards the EU Commission, then she, her stock in this nation will, will rise dramatically, because the people of this country want to see our Prime Minister standing up to the EU and telling the EU what this country needs from these negotiations and I would encourage her to do that. There is no doubt that the Prime Minister has been given an incredibly challenging job. But that job has been made all the harder by the behaviour of some members of this House who have sought to undermine her negotiating position time and time again. Those calling for a second referendum have completely undermined her position by making the EU believe that we could have a second vote to, vote to overturn the decision and therefore making the deal unattractive in the hope that we would reject it. Those, call, those discounting no deal have undermined the, the Prime Prime Minister's position uh, in, in uh, uh, taking that off the table. Anyone in negotiations will say that no deal has to remain a position in any successful negotiation. And I find it very interesting that uh, the, the, the front bench of the Labour Party have said that they would rule out no deal on the basis that it would be damaging to the country. Now, I don't think no deal would be that damaging to the country. It would be a challenge. But do you know what the businesses in my community tell me time and time again? That the thing they really fear is not no deal Brexit, but it is a Labour government. That is the thing that they are far more afraid of. And so I would say to the front bench, if you have discounted no deal on the basis it would be damaging to businesses in our country, would you now please discount a Labour government on the same criteria? Because that is what businesses up and down this country are wanting uh, to us to stay in government to prevent the Labour government taking office. It is fair to say we are not where we want to be in these negotiations, but I absolutely back the Prime Minister in her position to say that we will continue to seek a, a, a consensus across this House to find a, a, a basis that we can renegotiate with the EU and uh, come up with a deal that we can deliver for this country. And therefore tonight I will absolutely be backing the Government. We need to deliver Brexit. We need to deliver the Brexit. We promised the country in our manifesto and then we need to move on to a domestic agenda to start delivering the changes that this country needs and is crying out for. Savile Roberts. It is an honour to follow the member for St Austell, Honourable Member for St Austell in UK, although I must admit I share none of his convictions, either in the qualities of the Prime Minister or in the virtues of a no deal. And, Mr Speaker, I, I, I thought something happened last night, and yet there has been too much point scoring, pantomime point scoring is continuing in this place. And last night I voted against the Brexit deal. And in doing so, I voted for the Prime Minister to change course. I voted for averting the damaging consequences of her deal. Now, it's now time to move on to a real solution to this Brexit mess. Parliament cannot come to an agreement on the way forward, so it's time for the people to decide on our European future. But one thing stands in the way. Labour has by now, at, li at last, at long last, satisfied one element of its conference policy and tabled a motion of no confidence. I will, of course, be supporting the motion of no confidence today. 
But if it fails to gain the support of the House tonight, the Labour Party must move on and satisfy <coughs> the next element of its com- conference motion. It must move on to adopting a people's vote as its membership demanded. Let me clear, be clear, Mr Speaker, as well as taking no deal off the table, we need to take no progress off the table too. Now, Plaid Cymru will reconsider its support if the Leader of the Opposition decides instead to embark upon an infinitely failing, hopeless series of motions of no confidence confidence tabled on a rolling basis, when there is is evident, and if there is evidence, that there is no hope of success, if those motions of no confidence have no chance of making a a critical difference. All that would do would be to achieve further parliamentary paralysis paralysis, which is something nobody, I think, in this place, in all honesty, wants to see, certainly nobody outside. Mr Speaker, with all this in mind, those of us who oppose the British Government's policy need to explain how to avoid a no-deal Brexit when there is seemingly no clear majority in normal binary voting systems that are the Convention in the House of Commons. Several honourable members have offered credible solutions as ways of breaking the impasse including my honourable friend, the member for Carmarthen East and Denevor. He has put forward a novel idea to ensure the House of Commons is able to reach a conclusion on a proposal. The answer could lie in the use of an alternative voting system. My party would always have a preference for a people's vote, and I believe believe in this method of voting, and, and with Labour's support, I believe it would be the most preferred option of Members of Parliament across the House of Commons. The House of Commons, and I will give way. Honourable Lady, if, that was, if the result in that referendum was again to leave, would she, would she be willing to re- respect the result the second time? And if the result was, 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 was to remain, would she be happy with those on the Leave side who call for a best of three? I, what I am proposing here is a means for this place to find its way out of the present impasse in which we find ourselves. At present, we may be talking about indicative votes, but there may well be other ways. Now, we find ourselves in an unprecedented situation. The procedures which we have used in this place in the past look unlikely to find us out of the impasse in which we find ourselves. What I am begging of this place is to look at creative means for us to be able to move ahead. I, for my own party, will be moving ahead with, 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 to propose, with part of that system which we may use, to propose a people's vote as the way ahead. But I will beg on all of us, because we have been criticised fairly outside of this place for not proposing ways forward. I would beg all of us that we do seek ways forward. I will not take any more time because I'm very much aware, as the member of a small party usually has very little time to speak, how valuable the time that we have is. So I will close with this. And I will say, the House of Commons has effectively taken control of Brexit pro- policy. It's defeated, of course, let us remember how this. This isn't just about a tick tat on both sides. Defeated the British Government's deeply deficient deal last night. Now, we must find a way to ensure a way of coming together for a conclusive decision in favour of a people's vote. Thank you very much indeed. Marcus Jones. Mr Speaker, uh, I rise uh, this afternoon uh, in support of the Government and uh, against uh, this motion that has been put before the House today. In doing that, I will talk about the record of this Government and I will talk about the issue that has triggered today's vote, which is the Brexit vote we had yesterday. Just to put our record in context, everything that the Conservatives have done in government since 2010 have had to be framed in the context of the recession, the massive deficit and mess left behind by the Labour Party. And despite the mess that was left behind, the 6% drop in GDP, the 800,000 more people unemployed. Under this Conservative Party, 3.4 million 
jobs have been created. We have record employment, record unemployment. We've provided 15 hours free childcare for disadvantaged two-year-olds, 30 hours free childcare for working parents, the national living wage. We've cut income tax so that people now can earn double what they could nearly under the Labour Party before they pay income tax. We've not increased fuel duty for eight years. We have now a situation where many more of our children are coming out of primary school with a far higher standard of reading and writing than was the case before. We have more doctors and nurses in our hospitals. We have fewer infections and people dying because of those in our hospitals. And we are putting £20 billion into the NHS and a 10-year plan for the NHS where we are putting significantly more money into mental health provision. Under the Labour Party, in my constituency, they try to close A&E and maternity, so they have not got the record that they state or think they have. And when you look at the situation, have we got anything right? No, we haven't got everything right in government. There is still a lot more to do. We need to make sure that we build on the money that we are now putting in, the extra resources we are now putting into the police force. We need to make sure we honour the commitment to halve and end rough sleeping. We need to make sure that we keep refining and get universal credit right, because it is the right thing to do to have a system that gets people into work. When we look at the alternative, the alternative is more debt, more borrowing, and a leadership team that does not believe in this country and thinks more about other countries than they do of their own. Now, we're here because of the Brexit debate, and members opposite have done nothing today but talk about red lines. Whether you like what the Prime Minister put on the table yesterday or not, the red lines that she put down were based solely on the referendum that was, that was voted on by the British public, and it was solely on manifestos that about 85% of the public voted for. And she has tried her best, despite problems across this House and people driving their own agenda. She has tried her best to get a deal that the House agree with. Clearly it does not. But what I would say to members opposite is that this House voted to give a referendum. The public voted for Brexit. We must deliver on that. People do not want a general election. They want us now to get on with the job come out of the European Union and come together as a House to do that in a sensible way. They don't want a general election. They don't believe the Leader of the Opposition is a Prime Minister in waiting. They don't believe he can be a Prime Minister. I am against this motion and I will be proud to go through the lobby and back this Government tonight. Or a Pidcock. Much, Mr. Speaker. If ever there were an advert for why we need a general election and why we have no confidence in this government, it has been the speeches opposite today. They are so devoid from reality. Watching this crisis unfold, I have often been struck how the process is viewed by the people we represent. Yeah, people yeah. in North West Durham and beyond voted leave and remain for a number of re- reasons. Feelings of being left behind by the establishment of seeing their security dwindle communities being abandoned, they were worried their rights were going to erode, uh, that their businesses were closed. Some wanted to take back control, some wanted to be part of something bigger. All complex, individual reasons, but very few of them have been satisfied by the way in this, in this government has represented them in the negotiations with the EU. Instead, we are entangled up in the tensions between two factions of the Conservative Party, the hard right and the centre right, and the arbitrary red lines of the government and we are in a shameful state but it goes further than this this government can now not govern not just on our withdrawal from the EU and that's not just a slogan it generally reflects the position that we are in where are we at as a country in the North East and in North West Durham in fact in all of our communities people are suffering their pay does not cover the bills the shambolic universal credit system makes them poorer 
stigmatised and stressed. And after eight years of austerity, this country is on its knees. An increasing number of people are homeless, many are destitute, and some, as has been mentioned by the fantastic contributions, are even dying in this system. Do, do, do teachers in this country have confidence in the government? Do nurses, doctors, firefighters, prison officers, those in private business waiting for a deal, those waiting for the brown envelopes from the DWP to say whether they have been sanctioned or not, those deemed fit for work who are ill, those who are homeless, the 1950s women, do they have confidence yeah, yeah, in this yeah, government? Yeah, yeah. And I West think Edges. not, because the reality is out there. And you know what? I hope it pricks the conscience of the 100 plus Conservative MPs who decided that the Prime Minister was not fit to lead them just a few weeks ago, or similar numbers yeah, yeah, who yeah. agreed with us that the Brexit deal was a farce. Will you stand up as well for all of those people who are suffering? The speeches on the opposite side have been desperate. They are desperate to denigrate the Labour Party because they are scared of the powerful arguments of the Leader of the Opposition. And when members go through that lobby tonight to say that you have confidence in this Government, you are voting, sorry, they are voting for more chaos, more austerity. The members will be stepping over all of the children who do not have food in their bellies when they go to schools, stepping over the pensioners who can't afford to heat their homes and stepping over the homeless people on their streets. It means you could not care less about them. This country, our communities, working people deserve so much better. We deserve a different direction and fast. We need a general election and get this lot out now. Chris Phil. In moving this motion of no confidence earlier today, the Leader of the Opposition claimed this was about delivering Brexit. But this Parliament, elected in 2017, was elected to perform that task. And both main parties, Labour and Conservative alike, stood on a manifesto of respecting the referendum result. And between the two of us, we got 82% of the vote. It's our responsibility now, together, each and every one of us, to find a way of making Brexit work for our country. And by claiming the only way to do that is by holding yet another general election, is an abdication of the individual responsibility that each and every one of us took upon our shoulders by standing as candidates in the 2017 general election. But the particular mendacity of the Leader of the Opposition in moving this motion by claiming it would give him, if he won a general election, a mandate, is that he has absolutely no policy on Brexit at all. And given he has no policy, he couldn't possibly have any mandate to do anything were he to win a general election in the first place. He goes about the country in the north saying that he's in favour of Brexit. He says to remain leaning constituencies in London and the south, he gives them the impression he's uh, in favour of remaining. And he would collapse in a general election campaign under the weight of his own contradictions. He was asked time and time again last night and over the weekend, he was asked by uh, a member of the SNP earlier to articulate his policy on Brexit, and he could not do so. He couldn't do so because he has no policy. It's up to all of us to pull together and work out a way of delivering Brexit sensibly. Obviously, he has policies. I think he has 13 policies on Brexit, not none. But thank you so much. Oh. Well, I'm grateful to the member for the Isle of Wight for, um, for, cla- for clarifying that multiplicity of policies, which the Leader of the Opposition adopts at different times when he finds it convenient to do so. Um, but I would also say to the Government that they should listen after the vote last night. Clearly, it was, uh, the margin of defeat was not a small one. And if there's one thing it strikes me that needs to be changed in order to give this proposal a chance of passing. It is obviously the backstop. And my my request or my advice to the Government is that we do need to speak to the European Union about introducing legally binding changes uh, to that backstop in order to render the withdrawal agreement acceptable to this House. And I would just ask the Government to speak to the European Union in the coming days on that topic. We've also heard a great deal uh, from members opposite about the Government's record more generally, in particular from uh, the member for Ilford North and the last Speaker as well. I am proud to defend this Government's record over the last 
nine years, I heard education mentioned. And it was, of course, the Right Honourable Member for Surrey Heath, who I see in his place, who, as Education Secretary, introduced reforms. Absolutely. Introduced reforms, which now mean that more children, more children than ever before, are attending good and outstanding schools. That isn't my judgment. It's not the government's judgment. It's the judgment of Ofsted, and it's the quality, and it's the quality of education our children receive. That really, that really matters. I will again in a moment. Now, I heard the NHS mentioned as well, of course, a vital institution that we all cherish. And contrary to the threats made or the uh, dire warnings issued at various general elections about how the NHS is unsafe in Conservative hands, we've heard announced just a few weeks ago the biggest ever increase in funding for the NHS, £23 billion a year in real terms. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in Croydon already, with a brand new accident in emergency just opened at Croydon University Hospital, which I visited just last Friday, twice the size of the old one, a fantastic facility funded by the Department for Health and by this Government. And when it comes to poverty and inequality, members opposite will be aware that absolute poverty has gone down. They will be aware that income inequality has never been lower. They will be aware that the way you combat poverty is by creating employment, and employment is at a record level as well. And finally, Mr Speaker, I am proud proud that it is a Conservative government which has increased the minimum wage by 38% since since 2010. 38%. That is significantly higher than the rate of inflation and goes to show this government is on the side of working people on low incomes, and I will be proud to support it in the division lobbies this evening. Absolutely. John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow what I will say was a textbook speech from the <laughs> member, uh, from the honourable member opposite. I, I have to say that I agreed with a great deal of what the leader of the opposition said in his opening speech, and certainly with many of the passionate contributions from my noble friends on this side. The last eight years of Conservative or Conservative led government, ha- Conservative-led government have indeed put great strain on communities like ours. The very fabric which is holding our public services together, the voluntary sector, has been stretched, and that has had an intolerable impact on many, many people's lives because of wrong decisions that were made by this government over these recent years. We have to get justice for the Waspy women. We have to put schools and hospitals on a better footing. And my goodness, in my constituency, you've got to sort out our train system, which is even at the worst end of what Northern Rail has been inflicting on passengers. And we are now indeed in a dire situation after the monumental defeat of yesterday. This country is in a national emergency. But what, Mr Speaker... I'm afraid to say, makes this almost uniquely serious a situation for the country, (coughs) is that this cannot be a motion of no confidence in a vacuum. This is a general election that would give the public a choice between a government that is struggling to govern and a leader of the opposition and shadow chancellor who... I am afraid to say I have not changed my view that they are simply not fit to hold high office. The public, Mr Speaker, deserve so much better than this choice in the broken political system that they are are being given. They deserve leadership to right the terrible injustices that have been inflicted on our communities. They deserve leadership to lead the public out of this Brexit mess, and and they deserve a government and leadership that they can trust to keep them secure. Aside from the the leader of the opposition's past positions, of which there has been much discussion today, let's focus just for a moment on the nuclear deterrent, an issue, of course, central to my constituency, which I have spent 
many years as an opposition MP working with the Honourable Member for Gedlin, the Shadow Defence Secretary, to maintain the Labour Party's policy on the face of it being sensible. But I have to ask my colleagues, do we really think that in, with the, the crisis of spending which any future Labour government is going to, uh, is going to inherit, do we really think that the, we would maintain a policy that will spend many billions of pounds on a, a future submarine system which the Leader of the Opposition will have rendered useless on day one by saying he would never ever use the deterrent? It is just not a serious proposition, Mr Speaker. So, with a heavy heart, I have to tell the House that I cannot support the no confidence motion tonight. And some of my friends mutter disgrace. I hear some of them tutting. I have to say that many of them have privately said, thank, let's, thank God that you have got the freedom to actually not support this, because they are wrestling with their consciences of wanting desperately a Labour government, but knowing that the leader of their party is as unfit to lead the country as he was when they voted against him in the no-confidence motion of the, of the party those years ago. Now, the Prime Minister... Yes, I'll give way. Gentlemen, for, for, for giving way, um, and I can understand his dilemma. But what does he think the effect would be in his area? if we were to abandon the nuclear programme that this country uh, has, has pursued for decades. And the Honourable the, the, the economy of Baron Furness, we are a shipyard town, it is woven into our history. There are nine, more than 9,000 people employed directly in my constituency now, many, many more dependent on this, and it is a chance that, unfortunately, they cannot afford to take with the Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister has to reach out more than she has done in the chamber today. She has to unshackle herself from the hardline Brexiteers who have led her down the wrong path. But I will commit every day to give my constituents, to try to give them the best chance of better leadership for this country. And while we are in this impasse, I will do my very best to deliver for them. I have been pleased to work with the Government to unlock the Marina project, which is absolutely vital to the future of our local economy. I am working with them constructively on the submarine programme, which is bringing great prosperity into the area. Much more, much more is needed, but I will go on doing that, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is an enormous honour to follow a speech as brave as the one that has just been given by the Honourable Gentleman. And I have completely mentally ripped up what I was going to say and will say something I, I hope in response. I have enormous respect for the Honourable Gentleman and always have done. And I would like to say that members across this House as a whole work extremely hard to represent their constituencies as they see fit. I have been in, very impressed since I got here by the hard work and dedication of Labour members. I have enjoyed the cross-party working in which I have been involved, most particularly in the justice sphere, where the Justice Select Committee yeah, 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 yeah. has made real change to people's lives, and also in the area of um, early pregnancy loss and baby loss. We have worked cross-party and made real differences. And I hope that my remarks this afternoon will be taken in that context. I am not going to speak up for the deal, and I am not going to speak up for the PM, though I do strongly support both. I am, unusually for me, going to talk about personalities, as the Honourable Gentleman did. The, the Right Honourable Member for Islington North has been an anti-war and anti-nuclear campaigner all his life, as far as I know. He would prefer to live in a republic. He supports Hamas and the IRA and various other unfashionable organisations around the world. He has voted against his whip more often than any other Labour member. He has been monitored for, by MI5 for 30 years and by Special Branch for 20 years. For decades, because they are worried that he will undermine parliamentary democracy. He describes Karl Marx as a great economist, and the Prime Minister, who is never one to attack personally, mentioned his remarks um, following the Scripples attack in her own speech. 
I think what we do need to focus on is his position on Europe. He opposed um, joining the European Community in 1975. He opposed Maastricht and Lisbon. He wants to be free of EU rules on state aid and industry. The Honourable Gentleman for Hayes and Harlington, who supports him in this place, the chap who, who threw the little red book on the table in the first budget for which I was an MP, the, the, the gentleman who thinks that the Honourable Member for Tatton should be lynched and he wanted to assassinate Mrs Thatcher, he says that he would only back a second referendum if the option to remain were not present. This is not acceptable, Mr Speaker. We need some clarity from the opposition at this important national point. We need to know what the policy is. I was a civil servant, as you know, Mr Speaker. I find it very easy to work cross-party. Um, but not with this leadership, like the honourable gentleman who spoke before me. It was clear to me I joined the civil service in 1997. One of the reasons I became a Conservative MP is because I saw that the quality of decision making improved in 2010 under the coalition government. But that doesn't mean that there isn't good on the opposition benches, and we need to harness that. However, in agreement with the honourable gentleman, I don't think anybody can have confidence in the current Labour leadership. And for those reasons alone, and for all the many good reasons mentioned by my colleagues, I have complete confidence in this government. Harry Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And since we appear to be in a political twilight zone in this place, I feel the need to say a few home truths. I have never had confidence in this government whatsoever, whether that be Brexit, whether that be Social Security, whether that be immigration and whether that be pensions. I have no confidence in them and I can't believe that anyone does have confidence. I have no confidence in the Prime Minister because this is a Prime Minister who knew what the outcome of this vote on her deal would be, so much so that she delayed it and then came back and acted like it was a surprise that it failed. <laughs> All that happened is she wasted a month, yep, yep, and she yep. did this in the full knowledge that time is running out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, regrettably, I actually have to say the same about the Leader of the Opposition, and I do say this uh, sincerely. I, I can't get my head around how the, honourable member, the right honourable member has delayed calling for a vote of no confidence. He delayed it. In the initial farce, he failed to support the vote of no confidence from SNP and other parties. And I find myself asking, being left asking the same question, what good did it do? Because all that's happened is this lot have had another month in power. And I find myself questioning his logic of going, wait, I'm waiting for the, the perfect moment, the opportune moment, yeah. because yeah. I think we'll yeah. find at the end of this debate that that moment has actually it's passed. Yeah. Now, I sincerely hope that the right honourable member, of the, the right honourable member and leader of the opposition, will eventually come clean about whether he thinks this should be taken back to the people or not, because this deadlock evasiveness cannot last. It cannot continue. People deserve better. And to be honest, we all deserve a better opposition. The only thing that I have any confidence in, quite frankly, Mr Speaker, is the people of Scotland. Yes. The wealth of talent, the wealth of intellect, the wealth of compassion that we have to offer the world. And I have no doubt that people in Scotland will be watching this entire farce back home and finding themselves reaching the conclusion that the only thing they can have confidence in is the ability of our country to look after ourselves a damn sight better than this place ever has. Yeah. And if the government and the Prime Minister is truly meaning that she wants to reach out and cross party support, then a good start would be listening to the will of the second largest nation in this United Kingdom and giving us the respect that we are due. Yeah. Yeah. David Ducate. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm delighted to follow the Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrewshire South. It's, it's great to see her in her place. Uh, might I say that, Mr. Speaker, you were absolutely right uh, earlier to point out the exuberance on these benches earlier on during the speech by the Right Honourable Member for Roskai and Lochaber. And I'm sure you'll understand the, 
the, the passion and the frustration that we feel sometimes when we hear the honourable members and right honourable members opposite talking about the voice of Scotland and Scottish voices. Mr Speaker, I am proud to be part of a 1,200 per cent increase in Scottish seats represented on these, this side of the House in the government hey. benches. Let there be no doubt I shall be voting tonight to support the Prime Minister and her government, and I welcome the opportunity to do so. It is clear that a third general election in the space of less than four years would not be in the national interest, especially at such a crucial time for the future of our country. And the, truth that an elect- the truth is that an election would not solve anything. It would not give us certainty, it would not change the EU and their negotiating positions, and it would not change the choices before us. It would only be a rec- recipe for delay and division. People across the country can see what is going on here. Politicians on the benches opposite seeking to exploit the issues of historic importance currently facing this country for party political advantage. The people in this country will have none of it. I will have none of it. And this House should have none of it. When I vote tonight, I will be voting as a unionist to support a government that has been resolutely committed to protecting our precious union. This Prime Minister and this government have stood up for the interests of the majority of Scots who voted to keep the United Kingdom together in 2014 and who still do not want another independence referendum. A majority of Scots, by the way, a similar percentage, about 56 per cent, voted for parties committed to Brexit in the 2017 general election. Over the last 19 months, this government has consistently stood up to the grandstanding and grievance mongering of the SNP and does not speak, who does not speak for the, the whole of Scotland, as they would have us believe. Hey, hey. And in Northern Ireland, the Prime Minister has, throughout this process, worked tirelessly to ensure that Northern Ireland remains a stable part of the United Kingdom. And I was glad to hear the right honourable member for Belfast North express his support for, uh, for, this, for the government in this motion. The contrast between the heartfelt and committed unionism of this government and the hopeless pandering of the Labour Party could not be clearer. We all know about the leader of the opposition's thoughts on Northern Ireland, but more and more Scottish unionists are now coming to recognise that they can no longer trust Labour to stand up for Scotland's place in the United Kingdom. As recently as September, the leader of the opposition equivocated on the possibility of doing a deal with the SNP and allowing Nicola Sturgeon to impose Indiref 2 on the Scottish people. I remind my English, Welsh and Northern Irish colleagues that this is not a specifically Scottish issue. It is all of our United Kingdom that the SNP wish to break apart. Time and time again, here and in Holyrood, Scottish Labour have sided with the SNP's attempts to use Brexit to undermine the Union. Only this government, a Conservative government led by this Prime Minister, has a, tra- has a track record to be trusted on protecting our Union. And that, foremost in my mind, al- among eight and a half years of Conservative achievements in government, is why I shall be supporting the government tonight. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, just before I, I do pick the right honourable lady's pardon, I should have announced that the right honourable lady is the last speaker to be subject to the four-minute limit, and then a three-minute limit has to be introduced. As I'm seeking to accommodate as many colleagues as I can, and so the honourable gentleman from Dudley will be subject to the three-minute limit. And fluid. The speaker, I'm going to read a letter from a constituent, which I had uh, this morning by email. A real person. Dear Anne Cluid, I am your constituent and I am deeply concerned at what Brexit uncertainty is already doing to our country. No form of Brexit commands a majority among politicians. There is only one sensible road left to pursue, and that is to take the decision back to the voters and let us decide. Parliament is deadlocked. The Government's version of Brexit has failed and been rejected by Parliament. Two years of uncertainty, divisive argument and no clear solutions to the country's biggest problems has got us nowhere. Best for Britain's new research, carried out in partnership with Hope Not Hate, proves 60% of people now want the final say on Brexit. Every region now supports letting the people decide. I have included the regional results below. I would appreciate it if you would reply to this message to tell me, do you support giving the people the final say on the Brexit deal with the option to stay in the EU? Please understand the strength of my feeling on this issue. There is no majority in Parliament for any form of Brexit. While Parliament is in deadlock, the country is uniting around a referendum to resolve it. Please give us the final say. 
and he lists the support for a public vote on Brexit by region and country. East of England, 56%. East Midlands, 56.8%. London, 67.6%. North East, 59.8%. North West, 61.2%. South East, 57.8%. South West, 55.1%. West Midlands, 57.9%. Yorkshire and Humber, 58.9. Scotland, 67.7. Wales, 60.30. Yours sincerely, David Matthews, Kilvanith, Wales. My answer to him is, I support a referendum and I want to stay in the European Union. I'm Mike Wood. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. This House can have confidence in this Government because it's taken this country from the brink of bankruptcy to being a successful and growing economy that's creating prosperity and better opportunities for people in every part of this country. It recognises the hopes, the aspirations of hard-working people, people who work hard and want their children to have better chances than they had. This Government's giving children the best possible start in life, doubling free childcare for three- and four-year-olds. And next year will be more record spending on early years education. The reforms uh, that were originally made by the current Environment Secretary in the face of hostile opposition are now delivering improved standards in our schools. From a record low of 19th in international comparators for reading under the last Labour Government, risen to eighth under this one. I know the opposition don't like the uh, figures for children in good and outstanding schools, but the fact remains that under the last Labour government in 2010, 66% of children taught in good or outstanding schools, now risen to 87%. Yes, that's 87% of a bigger number, of course it is. It's even better. And that's that's despite despite the well-recorded increase in difficulty in those inspections. For people... Thank you so much. I, I do appreciate it. I know we are short of time. But would you agree that there are more children in good and outstanding schools <coughs> because there are more children? And do, do, and do his figures include the poorest children? Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 he, I hesitate to, uh, to explain basic mathematics, but, but 87%... An increase from 66% to 87% of a bigger number is even more of of an increase. And when people people are looking for work, they're now more likely to have a a job, with 1,000 new jobs on average for every day since this government came to power in 2010, four-fifths of them full-time. And those jobs are more likely to be paid more thanks to the introduction of the national living wage, increases in the national minimum wage, and at the end of all that, people are are allowed to keep more of the money that they work so very hard to earn. Whilst Labour doubles the starting tax rate for the lowest paid workers, it's this Government that has taken five million low paid workers out of paying income tax altogether. And for people looking for their first home, house building had absolutely collapsed ahead of 2010 as a result of the recession. But now house building is higher than in 29 out of the last 30 years. This government recognises the aspiration that people have to own their own home. But it also recognises the need for good social and private rented housing as well. So whilst it's the opposition who are dogmatically opposed to letting people buy the houses they live in, this government is supporting first-time buyers, but also lifting the cap on the HRA borrowing to allow for more council-built social housing. And at every stage in life, spending on the NHS will be £20 billion higher at the end of this five-year period than at the start. That's on top of the 15,000 extra doctors, nearly 13,000 more nurses in our hospitals compared to compared to 2010. 
Hard-working families deserve better than the paleo marxist Citizen Smith Tribute Act that's offered by the opposition front bench. For economic security, greater opportunity, sustain- sustainable investment in our public services. These and many other reasons. But point of order. Point of order, George Howe. If you could help me, is the term pillar considered on parliamentary? <laughs> I don't think that word was used. I think the word was paleo. I think, I think the word was paleo, if I understood correctly. That is rather unfair that the point of order came when it did. And the Honourable Gentleman should certainly have ten, ten seconds to finish his speech. Economic security, greater opportunity and sustainable investment yeah, yeah, yeah. in our public services. These and many other reasons are why Dudley South and this House can have confidence in Her Majesty's Government this evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Reynolds, paleo. I say I have no confidence in... Her Majesty's Government. And in doing so, I'm not going to address the domestic record of this government. I wish I had time, because this has been a government of hunger and homelessness, and that's a record that needs revealing. But clearly, in three minutes, that isn't possible. But what I do want to say is this. The reason the government genuinely deserved to lose this vote today is because there's only one reason for this government's existence. There's only one reason why the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister, and that's Brexit. The job of this government was to deliver Brexit. After the referendum, the majority of MPs accepted the result and wanted to work pragmatically on a deal to secure the best terms of our new relationship. We didn't do so lightly. Don't forget the referendum was only called to try and solve some internal problems in the Conservative Party. David Cameron expected another hung parliament. He thought the Liberals would be in coalition with him again and he could drop the idea entirely and he got it wrong. And as a result, we all got the most divisive politics this country has had in the modern era. We all got the denigration of expertise, of reason, becoming the new normal. All of us saw our friend murdered in that campaign. And yet, despite that, there was no doubt that this House had, and still does have, a cross-party majority for a Brexit deal. But how did the Prime Minister respond to that? Did she reach out across party lines? No. Did she seek to unite Leavers and Remainers? No. Did she provide leadership on the big questions? Absolutely not. Instead, we had it played from the beginning for narrow party advantage. Reasonable concerns about how customs would work, how the banking system would function, the rights of EU citizens, even what queue at passport control EU citizens would use, were first dismissed and then quite cynically and falsely were presented as opposition to Brexit itself. And when an election was called, despite the Prime Minister giving her word, Downing Street briefed it as a chance to crush the saboteurs. Well, how ironic that the biggest saboteur of all to the deal has turned out to be the Prime Minister herself. And it is her deal which has been crushed. But on that point on leadership of the big issues, now we all appreciate the Conservative Party is irrevocably split on this issue and a decision on the final destination risks losing one half entirely. We appreciate that. But the answer to that is to reach out. It is to go for a conversation with all of the House of Commons. Instead of that, we got the member for Uxbridge appointed Foreign Secretary, travelling around Europe insulting our friends. We got the nationalistic rhetoric of the citizens of nowhere speech. We got the idea at Conservative Conference, let's list foreign workers as if we're living in 1930s Germany. We had the Chancellor threatening our friends and allies with economic warfare like the UK was some overgrown school bully, all of which has squandered centuries and centuries of goodwill and landed us where we were. It is this Prime Minister, this Government, these red lines, this strategy that are to blame for bringing this country to the abyss. They have nothing left to offer and in the national interest they should go. Antoinette Sandbach. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, it was a pleasure to follow the member for Staley, Bridge and Hyde, although I couldn't disagree more with him, with his characterisation of him. I remember a Labour Prime Minister that promised uh, this country a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, and his, virtually his last act in government was to sign it and renege on that promise to the British people. And I feel that the resentment after years of broken Labour promises in relation to referendums has been a large, uh, uh, has, uh, bears a large part of the blame in the outcome of the referendum vote, not to mention the absolutely miserable way in which the Leader of the Opposition failed to campaign or make a proper case for remaining in the EU during the referendum debate. So I will take no lectures uh, from the party opposite. And when he talks about reaching out, there is no explanation as to why, um, how the Labour policy will get over the line in terms of state aid. 
because they say that they want a customs union, but they don't want to accept uh, rules on state aid. They say they want a customs union and can negotiate a better deal, but don't want to accept the rules on free movement. And the reality of the Labour Party position is that it would fail its own six tests. Yeah. Now, exactly. I am someone who, in this House, has shown a willingness to work across party yeah. to get a decent and sensible Brexit result, despite the fact that I personally believe that the best deal that we have is remaining in the EU. I made a promise to try and implement the referendum result, but I do not see that there have been any constructive proposals from the front bench on the other side. And, and the reason why I have confidence in this government, and I do, is because although the press has taken over, is taken over by Brexit, we have been getting on with the job in this country. We have been delivering in so many other ways. 39,000 people, workers in my constituency, have been taken out of tax because of this government's proposals. And I remember Gordon Brown introducing a 10p tax rate on those earning just over £4,500. £4,500, and they had the lowest paid had to pay tax. Exactly. Now, a low-paid worker in my constituency will not pay tax until they are earning at least £12,500. That is one of many achievements that this government has made. Look at the new benefit that we have introduced in terms of paid parental leave. It is one of the first new benefits that we have introduced for many years. Two weeks paid parental leave for parents. That is a significant achievement. We are seeing uh, very good environmental policies coming out of DEFRA. There is a good record to be proud of. Thank you. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the member for Edinburgh. The unsettled mood that we feel here in the chamber today, and in fact the unsettled mood that we feel across the whole of Parliament, is reflected across the whole of our society. There is a feeling when you go out there into the communities and a desire for change, a desire for something else. Now, this feeling and desire for change manifests itself in different ways, but we would be wrong to ignore it and to underestimate the significance of it. It manifests itself in the anger that is felt in our communities, including the increased hate that all of us across the House are receiving, and it manifests itself in the despair and the disassociation of democracy and the lack of faith in anybody probably standing here in Parliament today. So this moment is a pivotal moment, and it is more than I will say about whether you think we should have a Labour government or Conservative government, though of course the answer is Labour. Yeah, it's yeah. more about how do we give back our trust and faith to ordinary people, because this feeling and this mood for change is not going to go away, because people are exhausted. They're exhausted by austerity. I don't think anybody in this House appreciates quite how draining poverty is, how the daily grind can get you down. And if nothing else, I would like every member here to reflect just on this statistic, even if you ignore every other word I say, that across Yorkshire there has been a 30% increase in the number of suicides. My constituency covers the Humber Bridge, and I've mentioned this before, that the Humber Bridge has become a hotspot for suicides, people driving from around the country to come there and take their own lives. What greater damning indictment of this government can there be that they have left people in such a state of despair, a feeling that they have no future whatsoever? And what answers are they being offered but nothing? More arguments opposite, more people tearing into each other opposite, where the people in our community continue to suffer. They suffer when they go to the NHS. And, the, and this, sorry, the nonsense about all these better, good and outstanding schools. And with respect, I suggest that the minister goes and actually checks, uh, sorry, the member goes and actually checks when the last time these schools were inspected. And that might give him a more accurate yeah, figure yeah. if he's going to start spouting that out at us. Crime is increasing and people are feeling unsafe in their homes. The antisocial behaviour that so many people here probably ignore because the gates to their properties allow them to cannot be ignored by the people in our communities. They're feeling unsafe in their homes. We have a moment now to really make a difference. It is in our gift to give people that change that they need. 
We can channel that change for need into a vision that is positive and a vision for hope, yeah, yeah. but only if we vote down this government yeah, and bring yeah, a Labour yeah. government that will truly deliver for everybody in our country. Yeah. 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 Even though I, I do respect the uh, comments made by the Honourable Lady from my, uh, Yes. Case upon Hull and Hessel. I am concerned that she sees everything in a very different light to I am much more mm. optimistic mm. about our future. Yeah, yeah. But I think the motion before us today may seem very simplistic, and yet it raises points that go much, much further. We really are in the midst of a battle for the heart and soul of our country and all those things we hold very dear. The decisions we take in this place today and over the coming weeks will really irreversibly change the course of our history. They will shape Britain's standing in the world for a generation, and in the process will perhaps determine the very future of this Parliament, the mother of all Parliaments, which has served our nation through war and peace for the best part of thousands of years. On the central question of Europe, which has led us to this position today, I make the following points. Like the long-time Brexiteers, I am fully committed to ensuring that the UK can end its membership of the European Union on the 29th of March at 11pm, as set down in law. Nothing less than an agreement which ends the free movement of people, in addition to returning full control over our money and our laws, is acceptable, either to myself or to the majority of the people of Arawash who voted to leave, to remain, to leave, voted to leave in the referendum in June 2016. My message for the Remainers is I voted to remain in the European Union, but we lost that argument and consequently the UK will be leaving the EU. Europe may have brought us to this point, but that does not detract from the fact that the single biggest threat to the safety, security and prosperity of our country is sat on the benches opposite. The choice before us today is very clear. A socialist government who, within hours of being returned to office, would cause a run on the pound. And those aren't my words, they're the words of the Shadow Chancellor. That's true. That's true. A socialist government that would drive investment out of Britain through its ideological pursuit of a nationalisation. And a socialist government whose own backbenchers advocate the confiscation of council houses bought under the right to buy scheme. A socialist government that would make my constituents poorer in every sense of the word. And I can't let that happen to my constituents of Erewash. I cannot countenance such outcomes, and the government has my full support and full confidence today and in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Geraint Davis. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Margaret Thatcher famously quoted Attlee in saying that referenda were the instruments of demagogues and dictators because Hitler used them to adopt supreme power uh, and to basically invade other countries after rearming. So my view for no confidence to the Prime Minister isn't simply because she's doubled the debt, created poverty and social injustice, but basically that she's given, she, she thinks the advisory referendum is an unconditional mandate to, to Brexit under any costs and any circumstances without consulting with the people on, on whether this represents their reasonable expectations. The people were offered more money, more trade, uh, control over their laws, control over migration. But in fact, they haven't got any of those things. We'll have to pay £39 billion. There'll be a squeezing of the economy. There'll be less jobs. There'll be less trade. We won't be with Team EU in terms of negotiating with big players like China. Uh, Northern Ireland will be an open border for immigration via Dublin. We won't control our immigration. And in any case, if we did, we'd just switch uh, a, a, culturally, uh, a, a cultural neighbour to more distant immigration in any case. There's no evidence that the people of Britain support the deal. It's a betrayal of conservatism because we move away from the most established market in the world and break up the union, a betrayal of socialism because we basically have a smaller cake to divide more equally. It's bad for our economy, our security, uh, our environment uh, and our common values. So it's my view that I have no confidence in the Prime Minister because she has no confidence in the people to make a judgment on the deal she's delivered. If they want it, let's go ahead. But otherwise, unless we don't have that vote, we'll just wait another two years in the transition period when we could, in fact, have a vote on this, decide on reflection. It's better for all of us to remain, and we can have two years sorting out this country rather than uh, 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 having this uh, situation where we're just talking about Brexit and 
Britain is burning around us. Yes, there will be some anger if we have a people's vote, but I put this to you, that there will be absolute rage if we don't and Brexit goes forward. People voted to leave. They didn't vote to leave their jobs. And Brexit, which is now being seen uh, warts and all, and we're also seeing the fact that, um, that Europe is a much more virtuous place than before. There was a massive defeat uh, <laughs> last night. Yes, uh, the Prime Minister looks, need to look cross-party at all the options. If we can't agree any deal, let's put the deal we've got to the people uh, and they can decide whether to continue. In the meantime, I'm calling for a general election, but if we don't get a general election, we should have a people's vote. The Labour Party should stand up for Remain, and when we win that, there should be an election because we'll have a government which was elected on strong, stable Brexit, will be weak and stable. Stable and remain, and then we will deliver a Labour government and a better Britain. Spurghart. Um, um, you know, obviously, I'm not terribly delighted that we're having a vote of confidence in the uh, in the Conservative government, but uh, I suppose I might thank the opposition for uh, for bringing my party back together today, uh, because uh, I, whilst uh, whilst we were heavily divided last night. I can be confident that we are all going to go through the same lobby together and it will be a bonding experience. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for doing that for us. Um, it's, uh, it's quite right, of course, that we are having a vote of no confidence. Um, we find ourselves in a peculiar hung parliament in which, as the Leader of the Opposition said, you know, the Government suffered a major defeat last night, suffered a defeat on a money bill. It's quite right that the confidence of the House is tested. But we are all quite aware of what is going to happen. The Government is going to win this vote this evening, and then we are going to have to move on. The most interesting question is not about this vote, which is a foregone conclusion. It is about what is going to happen after that. Uh, We know what the Prime Minister is going to do. She has offered to reach out and speak to other corners uh, of the Commons and look for some consensus. But what we still do not know is what the Opposition is asking for. Uh, uh, The fact that we have been put on the spot for a vote of no confidence when the opposition hasn't said what it would take to the public in the event of a general election is quite frankly shameful. I mean, it reminds me very much of how the 19, in 1997 the Labour Party managed to breeze into power without telling the public, well, yes, they won by a convincing majority, but they didn't tell the public in advance what their policy was on the single, on the single European currency. It had to be wrung out of them when they were already in power. So the Labour Party has a track record on this. If the Labour Party wants to go to the country, as it does, then it at least should have the courtesy to tell the public what it is going to take into that vote. But let's imagine that it, and so let's imagine that it did go through tonight. Let's imagine record debt. Is what we would have. A thousand billion pounds of extra debt, thirty-five thousand pounds extra for everyone who lives in this country. That is what the Honourable Ladies Party is offering this country. That is what the Honourable Ladies Party is offering my voters out there and my taxpaying constituents. Very happy to give way and take the time. The Honourable Gentleman, perhaps because he is rather younger than me, seems to have forgotten that when the Labour Party took office, waiting lists in the NHS were 18 months for some specialities. Under the, under the Labour government, there were practically no waiting lists for some specialities, and that is a record we are all proud of. And when the Honourable Ladies' Party left power, we had record debt, a crashed economy, a loss of confidence in our... A loss of confidence in our foreign policy after a disastrous Iraq war. That party ran this country into the ground. And eight years later, we have, uh, we have record employment. We have rising wages. We have everything that a sensible, evenly-minded, well-balanced economy has brought. Uh, mature... Order, order. Oh dear, a very unseemly atmosphere, but the Honourable Gentleman is at least still smiling, and that is to be welcomed. Let's, order, order. Let's hear the Honourable. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. You know, uh, you know, the truth is uh, that the Labour Party left power under an enormous cloud. Everybody knows it. They left after a disastrous 13 years in office, which had seen the economy destroyed, and we, on this, part, on this side of the House, are united 
in our desire to make sure that they don't have an opportunity to do it again. Because, let's be frank, the Blair-Brown years were compared to what would come in a general election this year, should this party, for the, the party opposite force upon us, uh, was a golden age. <laughs> I mean, you know, we would rather have Blair and Brown than Corbyn and Macdonald uh, any day of the week. But those options are not available to the British public. Speaker, can I first thank the Leader of the Opposition in his absence for tabling this vote of no confidence, which I will be supporting in the lobbies this evening. Mr Speaker, I came into politics challenged with trying to make a difference to the lives of ordinary people of Bradford West, to try to be part of a system that is about putting people first and not about people clinging to power and positions of, and self-preservation being at the heart of everything they do. I have lived experience of what destitution and poverty is, so when a generation later I have constituents that come into my surgery in sheer destitution and literally crying due to not knowing how how they are going to feed their children and meet their very basic needs, when the reality of insecure jobs and in-work poverty, and whilst having dependents, leads to further destitution, then the question has to be whether this government is fit for purpose. From my short time in this House, Mr Speaker, I feel the real tragedy for me is that whilst the nail in the coffin for this debate has been yesterday's catastrophic defeat of, of any government in the history of our democracy, for me and my constituents, Mr Speaker, the truth is that this government wasn't, hasn't been fit for purpose for a very long time. This government wasn't fit for purpose when the UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty described levels of child poverty in the UK as not just a disgrace, but a social calamity and an economic disaster in the fifth largest economy in the world. This government wasn't fit for purpose when it pursued the policy of rolling out a hostile environment leading to tragedies with the Windrush scandal. This government wasn't fit for purpose when it was, it was found in contempt of this Parliament. This government isn't fit for purpose when it, repeat, it is repeatedly defeated in the courts by single parents and people with disabilities and is forced to go back to the drawing board on its own policies. This government wasn't fit for purpose when it failed again last year to stop the increase in homelessness on the streets of Britain and even failed to save the life of the poor man that died outside the doors of the Parliament just week weeks ago. This government wasn't fit for purpose when those on the benches opposite decided to use food banks for photo ops. This government isn't fit for purpose when programmes like I, Daniel Blake, is many people's reality are no longer a fiction. This government has consistently acted in the interests of the few and not the many, offering tax giveaways to the rich whilst viciously cutting services for the most vulnerable in this country. The government wasn't fit for purpose when the Prime Minister knew her deal was dead before, she, before recess and yet chose to sabotage and hold Parliament hostage by delaying the vote. And the list goes on. Those 117 of my from the colleagues across the benches, when they voted that this Prime Minister was not fit to govern them and their party, how can they go back to the electorate and say that this government is fit, 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 that, that Prime Minister is fit to leave the country and not them? Yeah. Bill Grant. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Bradford West. When members consider their position on the matter of confidence tonight, I would argue that this government's record must be assessed, not just on the basis of one vote, however, fundam however fundamental that issue is for the nation's future, but on this government's record in office. Three practical measures of a government's relative success are taxation levels for working families, employment <coughs> levels and investment in public services. It must be remembered that it is this government which has cut the taxes for 32 million working people in order that they can keep more of the money that they earn. It is this government which has seen unemployment not simply reduced but plummet to a record low. And it's this government which is investing an extra 20 plus billion in the NHS for our future health. And through Barnet Consequential, that will benefit NHS Scotland immensely. Yeah, yeah. In the same period, all that the opposition front bench has achieved is an over an ever changing conviction on each issue with little consensus of opinion. In fact, the only consensus seems to be that the government has apparently got it wrong in every issue. This is clearly not the case, and the facts do not support the opposition's somewhat gloomy 
assessment. This government is pressing ahead with ongoing investment in research and development with gross deals throughout the country, such as the one emerging in Ayrshire. It recognises the importance of the environment with the 25-year environmental plan, never been done before in the United Kingdom. It has secured a stable economy from a very weak and unstable inheritance, yeah, and it yeah, listens yeah, when yeah. things need to change, particularly in relation to universal credit. Yeah. Yeah. That is not a government in crisis, as members opposite allege. They are simply doing this to secure an election, but this is a government which is getting on with the business of governing. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Prime yeah, Minister yeah, yeah. has worked incredibly hard on these and other issues over the last two years, and I would earnestly encourage honourable members to support the government tonight. With everything else that is going on, with this party being the only one, the only party with a clear desire to honour the referendum, yeah, this is not the time yeah, to be holding an unnecessary yeah, yeah. and unwanted general election. It is time to get on with what we have been asked to do before our constituents lose faith in every parliamentarian in this House. In closing, Mr Speaker, I have every confidence in Her Majesty's Conservative and Unionist Government, and I will be voting for it tonight. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last night's defeat was an extraordinary humiliation for the Prime Minister. And if ever there was a situation to be described as chickens coming home to roost, it was this. For this is a national calamity of the Prime Minister's own making. It was this Prime Minister who failed to reach out across the House to find consensus on a way forward from the narrow win for leave in the 2016 referendum. It was the Prime Minister who painted herself into a corner with a series of bright red lines designed only to appease the most extreme Brexiteers in her party. And it was the Prime Minister who triggered Article 50 far too prematurely. But crucially, though, it was the Prime Minister who has also resolutely failed to tackle any of the underlying injustices that drove the 2016 referendum result. Many people voted Leave because they believe that the status quo in this country is intolerable. And they are right. It is. We are a country of grotesque inequalities, not just between classes, but geographically between regions, especially between North and South, and between thriving cities and failing towns within the same region. Last year, the Commission on Social Mobility identified the 30 worst places for social mobility, and every single one of them voted to leave. Now, I don't think that that was a coincidence. So the Prime Minister's mantra about bringing the country back together rings very hollow when you look at the evidence. Welfare cuts since 2010 have cost lone parent households an average of over £5,000, increasing child poverty rates in those households from 37% to 62%. The NHS has endured the longest period of austerity in its history. The evidence goes on. So today has to be the day when we start to change the conversation about Brexit and about the future of Britain. Not by slavishly repeating that Brexit is the will of the people, but by really and genuinely hearing the voices of those who have been economically and politically excluded for decades. The millions of people who rightly chose to give the establishment an almighty kicking in June 2016 deserve their concerns to be addressed and properly resolved. Now, Mr Speaker, I believe that a people's vote, if it learns the lessons from the failed Remain campaign of 2016, can be the vehicle that we need to have that honest debate in this country. It will be the chance to be able to move on from the divisive and dangerous place that we're in by committing to Project Hope rather than Project Fear. And, Mr Speaker, whoever is in number 10 must be someone who is going to be able to put that issue back to the people. Because a general election that is fought by two of the biggest parties who both have a commitment to Brexit does not take us forward on this issue. So while, of course, I want to get rid of that toxic government opposite, I also want to make sure that we resolve this most pressing issue and get this question back to the people, because Parliament has shown itself Un incapable of resolving, it needs to go back to the people. Thank you. Julian Knight. Mr Speaker, as ever, it is a huge pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady from uh, Brighton Pavilion. Um, polls. We've heard a lot about polls today. I'll give you a couple. First of all, 52-48. We all know, know those numbers. And I believe it is intrinsic, it is absolutely beholden on this House to respect that referendum result. The other poll is 34 per cent. That is the current Labour Party polling. Quite incredibly, at this particular time, 34%. And the reasons for that were encapsulated, I think, Mr. <coughs> Speaker, by the Honourable Member for Barrow and Furness, who said quite simply 
that the shadow chancellor and the leader of the opposition are unfit for high office. And I think as people get closer to the potential of a buying decision, they would see that very starkly indeed. And the other reason for the 34% is these six tests, the magic unicorn tests, designed to fail. And the public aren't foolish. They aren't going to be hoodwinked by this. They know intrinsically that this is sophistry of the very most politically contentable sort. And I am going to say now to members opposite, at some point later today, tomorrow, the growing ups are going to have a, have a conversation about what the party opposite actually want out of this. I will give way. Does my honourable friend agree with me that what people tell me and my constituency in Basingstoke and businesses in Basingstoke is they want certainty? Absolutely. How can they get certainty when they have uh, challenges in the, in the government and also uh, rejecting the government's plans yesterday? Absolutely. And certainty is all. And as, a, as JLR, who I'll be speaking about in the, uh, uh, the adjournment debate, they want certainty as well. And I really do think it's a little bit rich when people talk about uh, the rights of EU citizens and UK citizens, and then they're rich to deal that protect those rights. Now, I would say that a second referendum is itself a stain on this Parliament. The division would be enormous, and as I say, we have been entrusted. I also would say that no deal makes no sense to me in the dislocation that this could cause to our economy. Uh, I know that people talk about stockpiling and emergency uh, provision, etc. But the reality is, well, what happens when those stocks actually run out? And what happens as well if we do end up with dislocation? What happens if we then have to go to the EU to negotiate certain terms at that particular point? We would be in a very weak position. So I would say both those things are out. So we have to come together sensibly, despite this stunt today, this way in which, frankly, we're going to see all more members filling out their Facebook pages with how many different times they can say particular words in order basically to link in with their local momentum groups. It is time for sensible people, growing up people, to actually face the consequences, the circumstances we face in. That is what the public want. They do not like this spectacle at all. Now, when it comes to the achievements of this particular government, I would say in 2010, we inherited 11% of GDP. Now, let me just be very clear to you, sorry, clear to the House, that 11% of GDP is such an enormous sum that you cannot go borrowing that sum for very long. Eventually, the markets call in your loans, and you end up having to pay such a high interest rate that you end up in a depression. Yeah, yeah. So we had to sort that out as a government. But we did that while protecting the NHS. And we have announced an increase in NHS spending, which is twice the level proposed, increase-wise, than Labour proposed yeah. at the 2017 general election. Now, not everything you know, is perfect in that respect. There are issues, and I really have to say that we are working towards trying to serve those ongoing issues. But when it comes to the big matter of the economy, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to health care, when it comes to a million kids in, in better, outstanding schools, this government is delivering. We have to get through Brexit and we will deliver more. Andy Slaughter. Mr Speaker, the provocation for this debate is the unprecedented defeat of the central plank of the government's policy that should have led seamlessly to a general election and in the Brexit debate earlier this week I spoke about the threat that Brexit represents to the prosperity and the opportunity and the security of my constituents and to many of my businesses but I also represent some of the poorest communities in the UK. Uh, although I'm proud of the work it does I'm not proud to have the busiest food bank in London. Last week I spent an afternoon at one of St Mungo's homeless hostels in West Kensington, talking to residents and staff. They told me that the annual street homelessness count that will be published on the 31st of January will show it has doubled in the last year. Shame. Shame. They gave me Shame. three reasons for that. Universal credit, the increase in, recourse, in no recourse to public funds, and tenancy takeover, where drug dealers seize the premises of vulnerable tenants. So the war on the poor, the hostile environment, and a descent into lawlessness, three of the worst consequences of austerity. The cuts in police numbers, especially neighbourhood officers, is putting whole communities at risk. I spent part of New Year's Eve at a crime scene in Fulham, uh, an attempted murder which led to the arrest of 40 people 
and the recovery of a number of dangerous weapons. I estimate that half of the people I now see in surgery have problems which would have made them eligible for legal aid before the passage of the LASPO Act. Yesterday, my CCG, looking to make £44 million of cuts to its budget, began to consult on reducing opening hours for urgent care centres and GPs. Not just bad in itself, but in direct contradiction to the NHS, NHS strategy that calls for an extension of those services to justify the closures of A&Es and emergency beds. For the first time in a generation, we are seeing year-on-year real terms cuts in schools' budgets. Inner city schools do not just educate, they give emotional and practical support to families who struggle with poverty and poor living standards. And perhaps the worst betrayal by this government is to cut funding for social housing by 80 per cent, 100 per cent under the former uh, L- London Mayor, when 800,000 people are on waiting lists. Mr. Speaker, my local council and the Mayor of London do their best and effectively do what they can to alleviate the conditions I've described, but for real change we need a Labour government. Mm -hmm. This Prime Minister's legacy will be to have ruined this country in half the time it took the Thatcher and major governments. Enough is now enough. We need a general election and we need a Labour government. Chris Green. Speaker, this debate should be one of two halves. Firstly, it's right the opposition challenged the government on the government's record, but the second part ought to be the fact that the opposition seek to become the government itself. They should be presenting a vision for the country, and they have demonstrably failed to demonstrate that they have a vision for the country that they can deliver in a few weeks' time if they won an election. That part has been wholly absent from this debate so far. Now, on the referendum day three years ago, in 2016, during that referendum, I spent a great deal of time talking to constituents and visiting polling stations around my constituency uh, in parts of Wigan and in parts of Bolton. And it was startling. On that day, the polling stations in the poorest neighbourhoods, the poorest communities, those polling stations had a turnout that they had never seen before, far higher than for local elections, far higher than for a general election. This vote on the referendum on the European Union reached out in a way that politicians here have never done before, or at least not for decades. This is one of the key reasons why it's so important to respect this referendum decision. These people who perhaps have never voted before, perhaps they've had the opportunity of decades to vote, and they have chosen to say that there is no election that's important enough that we actually want to engage. Now, this referendum was a vote where they decided to engage in politics, engage in the life of the country. And it's vital that this government now respects that decision. We are leaving the European Union on the 29th of March this year. If this decision is delayed by uh, suspending Article 50 or even cancelling Article 50, that will be a sign to the electorate, all voters, whether leave or remain, that their decision is being disrespected. And worse still, if there's a second referendum to dismiss the first referendum, it would be a sign from this place, your vote was wrong, get it right the second time. That is repugnant, that would be so damaging to our democracy. I urge the government, focus on delivering Brexit, focus on delivering on the 29th of March, use the opportunity, use the days we have left to get the best deal from the European Union, but on the 29th, we must leave. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Edward Davey. I'll be voting for, for this uh, motion tonight, not just because of the failure of the government on Brexit, but because of their failure on so many issues, yeah. rising crime, the railways, the social care disaster, the school's budget and so on. I think the speech earlier in this debate from the, lady, the Honourable Member uh, from Warrington North actually encapsulated it uh, the, the best. But on Brexit, which is obviously on everyone's minds, uh, one has to ask why is this government unable to deliver on Brexit? And it's fundamentally because the Conservative Party is split. It is absolutely divided. We saw that in the lobbies last night, but we've actually seen it, Mr Speaker, in the record number of resignations from this Prime Minister's Government. In just three years, we've seen 32 
people resign from her government. Another dreadful record. This shows that this, go- this government is incapable is, is incapable of... I'll, I'll take... Yeah, I'll take them. Well, no, the Honourable Member has a number of, uh, a number of uh, shadow front benches that have resigned since uh, the, uh, the current uh, leader came to power. Well, thank you, Mr. S- Mr. Speaker. Um, I was going to actually talk about a, a, a speech by the member for Brentwood and Ongar, who said this, this uh, motion tonight might unite uh, the Conservatives. It probably will, because a rafter of turkeys ain't going to vote for Christmas. But the ultimate division is still there, and that should worry people across our country, because this government and this party is incapable of delivering Brexit. It has shown that over the last two and a half years. And that's why the Honourable, right Honourable Lady, the member uh, for Putney, was right. The government now have to reach across the aisles. They have to talk to all parties, have to get Parliament to deliver uh, this uh, policy area. But if, they, if they're going to do that and do it successfully, they've got to do three things. Article 50 has to be extended. No deal has to be taken off the table. And the government has to show that when there is a deal agreed, that will be put to the British people with the option of remaining in the EU. That, I think, can get consensus. That could be delivered. That could bring the, the House together. At the moment, we're just hearing uh, the Conservative Party blaming everyone else but themselves. Yeah. They blame the Remainers. They blame the opposition. Yeah. They blame uh, the, the Governor of the Bank of England. Sometimes I think they're going to blame sunshine, moonlight, good times and boogie, yeah. Mr Speaker. <laughs> There's only one group to blame. It's the Conservative Party. Yeah. Thank you. Alex Chalk. Yeah. Mr Speaker. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of people ask me, and I dare say every honourable member in this House, why on earth would you go into politics? And they ask it particularly at a time like this. But I know the answer, and I know the answer as a Conservative. It's because I believe to my bones in social mobility. Now, I want to make crystal clear, I expect there are people across this House who believe in that. But the, question that di- the issue that divides us is how you come up with solutions, how you go about achieving it, how you unlock potential and seek out the treasure that's in the heart of every man and woman. And I know it's as a Conservative Member of Parliament that it's been possible to provide opportunities in my community in Cheltenham that has allowed people to fulfil that potential. Because my community, although people don't realise it, they say, Cheltenham, for goodness sake, it must be the most affluent place in the country. Not a bit of it. We have some of the most deprived communities anywhere in our country, where people live in in generational entrenched poverty. And what has this Conservative Party done for my community? £22 million for a cyber park in Cheltenham, which will allow the finest minds to come in and out of GCHQ to create start-ups. Start-ups which mean that if there is a person living nearby who has come from generational poverty, but they've got something about them, Something which says, I want to better myself. I want to go forward. I want to provide for my family and I want to build a future. That opportunity exists. Money that has come in the form of over 400 million for a road project. Now, you might say, oh, a road project, who cares about that? Road projects are what allow a local community to thrive. It's what allows opportunities to be generated and futures to be created. But it's not just about infrastructure projects. Recognising the issue of homelessness, it's this government that provided £1.3 million for social impact bonds. What does that mean? That means one-on-one support for individuals who can go and address the needs of the most vulnerable in our society, be that drug addiction, be that mental health problems, be that debt. And that has served to make a huge difference in my community so that it's not just a stronger community economically, but a fairer one too. What's more, £3 million to help deliver uh, uh, social housing in Cheltenham in Portland Place. So, of course, there is always room for improvement. Of course, there is always more to do. But on that issue of social mobility, which is the party that isn't just talking the talk, but walking the walk, it is this government that is achieving it, this government which is making a difference in my community, and that is why I will vote against this motion tonight. Gregory Campbell. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I want to commence by saying, since I came into the House in 2001, I have seen a significant increase in the number of people uh, in the Chamber, right across the divide, who have come to speak and vote in favour and in defence of this United Kingdom compared to what was the case some 17 years ago and for that I and the people at home are eternally grateful uh, for that and I'm sure that is shared across the the divide. Uh, I want to say Mr Speaker that 
Um, I will be voting uh, against the motion tonight uh, because I retain confidence in this Government uh, on the terms and conditions contained uh, in the confidence and supply motion that we entered into some time ago. But I want to, at this stage, offer a piece of critical advice to my right hon. Friend, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, and it is this. Uh, in the past year and a half, um, I believe that her negotiations have not best served this United Kingdom. And I believe last night's defeat, the scale of the defeat, can offer her and us an opportunity for a revised position by her. Uh, and I believe that that should be a, a condition that she goes back to the EU and makes it very, very clear, just as she hasn't done up to now, that whenever they say a, a deal is only doable if it contains the backstop that we have arranged and agreed with you, that she goes back to them and says, <laughs> agree is doable, uh, an agreement is doable, but not on the terms and conditions of that backstop, because that backstop creates a division, a, a cleavage, a divorce within our United Kingdom, and we are not prepared to enter into any agreement that is based on that uh, backstop. And it is only when she gets to that stage that we get Mr Juncker last night, as he said, after he realised the scale of the defeat, after the, the possibility of what may emerge beyond last night's defeat uh, could emerge in, in subsequent weeks, when he made this statement, which I think has not been commented upon, it is that we, the EU, are determined to get a deal. He wasn't saying that six months ago. He wasn't saying that six weeks ago. But he is saying it now. And the reason he's saying it now is because the appearance of no deal on the horizon has now suddenly galvanised the EU nation states, and our Prime Minister has got to take advantage of that now and has got to say to the EU, we are prepared to get a deal, but we are prepared to get a good deal and a reasonable deal, not a one-way deal like the deal that fell last night, but a deal that delivers both for the UK and for the EU. It is on that basis that I will be voting against the motion tonight, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Powell. And I, arrive to, I arise to speak because I believe that this government is the right government to carry on with its serious work that it has begun, not just on Brexit, but on so many other important issues affecting our daily lives. And because I believe that a, the ch a chain of events that might lead to a general election will in no way be good for the country. And because I am genuinely fearful of what might happen if this great country, but especially our businesses, uh, should get into the hands of the member for Islington North, yeah, should yeah, he ever get his hands on the tiller, this country will not be in safe hands. Uh, an election will certainly not solve the impending business at hand, which is delivering on our relationship with the EU. So, I believe that this government is the best government to, uh, to deliver for us, not just nationally, but also locally. That's what's really important to me as the MP for Taunton Dean. And in my constituency, since the, since the Conservatives have been in power, we have delivered more than any other government. Uh, there are more people in work than ever before in Taunton Dean, more SMEs setting up. Uh, there, are more, there is more funding coming our way thanks to a strong economy. That's why my calls for £79 million for the new theatres in the hospital were agreed to and accepted, and that's why we got an additional £11 million for more health services locally. Yeah. We've had more funding for in infrastructure, £28 million. We are upgrading the A358, we are upgrading the Toneway, we are upgrading the motorway junction. We've got £7 million to enable a road through Staple Grove where more housing is being built. We are building more housing than ever before in Taunton Dean, Mr Speaker, and that's because of this strong economy. There is a great, great deal going on, and more children in Taunton Dean are getting a better education than ever before, and we're building a new special school. All of things are, these things are only possible with a strong economy yeah. and with an understanding of what business needs. We've cut the Labour's astonishing deficit yeah, by four yeah, fifths, yeah, yeah. which has restored the public finances. Finally, I want to touch on the environment and uh, yeah. it won't surprise people. This government has 
an unparalleled record on working for the environment, and we must continue with our great work, which is another good reason why we need to leave the EU. I am backing the Prime Minister. She will come up with a deal. We must do it with compromise. We must work as a team on these benches. We must listen to the other side, but we must pull off Brexit. And I am confident that this government, with its track record on the economy and all of the other things it's delivered, including on the environment, is the right government to do, and to do it successfully and to do it fairly so that we leave future generations able to carry on the good work we've set in place and to live in a fair and wonderful economy and take this great nation into the future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The famous phrase is that a fish rots from the head down. It is a recognition that bad leadership infects all that it touches. And what greater example of that than this present government? The rot isn't confined to Downing Street. It is infecting the whole country. Not strong and stable, but stubborn and self-obsessed. And Brexit is by far the clearest, but no means the only, example. Frankly, the Prime Minister has turned Brexit into some modern-day bizarre Schleswig-Holstein question. Something that Palmerston himself said claim was so complicated only three people understood it. One was dead, one who'd been driven mad by it, and one who'd forgotten it altogether. But the truth is that this isn't a complicated situation. It's her red lines that have killed her deal. It's her red lines that have driven this Parliament mad. And it's her red lines that are best forgotten. This infectious failure has covered all bases. This is a government that can't organise a tailback on the M20. A government presiding over a shortage of nurses while stockpiling fridges. A government alienating our EU citizen neighbours whilst deporting our Windrush families. A government obsessed with what stickers are on the Speaker's wife's car whilst ignoring the pleas for help with issues like knife crime. The roll call goes on and on. Universal credit, homelessness, the cost of living, the refugees crying out for sanctuary, the human rights of the women of Northern Ireland. At every turn, this government cannot get a grip and those burning injustices burn harder as a result. This country is divided. This parliament is divided. The deadlock is deepening, not dissolving, and the Prime Minister can't even be bothered to pick up a phone. No party can continue to prevaricate whilst the far right goes stronger. It will not stop with Brexit, and Brexit does not deal with the crisis of confidence in our politics we all now face. We are not the only country facing difficult choices or challenges, but we are the only country that thinks because it's the mother of all democracies, there's nothing wrong with how we approach things. Change has got to come for all our stakes, but for that to happen, it has to start at the top and we have to stop the rot. You merry man. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak not just on behalf of Brenda from Bristol, but all of the Brendas in Bexhill and Battle, who are probably feeling right now that the last thing we all want is a general election. But what we do want is our Parliament and all of our MPs to work better together and fix the issues of our day. And I've enjoyed this afternoon because I've had the opportunity to listen to many feelings, hopes, aspirations. But it depresses me that we still are in a position where people would rather shout at each other in this chamber as opposed to reaching out to each other, working out where we can identify issues that are common to us all and try and fix them. And in my constituency, I'm very proud of things that this government have helped me deliver since I was elected in 2015. All of my secondary schools have now moved to good or outstanding. I had the Secretary of State for Health come and spend time seeing our health service joined up with our social care team uh, on Friday of last. And that made me very proud to see all these amazing leaders really working as one, working together. And again, I think that's a very good example for Parliament. Now, of course, I'm not naive. I recognise the opposition have to oppose and the government have to govern. I'm also not so naive that there are not big challenges in my constituency. That's why I'll be having a task force on homelessness, because I've noticed the streets in Bexhill getting worse. I've also noticed more casework from my constituents because there are not less levels of services available that there once were. So, of course, many points made by opposition members are correct. 
But equally, we now have more people in employment than we ever have done before. So it can't all be as bad as is being said on that side of the bench, and perhaps it can't all be as good as is sometimes said on this side of the bench. If we all took that attitude into this place and worked out how we could fix things which really matter to people, we might also be able to fix the issues of Brexit. But I will touch to my point on a matter that I thought we'd have got fixed by now when I got elected in 2015, social care reform. It's within us in this House to fix things for the most vulnerable and often the most elderly people in our communities. We agree on so much. A wealth tax said on this side, uh, opposite of the House. On our side, in our manifesto, we talked a lot more about the fact that people should pay more. We're almost there, yet our hatred sometimes of each other just stops us reaching out. And when it comes to reaching out, Mr Speaker, there's one thing I would like my government to do to really show that they are listening. The charge of £65 for an EU citizen to maintain and have the same rights that they enjoyed before we in this country took the step in the referendum, that does not feel fair to me. And I speak to many on both sides of the chamber who also feel it's not fair. Surely, if the government is listening, we reach out not just to them, but also to every member in this House who agrees with that, be they leavers or remainers, and really offer that olive branch. If we start in that particular way, perhaps others will appreciate the government is listening, and perhaps then we will work better together in the manner that our constituents expect from us all. Alison Thewlis. Mr Speaker, I have no confidence in this government, and I never have done. I have no confidence because of um, the way that the DWP treat people. I have no confidence because of the constituent who was sanctioned because they were visiting their dying father. I have no confidence because my constituents were du- was sanctioned while waiting to start a job with the DWP. I have no sanction because of the way that people are treated on PIP. I have no confidence because of the way that... Um, the two-child policy and the rape clause has been pursued against vulnerable women in our society, and it must be scrapped. I have no confidence because of the closure of Glasgow's job centres. I have no confidence because of the implementation of the hostile environment, of refugees left waiting, and of constituents who have not been able to be with their families. I have no confidence because of the constituent who lost out on his wife's visa because he was under the threshold by seven pounds, Mr. Speaker. I have no confidence in this government because of the good character test that is being applied to children, to children who can't get citizenship because this government thinks they are not of good character enough. And, Mr. Speaker, while we are on good character, I have no confidence in this government because the Home Office told my constituent he could not um, get citizenship because he had volunteered with the Red Cross, and that was a sign of bad character too. I have no confidence in this government because of their pursuance of Section 3225 of the Immigration Rules, where people lost out on getting leave to remain <laughs> because they had made a legitimate change to their tax returns yep. and the government thought that that was somehow wrong. I have no confidence in this government because of their abject failure to deal with Scottish <laughs> Limited Partnerships and to reform companies' house. Yep. It's almost as if they like money laundering in this country, Mr yep. Speaker. Yep. I have no confidence in this government because of the refusal, despite all evidence, to allow Glasgow to pursue super dra- supervised drug consumption rooms. It is well expected that drug Drug deaths in Scotland will top 1,000 this coming year, but the government refuses to do so for ideological reasons. I have absolutely no confidence (coughs) in them for doing so. I have no confidence in this government because they fail to realise that young people deserve a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. The under 25s are not worth the same uh, when they go out to work, and that this pretendy living wage fails to give people the dignity and work that they deserve. I have no confidence in this government because of the, their failure to tackle the real present danger that Brexit will cause to all of our constituents, that they put their head in their sand, that they refuse to accept the single market and the customs union as the best way forward. And, Mr Speaker, I do have confidence in the people in my constituency. I have confidence in the people of Glasgow and the people of Scotland who voted for independence with such hope in 2014. Yeah, and I know yeah, yeah. that when Scotland gets its chance again, it will have no confidence in this government and lots of confidence themselves. Yeah. James Cartledge. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, and I am sure, Mr. Speaker, at some point in your life it is possible that you have owned a copy of that famous political book, The Downing Street Years, by Margaret Thatcher. And if so, given your memory, you may well recall the <laughs> opening sentence of that book. The very first words read, Eyes 311, nose 310. 
the result of the no-confidence vote in 1979 which brought Margaret Thatcher to power. And I say to my colleagues tonight, how would you feel if in a few years from now browsing in the bookstore was a copy of the Downing Street years by the Leader of the Opposition and the opening sentence was a narrow defeat in a vote of confidence which led to a new era in British politics because we all know that it wouldn't be like the new era that the previous one I referred to brought in. In 1979, it ushered in an era when free enterprise became back in the heart of British politics. We went through the difficult period of adjustment of our economy that culminated in the end of socialism and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the greatest victory in the history of modern conservatism. Instead, we would bring in a different era. All of that would be turned back a return to nationalisation, command and control, the idea that the state knows best, confiscatory tax rates, not education, 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 but regulation, regulation, regulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say this to you, Mr Speaker, I am, sta- I am proud to stand on this side tonight. I became a Conservative after seeing what it was like in Eastern Europe, my experience of the true face of that supposedly compassionate <laughs> ideology. And those, those who turned a blind eye, blind eye to it should be ashamed of it. I started with Callaghan. I am going to finish with Callaghan, uh, Mr Speaker. Not the former Labour Prime Minister but Detective Inspector Harry Callahan of the San Francisco Police Department. Because I say, if anyone thinks it's a good idea that Labour win the no-confidence vote tonight and then get into power, all I can say is, I hope you're feeling lucky. Some members uh, opposite uh, have been calling into question the motivations of the opposition for calling this no-confidence vote. Let's be clear, Mr Speaker, yesterday's vote wasn't just a defeat, it was a complete and utter rout. Now, some members uh, today, in today's debate have been talking about uh, historical parallels, but I think if that had been a battle, it would have to compare to the Battle of Cannae, where Hannibal annihilated the Roman army, a textbook defeat, just like last night was a textbook example of arrogance and hubris in government. But, you know, last night's vote aside, let's run through some of the myriad of reasons why I and we on this side of the House have no confidence in this government. In work poverty at four million people, homelessness soaring. Yesterday, in in my city of Norwich and Norfolk, 38 out of 53 of our children's centres are being closed. Why? Because Norfolk County Council have said this government's cuts are forcing that on them. A day of complete shame in my city. And without a hint of irony, this government, whilst closing down our children's centres, has declared Norwich an opportunity area as it attempts to improve failing social mobility. Mr Speaker, it's a policy akin to attempting to fit up a bath with no plug. In education, schools face real terms funding cuts. In The Guardian today, Norfolk County Council again in the media, under fire from the local, edu- the local government ombudsman for failing to address and to look after the concerns of children with special education needs. On mental health, after the PM personally promised to improve uh, this Cinderella service, Norfolk and Suffolk Mental Health Foundation Trust has been put into special measures again, three times in four years. The first of any t- of any of any trust in the country that, that has happened to. Real terms funding at this day and age now down 13 per cent, demand up by 50 per cent. But I also want to turn to an issue that I believe this House and particularly this government have failed to adequately address, and that's the impending climate catastrophe and biodiversity loss. This, above all else, given the timescales that we are talking, is basically a calamity waiting to happen that this government is comprehensively failing on. Time after time, we hear the greenwash from the benches opposite that they are going to do what it takes to do on the environment. They slash soda subsidies, 9,000 job losses. Fracking has been announced and put forward and is now actually happening. But not just in this country, they're also doing it in China as well with taxpayers' money. The climate science tells us that you need to leave this in the ground, 80% of it. It can't happen. And in the words of that famous Delia Smith, that legend of Norwich, I will say to the benches of it opposite, let's be having you, let's have that general election, let's have that vote, support this motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are moments in this chamber for political knockabout, 
There are moments in this chamber for consensus, and there are moments in this chamber for constructive debate. And I am very, very disappointed that at this point in time, when we have such an important, momentous decision to make about how we take forwards our exit from the European Union, we are having this debate today. But I appreciate that yesterday's vote is the reason why it's been called. But what would make this maybe slightly better would be if it wasn't the fact that the Leader of the Opposition hasn't just called this debate now, but all he said for weeks and weeks and months and months, whenever he's been asked his position on Brexit, he's been unable to give a clear answer. All he's been able to do is say he wants a general election. And he continues, continues. I sincerely hope that after this evening, when I believe he will lose this vote, he will move on and start giving some clarity on his position on Brexit. But it is simply not fair to the country that the opposition cannot put together their own position. At this point in time, when I recognise that here in Parliament we need to come together and solve how we leave the European Union. That is what businesses, particularly my constituents, are calling for us to do, is move forward and get on with it. But also what I hear from businesses more often than not is not that their concern is so much about the uncertainty of Brexit, it's what would happen if the Leader of the Opposition were to become Prime Minister, and if his party and his hard left version of Labour were to take charge of our economy and our country, because that would be the worst possible possible thing for our country. I would have no confidence on behalf of my constituents of what he and his government would do for our economy, our security or even for our public services. He may claim to be a champion of our public services. Not only would they be completely unsustainable and unfundable under his economic model, but also have no confidence that he'd be able to improve their performance as we have in government, whether it's in schools, where children are now learning to read, which is the fundamentals for them having a better opportunity in life, whether it's in the National Health Service, where, as we heard last week, we now have a long long-term plan for a sustainable National Health Service and funded sustainably. So I look forward to continuing, for us to continue delivering on these commitments in government. But first, we need to move on and deliver Brexit. These are difficult times, not just in the UK, but for countries across the Western world. We need to come together, we need to move forward, we need to deliver on Brexit, continue making Britain a better place to live and build our place in the world outside the European Union. A walker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise in support of the Leader of the Opposition's motion. As a teacher and head teacher throughout my career, trust has always been very important to me. The trust children had in me as their teacher and the trust that teachers had in me as their head teacher to understand their needs and make the right decisions on their behalf. Trust in relationships and in the workplace is crucial. Today, this debate isn't about whether the Prime Minister has the ability to make decisions on our behalf. It's about whether we trust her to understand the mood of the country, the zeitgeist and the needs of every region and demographic and make the right decisions. This Government has suffered the biggest parliamentary defeat in history, been found in contempt of Parliament, overseen the steepest rise in poverty and averaged a resignation per month. I trust the Leader of our Opposition and the Shadow Front Bench as people who understand the struggles that many in our country are facing. I trust them to have the compassion and intellect to understand and empathise with the people of this country and to be able to make the decisions which will improve all our lives. Is the Prime Minister a good public servant? Yes. Does she work hard? Yes. Do I respect her? Yes. I respect anyone who devotes their life to public service. But is the Prime Minister a diplomat? Does she show warmth and empathy? Is she able to negotiate with the other 27 countries in the EU in our interests? Clearly not. 
I do not trust our Prime Minister to represent our country and to negotiate a deal which is in the best interest of the people of Combe Valley, my constituents or our country. For me, this is not just about whether we are in the EU or not. It is about the kind of society I want my granddaughter to live in. Just before Christmas, my five-year-old granddaughter came into Parliament for the first time and she loved it. Fast forward 30 years when she's a grown woman. Do I want her to inherit the world determined by this government? No, No, I don't. I wonder how she will judge this government's handling of Brexit when she's a grown woman. I see it as a full-blown display of incompetence focused purely on party interests and failing to take strong action to protect jobs and the economy, workers' rights and environmental protections and national security. I don't trust this government with my constituents' future, my granddaughter's future or our country's future. I have therefore no confidence in this government. I do trust a person like the opposition leader to understand diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, Jack Brereton. When I was elected, my constituents in Stoke-on-Trent South were quite clear. They voted overwhelmingly for Brexit and they were overwhelmingly in rejection of what this Labour Party has become and what it now stands for. The momentum-led Labour Party does not represent predominantly working-class communities like mine in the Midlands and the North. Years of Labour has done nothing to improve my city in Stoke-on-Trent, quite the reverse, decimating our local industries with our local communities taking the brunt and being left behind. Since Conservatives came to power, Stoke-on-Trent's industries have started to blossom again with record numbers of people working and the best places to start a new business now being Stoke-on-Trent. This success is thanks to, yes, the hard work of our businesses and our communities, but most significantly the policies of Conservatives. We have seen a government that has transformed our economy from the ruins of Labour's crash to one of the most successful developed economies. By supporting local businesses to grow, invest and take on more people, we have seen over 3.4 million more people in work, with unemployment at a record low, measures to keep taxes low and introducing a national living wage. A basic a basic rate taxpayer is now over £1,200, better off than they were in 2010. The clock. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, order, order, order. The, the Honourable Gentleman, I know that the House is excited, but the, the Honourable Gentleman must get a respectful hearing. Jack Brereton. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We must continue to pursue measures which will help address the cost of living and focus on growing aspirations, creating better opportunities and job prospects for our communities. This would be threatened by a Labour government led by the Leader of the Opposition. Their unfunded plans of £1 trillion of extra spending would see us racking up huge debts and mean massive tax rises for people in constituencies like mine who can least afford. And for what? Ideologically motivated white elephants, nationalisations of our industries, raiding the public purse to pursue policies which have been tried and failed time and again, threatening jobs in our industries and our economic prosperity. Every time we've had a Labour government, they have left our country with more people out of work than they've started. And as I've said many times before, my constituency in Stoke-on-Trent South voted overwhelmingly to leave. At every opportunity, I have voted in this House to enact Brexit and deliver for the wishes of my constituents. For this House to go against that and the British public and most of my constituents voted for would be a total betrayal of democracy. But this is what the significant proportion of MPs on the benches opposite want. They have repeatedly voted for measures to thwart Brexit, frustrating and trying to prevent and delay us from leaving on the 29th of March. This motion today shows the Labour leadership would rather play party politics than put the national interest in our country first. The Labour leader has been clear. They want a general election, going against the majority who are fed up with politicians and want us to get on with delivering for our country. Paul Sweeney! When I think of the confidence I have in this government, I think about how it's treated the most vulnerable people in our country. When I think of my constituents, I think of a 10-year-old boy who was orphaned uh, when his mother died. And this government, instead of nurturing him and trying to care for him and providing him with security, threatened to deport him. I thought that was the most shameful act, a disgrace 
and is typical of this government's hostile environment policy. And that is why I have no confidence in this government for that and many other reasons about how it's treated my constituents and many vulnerable people across this country, but also how they have handled this negotiation in such a feckless and dysfunctional manner. They couldn't agree ahead of time what the negotiating objectives were. There was no spirit of collaboration even after the Prime Minister lost her majority in this place. There was no attempt to form a collegiate basis to agree on negotiating objectives for this country and to deliver for this country's national interest. That was not achieved. Indeed, this government has subverted democracy at every turn when it suited its interests, even though it does not command a majority of the popular uh, consent of the people or even even a majority in this House of Commons. It has packed its select committees with Tory majorities, even though it is a hung parliament, by procedural sleight of hand. It repeatedly seeks to circumvent or abuse the seal conventions in its dealings with the devolved administrations. And indeed, this government became the first administration in parliamentary history to be held in contempt of parliament. I have to give way to my honourable friend. Does my honourable friend agree that in Scotland people will be watching this thinking it's an absolute shambles? We've been absolutely rod roughshod over, and we have no trust, no faith at all in this government. We need a general election now. Hey, hey. No, friend, we absolutely need a general election because there is no way to clear this impasse. There is a clear lack of faith in the government. There is a clear lack of will from the government to engage productively in reaching out to build a national consensus to achieve the way forward. It is now the job of Parliament to take control, and the only way to do that is to reset the clock, have a general election, allow a new mandate to be formed in the interests of delivering for the people of this country. That is the only way to do it, and that is why I will be supporting the motion of the Leader uh, of the Opposition tonight to bring down this failing government and deliver a mandate that will act in the national interests of this country. Uh, yes, one minute. Two, sorry, two minutes. Luke Graham. Luke Graham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I will try and keep this very short. I rise tonight in support of this Government motion, mainly because I hear the frustrations of the people in this country from my constituents, and we hear it here in this House. There is confusion whether it is on our split party position, we are criticised for red lines, but all we hear from Labour are their blurred lines, their lack of clear direction, their inability to come with a, comp- with a constructive alternative to what the Government is being put forward. Mr Speaker, Parties of all colours fail to make a constructive case for the United Kingdom's position in the European Union. And many contributions we've heard in this chamber this afternoon have lamented that fact. Many of them have been driven by anger. And that's fine. Anger is an easy emotion, and it's one that many of our constituents feel. But when party politics fail and policies fall down, it is when MPs need to step up. And that's what we need to do in the coming weeks. What's come from the defeat last night is a clear determination from my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, to reach out across this chamber, to come back with different proposals, to listen to people from across the political spectrum, and not those who stand up in this chamber and say they work in the national interest, but they only work in the nationalist interest, but actually those MPs who are here to genuinely constituents and protect and preserve our United, our United Kingdom, Mr Speaker, it is incredibly easy to criticise, but we cannot abdicate our responsibilities as members of Parliament for what we were elected to do. Our constituents don't want another general election, they want us to get on with our jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Watson. Uh, Mr Speaker, this has been a very passionately argued debate with over, as at my count, 59 members giving speeches where they were not holding back. And the scene was set by the Honourable Member for Christchurch, who said at the start that the Prime Minister must accept the verdict of the House last night. And the necessity for that was underpinned by my right honourable friend, the Member for Knowsley, who highlighted the fact that she is a Prime Minister with no majority and no authority, which is perhaps why the Honourable Member for Ross Sky and La Carba talked about the PM's record level of a lack of humility, (laughs) and the Right Honourable Member for Twickenham, in what I thought was a thoughtful speech, spoke of the Government's arrogant approach to these negotiations. Why is that so important? Because, as my Honourable Friend, the Member for Wallasey said, The UK is more divided and fearful for the future than ever before. Now, we have had some comic moments in this debate. I was particularly amused by the Honourable Member for Mid-Norfolk's contribution, his Life of Brian speech, 
which is an homage to one of the greatest satir satirical far farces in British film <laughs> history. Very appropriate for the times we are in. And the Honourable Member for Brentford and Ongar talked about the Conservative Party rebonding in the long lobbies tonight. Now, I can't, f I can't fail to note the passionate and sometimes breathless critiques of the last nine years of austerity economics by colleagues on my side of the House, particularly the members for Gedling, Ilford North, Warrington, uh, Warrington North, Hull West and Hessel. And a special prize must go to the Honourable Member for Dudley South, who at very short notice gave a four-minute speech in three minutes by speaking 25 per cent faster. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister said earlier in this, uh, in this debate, this is a crucial moment in our nation's history. But it is an unenviable task to summarise this debate today and to ask members of this House to pass judgment on her stewardship of our country. First, let me say very clearly that I am not one of those people who questions her motives. I agree with the Honourable Member for Stirling, who claimed she was motivated by public duty. I don't doubt that she has sincerely attempted to fulfil the task given to us by the voters in this referendum. I have no doubt, too, that she has tried her best and given it her all. But she has failed. And I'm afraid the failure is hers. And it's hers alone. And I'm certain that every member of this House admires her resilience to suffer the humiliations on a global stage that she has done would have finished off weaker people far sooner. Yet the reality is that if the Prime Minister really sat down and thought carefully about the implications of that defeat last night for our country, she would have resigned. Yeah. Throughout, history, throughout history, Prime Ministers have tried their best and failed. There's no disgrace in that. That's politics. But this Prime Minister has chosen one last act of defiance, not just defying the laws of politics, but defying the laws of mathematics. And it was Disraeli who said, a majority is always better than the best repartee. <laughs> she is a Prime Minister without a majority for her flagship policy, with no authority and no plan B. 432 to 202. Mr Speaker, that is not a mere flesh wound. <laughs> no one doubts her determination, which is generally an admirable quality, but misapplied it can be toxic. And the cruelest truth of all is that she doesn't possess the necessary skills, the political skills, the empathy, the ability, and most crucially, the policy to lead this country any longer. Now, I know there are many good people in the government. They will be examining their consciences as the clock run down on these Brexit negotiations. Because she has refused to resign, we now face a choice between a general election to sort out this mess or continued paralysis under her leadership. But now the ante has been raised. The Government has been defeated on a Brexit plan that has been its sole reason for existing for the past two and a half years. It has not just been defeated on the most crucial issue facing our country, it has suffered the worst defeat of any British Government in history. And the clock is ticking. MPs have shown that they are ready to take back control over what has been, from start to finish, a failed Brexit process. But the question facing the House tonight is whether it is worth giving this failed Prime Minister another chance to go back pleading to Brussels, another opportunity to humiliate the United Kingdom, another few weeks to waste precious time. Our answer tonight must be a resounding no. Yeah. And let me remind you why. It was this Prime Minister 
who chose to lay down red lines that never commanded the support of Parliament. It was this Prime Minister who refused to guarantee the rights of EU nationals who have made their lives and their homes in this country. It was this Prime Minister who time and again tried to shut Parliament out, refusing to give us a meaningful vote, refusing to release the legal advice to the deal. She's treated this place and its members on all sides with utter disdain. Mr Speaker, it was the member for Gainsborough who said the road to tyranny is paved with executives ignoring Parliament. Yet that is what she has done. And so Parliament is having to assert its rightful authority. And at every turn, she has chosen division over unity. She's not tried to bring the 17 million people that voted leave and the 16 million people that vote remain, voted remain together. She should have tried to assure those who voted remain. Instead, she chose to placate the most extreme of her colleagues on the leave side of the debate. That has left the nation more divided than it was in June 2016. Out on the streets, in homes, in schools, in hospitals, people are struggling and take no hope and no strength from this ailing government. What happened to those burning injustices she said it was her mission to fight when she came into office? Racism, classism, homelessness, insecure jobs. They've all grown and burned brighter than ever before. And for so much of this, she is responsible. If the House declares it's no confidence in the government tonight, it will open the possibility of a general election and a decisive change in direction for our country on Brexit, a decisive change in direction for workers, for young people and for our vital services. Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable Lady will forever be known as the Nothing Has Changed Prime Minister. But something must change. So our only choice left is to change her and her government in a general election. We know she's worked hard, but the truth is she's too set in her ways, too aloof to lead. She lacks the imagination and agility to bring people with her. She lacks the authority on the world stage to negotiate this deal. Ultimately, she has failed. It's not through lack of effort. It's not through lack of dedication. And I think the country recognises that effort. In fact, the country feels genuinely sorry for the Prime Minister. I feel sorry for the Prime Minister. But she cannot confuse pity for political legitimacy, sympathy for sustainable support. The evidence is clear. And I know that out of loyalty to party, members opposite will want to support the Prime Minister in the vote this evening. But everyone in this chamber, no matter which lobby they go through tonight, know in their hearts that this Prime Minister is not capable of getting a deal through. The members on the opposite benches know it. They know, we know that they know it. The country knows it, which is why we must act. That is why we need something new. That is why we need a general election. I commend this motion to the House. Mr Speaker, as you know, having sat throughout this entire debate, it has been a passionate debate characterised by many excellent speeches. I commend the members for Tiverton and Honiton, Bolton West, East Surrey, Mid Norfolk, Plymouth Moorview, Broxtow, Stirling, Dudley South, Faversham and Stoke and Trent South on my side for a series of outstanding speeches. But it has also been the case, as uh, the Shadow Secretary of State pointed out, that there have been many powerful speeches from the opposition benches as well. And I too, like him, want to pay particular tribute to the members for Warrington North, Gedling, Ilford North and Birmingham Hodge Hill for moving and passionate speeches 
their constituencies are lucky to have them as advocates for their uh, concerns and their needs. But perhaps the bravest and the finest speech that came from the opposition benches was given by the member for Barrow in Furness. It takes courage. It takes courage, and he has it, having been elected on a Labour mandate, representing working class people, to say that the leader of the party that you joined as a boy is not fit to be Prime Minister. He speaks for his constituents. He speaks for the country. And that takes me to to the speech from the Shadow Secretary of State. He spoke well. He spoke well, but I felt he did not rise to the level of events. But one thing that was characteristic about his speech, he did not once mention in his speech the leader of the opposition or why he should be Prime Minister. Now, now, I have a lot of time for the Honourable Member. We have several things in common. He's lost weight recently. Sorry, I, we've both lost weight recently, I should say. Him much more so. We're both friends of Israel. Him much more so. And we both recognise that the member for Islington North is about the worst possible person to lead the Labour Party. Yeah. Him much more so. Yeah. Now, as well as great speeches from the back benches, we also had some interesting speeches from the front benches. We had a speech of over 20 minutes from my great friend, the leader of the Scottish National Party in this place. But again, in those 20 minutes, he did not once mention the common fisheries policy. I think everyone everyone in Scotland who recognises the potential to free ourselves from the common fisheries policy which Brexit provides will note that in 20 minutes of precious parliamentary time, the SNP didn't mention them, aren't interested in them, and as far as the fishing people of Scotland are concerned, the SNP have literally nothing to say. And I must now turn to the, I must now turn to the speech from the leader of the Liberal Democrats, someone whom I also have affection and respect for, and he made a number of good points. But he also said that he regretted the referendum. This is from the party that was the first in this House to say that we should have a referendum on EU membership. And because he doesn't like the result of the last referendum, he now wants another referendum. A Liberal Democrat policy on referendums is not the policy of Gladstone or Lloyd George, it's the policy of Vicky Pollard. No, but yeah, but no, but yeah. commend the speech given by the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. He explained that he had been inundated with text messages today from people who were saying, please, 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 uh, people in this House, please, please, please back the government tonight. And some of those text messages had even come from Conservatives. (laughs) And I think critically, when we think about confidence in this country and in this government, There is a daily vote of confidence which is being executed by the individuals investing in this country, creating jobs and opportunity for all our citizens. Under this government, this country remains the most successful country for foreign direct investment of any country in Europe, with more than £1.3 billion being invested in the last year. That is why Forbes magazine says that this country is the best destination for new jobs in the world. Independent organisation JLL say the best place for the future of services in the world is here in the United Kingdom. It is why, once again, London has been recorded by independent inspectors as the best place in the world for tech investment. And we see that when Spanish rail firms like Talgo shortlist six destinations for investment for new rolling stock, all six in the United Kingdom. When Boeing opened a new factory in Sheffield to create jobs for British workers. When Chanel moved from France to London in order to establish a new corporate headquarters. And when Starbucks, Starbucks moved from Amsterdam to London. In order, to, in order to ensure more investment and jobs. 
The opposition should wake up and smell the coffee. And all of this, all of this, in the words of the BBC, despite Brexit. Now that investment, those jobs that have been created under my right honourable friend the Prime Minister's inspirational leadership, has been invested in public services and social justice. As we heard from the member for Dudley South and Bexhill in battle, 1.9 million more children in good and outstanding schools. It is also the case that the gap between the poorest and the richest in our schools has narrowed under this Conservative government. We also have a record level of investment in the NHS, and thanks to my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, a 10-year plan, £20 billion investment, £394 million extra every week for our NHS. And we also have investment in our national security. We meet the 2% target for investment in NATO, and we have two new aircraft carriers capable of projecting British force and influence across the world in defence of freedom and democracy. And in contrast, while we are standing up for national security, what about the right honourable gentleman, the member for Islington North? He wants to leave NATO. He wants to get rid of our nuclear deterrent. And recently in a speech he said, why do countries boast about the size of their armies? That is quite wrong. Why don't we emulate Costa Rica that has no army at all? No allies, no deterrent, no army, no way can this country ever allow that man to be our Prime Minister and in charge of our national security. But if he, if he can't support our fighting men and women, no. Who does he support? Who does he stand beside? Well, it was fascinating to discover that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, was there when a wreath was laid. A wreath was laid to commemorate those who were involved in the massacre at the Munich Olympics of Israeli athletes. Now, he says he was present but not involved. Present but not involved sums him up when it comes to national security. When this House voted to bomb the fascists of ISIS after an inspirational speech by the member for Leeds Central, in which 66 people, including the Shadow Shadow Secretary of State, voted with this government in order to defeat fascism, I'm afraid that the honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, was not with us. In fighting fascism, he was present but not involved. And similarly, when this House voted to take the action necessary, when Vladimir Putin executed an act of terrorism on our soil, there were many Labour members, many good Labour members, who stood up to support what we were doing, but not the right honourable gentleman. When we were order, 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 point of order, Daniel Rennie. Oh. Maybe it is a genuine point of order. Is this relevant? And is this not dangerous? Uh, if, if, if the Secretary of State were out of order, I'd have said so. I didn't because he isn't. Secretary of State. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if the Leader of the Opposition won't stand up against Putin when he attacks people in this country, if he won't stand up against fascists when they are running riot in Syria, if he will not stand up for this country when the critical national security questions are being asked, how can we possibly expect him to stand up for us in European negotiations? Will he stand up for us against uh, Spain over Gibraltar? Will he stand up against the Commission in order to ensure, in order to ensure that we get a good deal? Of course he won't, because he won't even stand up for his own members of Parliament. Why is it that a Labour member of Parliament needs armed protection at her own party conference? Why is it that nearly half of female Labour MPs wrote to the Leader of the Opposition to say that he was not standing up against the vilification and the abuse that they received online, which was being carried out in his name? If he cannot protect his own members of Parliament, if he cannot protect the proud traditions of the Labour Party, how can he possibly protect this country? We cannot have confidence in him to lead. We have confidence in this government, which is why I commend this motion. Order! Under the order!
order. Under the order of the House of today, I am now required to put the question. The question is that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Order. The question is that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Jessica Morden and Jeff Smith. Tell us for the noes, Julian Smith and Christopher Pincher.
The eyes to the right, 306. The nose to the left, 325. The eyes to the right, 306. The nose to the left, 325. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock! Minister. On a point of order, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased that this House has expressed its confidence in the Government tonight. I, I do not take this responsibility lightly, and my Government will continue its work to increase our prosperity, guarantee our security, and to strengthen our union. And yes, we will also continue to work to deliver on the solemn promise we made to the people of this country to deliver on the result of the referendum and leave the European Union. I believe this duty is shared by every member of this House, and we have a responsibility to identify a way forward that can secure the backing of the House. To that end, I have proposed a series of meetings between senior parliamentarians and representatives of the Government over the coming days, and I would like to invite the leaders of parliamentary parties to meet with me individually, and I would like to start these meetings tonight. Ah. Mr Speaker, the Government approaches these meetings in a constructive spirit, and I urge others to do the same. But we must find solutions that are negotiable and command sufficient support in this House. And, as I have said, we will return to the House on Monday to table an amendable motion and to make a statement about the way forward. The House has put its confidence in this Government. I stand ready ready to work with any member of this House to deliver on Brexit and ensure that this House retains the confidence of the British people. Last night, last night, the House rejected the government's conclusion of its negotiations with the European. Uh, order, order. I called the Prime Minister on a point of order, and the Prime Minister was heard, and she was heard in relative tranquillity and certainly with courtesy. And the same courtesy will be extended to the leader of the opposition and to others who seek to raise points of order. That's the way it is. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last night, the House rejected the Government's uh, deal, emphatically. A week ago, the House voted to condemn the idea of a no-deal Brexit. Before there can be any positive discussions about the way forward, the Government... The government must remove, must remove clearly, once and for all, the prospect of the catastrophe of a no-deal Brexit of the EU and all the chaos that would come as a result of that. And I invite the Prime Minister to confirm now that the government will not countenance a no-deal Brexit from the European Union. A point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I must say that I welcome the offer of talks from the Prime Minister. I think it's important, Mr Speaker, that all of us recognise the responsibility that we have, and on the back of the defeat of the Government's motion last night, that we have to work together where we can to find a way forward. I commit the Scottish National Party to working constructively with the Government. However, I do think it's important, I do think it is important in that regard, that we make it clear to the Prime Minister, in a spirit of openness, in these talks, that the issue of removing article, or extending Article 50 of a people's vote and avoiding a no deal have to be on the table. We have to agree to enter these talks on the basis that we can move forward and achieve a result which will unify all the nations of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Point, yes. Point of order, Sir Edward Davy, and then I'll come to the right on them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, From the Liberal Democrat position, we are clear that we want to engage with talks with Her Majesty's Government, but it's very important that the Government makes clear that no deal is not an option. It's very, very important 
the Prime Minister, as she actually, to be fair to her, earlier today didn't do, that rule out uh, extending Article 50. It's important that the House gives that, has that chance to think and come together. And finally, I would ask the Prime Minister, will she ensure, Mr Speaker, that this House gets a chance to take control of our own business as we go through the next few days and weeks? Thank you. Uh, Pointing to order, Mr Nigel Dodds. Mr Speaker, and the uh, result of the uh, motion of no confidence tonight illustrates the importance of the confidence and supply arrangement that is currently in place between... delighted when our opponents illustrate the strength of that uh, relationship that we have and what it's delivering for Northern Ireland. And when the people of Northern Ireland see that investment in education and health and infrastructure, they will thank this Parliament and they will thank this party and this government for that extra investment. Say this. Can, I, can I say this? Oh, order, Mr. Stone. Normally, order. Very unseemly behaviour. Normally, you behave with great dignity in this place. Calm yourself, ma'am. Get a grip. Nigel Dodds. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Can I say, however, that the that the confidence and supply arrangement, of course, is built upon delivering Brexit on the basis of our shared priorities, and for us, that is the union. And we want to deliver Brexit, taking back control of our laws, our border, and our money, and we leave the European Union as one country. Let us work in the coming days to achieve that objective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, on ground, uh, well, if the honourable gentleman, right honourable gentleman, really feels he must, but uh, he has been represented by his right honourable friend. But, I, but if he really wants to, briefly, I don't mind. But we really must move. Yeah, no, no. Well. The generosity of spirit. Mr. Alistair Carmichael. For her assurance, Mr. Speaker, that the, the motion that will be brought on Monday will be amendable. And can I seek your guidance about how we, on this side of the House, and indeed on that side of the House as well, who want to see this matter put to a people's vote, might on Monday be given the opportunity to do so, including the, op the opportunity given to the Leader of the Opposition, now that we know there is not to be a general election? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once the right honourable gentleman, apart from thanking him for his point of order, is to say that if there is an amendable motion of which the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Government, has given notice, manifestly there will be an opportunity for people to table amendments. And we shall have then to see what happens. The right honourable gentleman wouldn't expect me to make a commitment in advance, but I know what he thinks and I've heard what he said. We come now to the adjournment. The whip to move. Thank you. The question is that this House do now adjourn. <laughs> Honourable members, do not wish to hear the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Solihull dilate on the matter of car production in Solihull, which seems an unaccountable choice on their part. I hope that they will leave the chamber quickly and quietly so that the occupant of the chair can hear the honourable gentleman deliver his oration. We must have been. What that makes one of us. Yeah. one of us. That's no problem. So I'll. I'll We come now to the adjournment when I can divert the whip from the attention of his honourable friend, the member for Mid Bedfordshire, who is whispering into his ear, no doubt extremely meaningfully. But 
<laughs> if I could just distract him for a moment. Uh, we come now to the adjournment. The whip to move. I beg to move. This House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Mr Julian Knight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And we move finally on to the main business of the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it is, uh, obviously, it's uh, a great place to have followed the uh, Secretary of State for, for, for DEFRA. And I'm sure that this speech will be as resounding as that one. It's not a hard act to follow, after all, is it? I have to give that fantastic oration. The reason for this debate, and I secured it prior to the announcements of uh, uh, job reductions at Jaguar Land Rover uh, in the West Midlands, uh, I, 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 I got the uh, beforehand, but we've seen a slow trend over time, unfortunately, over the last year, of a drip drip of job losses in the Jaguar Land Rover group. And uh, the announcements that have just been made were much more substantial in that regard and has brought forward the Jaguar Land Rover Development Partnership, which I'm sure all honourable members, and I know my uh, right honourable friend, the member for Meriden, is playing a leading part in that, and also in the work in this House in terms of promoting the needs of the UK car industry and Jaguar Land Rover in particular. I'm sure all honourable members, and also the member for Coventry South, uh, will join me in uh, wishing that organisation a great success. Now, uh, I believe that in order to take the right action to support the British car industry and the towns and families that depend on it, politicians must have an accurate understanding of the real drivers behind the current challenges and not allow this issue to get caught up in arguments over, for example, Brexit. I therefore want to use my speech to set out why Jaguar Land Rover is so important to Solihull and the wider West Midlands economy and the real reasons behind their current difficulties, and set out my recommendations for what ministers can do to support this crucial industry. Solihull is rightly proud of the fact that it is one of the UK's great manufacturing towns. Not only is it home to some of the country's most popular global brands, but as I said in the House just the other day, it is one of of only a few constituencies to enjoy an actual trade surplus in goods with the European Union. As a consequence, thousands of local residents are employed in these industries, including the JLR plant at Lode Lane, and they have played a big role in shaping the character shape of our town. Uh, I'm delighted to give away some of yeah, and first of all, congratulate them for bringing this forward. I understand the reasons for it, and it's good to see the, the members uh, who have a particular interest that to be here in the House as well. Uh, similar to us in Northern Ireland, when it comes to the Bombardier issue, uh, that, do, does the other member agree that consideration must be given to bringing back work from foreign plants, t- such an example such as Sofakia in the case of Land Rover, and keeping jobs here in the United Kingdom, similar as it should be doing in Bombardier? And does he think a government should look at the incentives to encourage the retention of jobs here within the big manufacturing base in the United Kingdom? I thank the honourable gentleman for, for uh, making the intervention, and uh, I think the way in which you keep jobs and actually. Uh, bring jobs into the UK is by creating the business environment for them to flourish and investment to flourish. And that is basically the point of the speech that I'm going to make. This, I will give one. The gentleman for, for giving way, and I congratulate him on securing this, de- this uh, time of the debate. Um, he's quite right. There's not a lot we can be said about a sub- meetings that we've had with Jaguar Land Rover, because that information is confidential. But Jaguar Land Rover is not in the same situation as Bombardier. It's a totally different situation, quite frankly. And what we will certainly we want to do is support the honourable gentleman, as he knows, and uh, to make sure that Jaguar Land Rover goes on and on and creates more jobs. And I'm sure he might want to touch on the supply line, because I've had a number of letters from small companies a bit concerned about it, but we've had some reassurances on that, and there'll be discussions about that anyway. So, good, all the best to the honourable gentleman. All the gentleman for, for his intervention, and actually, I, I wonder whether I actually see my speech, actually, because I'm just about to mention the actual successes of the Jaguar Land Rover, which are manifest over this time. And actually, when, when you think in terms of employment, and we just talked about that, I talked about that at the start of the speaker's speech, the reality are that we have gone back to the situation we were in 2016. Can I put my oh. Um, I I congratulate my honourable friend on securing this important debate tonight and just want to say I I have a feeling I know what he's going to say and that he has in what he says huge and strong support from my constituents in the royal town of Sutton Coalfield for the critical importance that Jaguar Land Rover plays in our region. I know for a fact there are a lot of people who work at Jaguar Land Rover that live in his constituency and I always see 
the royal town of Sutton Coldfield, effectively as very close partners with Solihull in many things and many respects. And I do welcome and thank him for his comment. Uh, JLR does face serious challenges, but I think it's not important not to allow these to eclipse what is still a very encouraging overall picture. In 2010, they employed just 12,000 people in the UK, whereas even after the latest reductions, they will still employ over 38,000 workers across the country, including 10,000 in Solihull. That's more than a three-fold increase nationwide. Those eight years have also seen substantial revenue growth, from £6 billion to £25 billion per year, a more than fourfold increase. Over the past five years, JLR has invested some £80 billion in the UK, which is basically the same as defence and education put together. That is an enormous investment. They further announced a fresh round of investment alongside the job news last week. Overall, the UK continues to enjoy the most productive automotive manufacturing sector in Europe, and productivity remains about 50% higher than the British manufacturing average. In short, Solihull remains a great place for British manufacturers and exporters, and I'll do everything I can to help them succeed as part of the new Jaguar Land Rover Development Partnership. I also think that we must be careful that the details of this important issue aren't confused or obscured. There is no doubt that our relationship with the European Union is a matter of serious concern to JLR and every other manufacturer who depends on international just-in-time supply chains. But JLR management have been quite clear that the driving forces behind the current reductions are twofold, a serious fall in demand in China and a slump in demand for diesel cars in the aftermath of the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Exposure to downturns in foreign markets is part and parcel of being an exporter. But the second, is the, fall, the second is the fallout from the Volkswagen emissions scandal, a problem made in Wolfsburg, but now threatening jobs and investment in the UK. For years, governments of both parties have encouraged Britons to buy diesel and, by extension, encouraged British car makers to surface that need. According to Professor David Bailey of Aston Business School, more than 90% of JLR's domestic sales are diesels. Yet after Volkswagen were found to have been fiddling with their emission scores, we have suddenly seen a scramble to seem to crack down on diesel. This has had the predictable results. So far this year, Jaguar sales have been down uh, 26%, but this pattern is repeated across the UK car industry, where overall diesel registrations have plunged by a third since January to March 2017. Respected economists from the Centre for Economic and Business Research have shown that such policies are hugely detrimental to the economy. Many of these policies also fail to account for the huge differences between old-fashioned diesel engines and so-called, if you like, cleaner diesel, alternatives to the sort manufactured by Jaguar Land Rover in my constituency. These cars are just as clean as petrol alternatives. In fact, what car magazine recently named a diesel their car of the year? saying that not only that it combined the low CO2 diesels are known for, but with lower NOx output than many petrol alternatives. Even better, and this is perverse in, in many respects. The fact is, so many people are now switching to petrol without realising they could be actually bringing a more, uh, buying a more polluting vehicle Absolutely. than the diesel they could actually buy at the same time, perhaps at a good discount. Well, by I will give my own thing. And very briefly, and well done for securing this debate. He's doing a great job trying to rehabilitate the truth about new diesel engines and, and help to justify the huge investment that not only the uh, company but also the government has made in developing new cleaner diesel engines. And hopefully this debate can help disabuse the myth about the, di the, the, the difference between mm. petrol and diesel. I think we're right on, Wolfram. Now, I, I actually have been very recently diagnosed with an asthmatic. And, you know, it's, it's quite a... You know, for, for someone who cycled up Mount Von Two less than two years ago, it's rather sort of, you know, it is quite a, uh, a frightening and, and life sort of, you know, altering experience in many respects. But, you know, so I, I'm very, very conscious of that fact, but we need to get it right and we need to understand that we don't end up, for example, ensuring that older polluting diesels are kept on the car, on the, on the roads for, for longer because people are afraid to change them because they will lose money. We need to encourage people to transition to uh, new technologies but at the same time, we need to fill that gap with cleaner diesel until we get there, until the capacity is there. Uh, I'll give way to and then I'll give way to Can I thank the member for Solihull for bringing in this important debate uh, before us uh, this evening? Uh, and uh, it, is, it is an important and timely one, as he was saying. 
Uh, and having worked with him and colleagues uh, on the issue of the automotive industry in Jaguar Land Rover, I, I know he shares the same passion uh, that I have. Uh, just on that point, I wanted to pick up that he, I think, is in agreement with me that the, the transition that he describes is so critical in how we manage that and how government works with manufacturers to ensure that we do get a, a coordinated managed transition away from uh, diesel and petrol to cleaner fuels. And perhaps he, he could speak now about the diesel taxation and how we need to actually not penalise consumers, but actually support consumers in that transition. And particularly that will help Jaguar Land Rover. I'm going to put the, his thoughts on that on the record in that respect. And he is correct in terms of transition. And the realities are that we can't have a situation, frankly, where we ask car manufacturers to move at pace to these new technologies. And then, frankly, we take policy uh, across the EU, which potentially can damage their income streams, which would then allow them in order basically to invest. So we need to be nuanced about this and thoughtful, while at the same time ensuring our environment. Giving way, and he's making some excellent points. Jaguar Land Rover invested a huge amount of money in South Staffordshire on the border with Wolverhampton in the engine plant precisely to build these uh, engines that he's uh, referring to. And that has brought huge numbers of excellent job opportunities, both in Wolverhampton and Staffordshire. So would he pay tribute? Well, I would join me in paying tribute to that, that foresight that they had in these clean engines. I, I, I certainly do. I know the impact that's had in his local community and also in the wider West Midlands economy. I mean, these jobs are fantastic jobs. They pay higher, much higher than the national average wage, and that creates jobs in the local economy through the multiplier effect. These are jobs we have to keep and we have to develop. So I'd say the key word there is transition. Whilst JLR have... I, I, I'm, I, I'm conscious of time, sorry. Uh, announced that all new models will be electrified from 2020, and I no doubt other manufacturers will follow suit. It is a simple fact that we do not yet have the infrastructure to handle a wholesale shift towards electric vehicles in the near future. As I told the House during the debate on what is now the Automated and Electrical Vehicles Act, the current capacity for public charging points doesn't even come close to that provided by traditional filling stations. It will take time to put the necessary infrastructure in place, and until it's ready, our environmental goals are best served by encouraging motorists to, to switch to cleaner, modern vehicles of all types as we get to this, uh, this situation where we can get rid of the internal combustion engine by 2040. As an MP for a car-making town, I'm former chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for ferro fuel and motorists. I'm, of course, very grateful for the government's proactive approach to the sector. The previously mentioned sector deal is very welcome, and I'm proud to have the opportunity to serve on the new JLR development partnership, which will give the company, firms and supply train, trade union officials, and others the opportunity to lay direct delays directly with the business secretary, the mayor of the West Midlands, and other local politicians. I also note the 500 million investment in the new advanced propulsion centre intended to research, develop and industrialise new low carbon automotive technologies and other initiatives such as the Faraday Battery Challenge and the Supplier Competitiveness and Productivity Programme. The car industry has proven itself more than willing to collaborate with ministers in this field, match funding not just the Advanced Propulsion Centre, but also another £225 million for R&D investment. Now, I'll bring my comments to a conclusion. We face a period of economic uncertainty, especially for exporters, as we negotiate our future relationship with the European Union and start to pursue our own independent trade policy. It is vitally important, both to the well-being of constituents like mine and to the entire British economy, not to mention the government's own long-term environmental and technological ambitions, that we do everything we can to offer stability and certainty to companies such as Jaguar Land Rover. Only then will they be able to make the investment needed to protect jobs, drive growth and make our eventual transition to electric cars a reality. Minister, Mr Richard Harrington. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you very much, and I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend for securing this debate tonight. Although I must confess, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was a little disappointed because when I came into the chamber, I thought so many people had come to listen to the debate tonight. And I thought, well, maybe it's because of Jaguar. I mean, Jaguars are known as super toys by many people. Um, uh, members may aspire to owning them. I can strongly recommend them. And I know that for... Um, I have a little, uh, perhaps, indication that Madam Deputy Speaker may have a product that's um, manufactured by this company. So um, 
if uh, representatives from the company are listening, and we do have the endorsement of the uh, deputy speaker, <laughs> and indeed myself, I have to say, uh, the not at the taxpayers' expense, I, yeah, yeah, I, I may yeah. say, and it's not really a super toy; it's a more, it's a more uh, modest model. Um, but seriously, it's a very important subject tonight, and I'd like to um, also thank other uh, members that have, and right honourable members that have uh, contributed. Jaguar has an excellent, Jaguar Land Rover has an excellent group of MPs that um, are in the area. I was very pleased to meet with them last week to discuss the announcement that was made. Um, I see my, the honourable gentleman from uh, Leamington and Warwick, or Warwick and Leamington, uh, shaking his head. I, I do hope that I haven't affronted him by not, but it was, uh, they, most members were, and I, if I have, I really apologise, and I'd make sure he was always invited. Uh, I thank the Minister for giving way. I don't believe I was invited, but I very much hope that I will be invited in future. Thank you. Yes. He wasn't. It was all done at the last minute, and I would apologise to him and offer to meet him whenever he likes, either informally or indeed for a meeting with officials. Um, but the point I was making is that it's a cross-party matter with Jaguar Land Rover and it's treated in that way by government and by the company. Um, I just wish to uh, briefly outline in the time we have the steps that uh, the government's taken since Jaguar Land Rover announced last Thursday that they will reduce the global workforce by about 4,500 people. And then I'll move on to address the other arguments put forward by my honourable friend. Um, as he has uh, highlighted, the UK automotive industry remains one of our great success stories. Global demand for our designed, engineered, manufactured vehicles is strong and regarded internationally as being very productive. Our industrial strategy builds on these strengths and invests in the future to put the UK at the forefront of the next generation of electric and autonomous vehicles. And Jaguar Land Rover are a key part of our automotive manufacturing base, supporting high-quality jobs both directly and across the supply chain. As the member for Solihull noted, um, last Thursday, Jaguar Land Rover confirmed that they're offering voluntary redundancy package, packages to the UK workforce to reduce the headcount. And um, as it's a voluntary redundancy programme, they can't give any figures uh, on the number of Solihull workers that might be affected. But they made it clear to us um, in a call that the Secretary of State, my right honourable friend, Secretary of State, had with uh, myself, with um, the, the Chief Executive of Jaguar Land Rover, before, just before the announcement, that those working on production lines are not part of this programme, and it's predominantly marketing and management staff, which I don't make lightly of. These are people who will be made redundant, hopefully with their agreement, and uh, really what job they do doesn't particularly matter. But he also stressed to us that the apprenticeship programme, which has been supported so well by, uh, my, by, by my honourable friend from Solihull and other local MPs, will continue, as will gra graduate recruitment and the recruitment of specific staff that, that they need. The decision to offer these redundancies, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the next phase of the £2.5 billion Charge and Accelerate Turnaround Programme, which the company announced last September. Um, I've spoken, as I say, several times to uh, the Chief Executive, and he's explained how these redundancies will streamline the business and to help ensure the company's long-term health for the future. But, as I say, I do think a lot of every single member of staff and their families who face an uncertain time. And I can assure the House that we're working very closely with colleagues across the West Midlands to offer what support we absolutely can. And we are working to support the company itself. Um, we have a long-standing relationship with the firm and its parent company um, in India. And since they announced the turnaround plans last September, we have worked even more closer with the company. We are supporting its long-term strategies that invest in transitions to autonomous, connected and electric vehicles. On Monday, Andy Street... Of course, I'm uh, uh, Minister uh, Gavin, we... Uh, one of the important factors here is the development of the electric vehicles actually takes place at Whitley and Coventry. That's the first thing I would say. Has the Minister, and I don't know this, and the Minister will probably want to think about this, would a, a, a scrappage scheme help the, the situation? I don't know. It's something that would have to be put to the company, but it struck me as something maybe we should think about and explore in order to help the company. And, of course, as my honourable friend from Lamington said, 
There's this is issue about taxation as well. And lastly, and importantly, when we talk about the labour force, as we've got to remember, a lot of the labour force actually bought houses, certainly in my constituents and other constituencies. So again, we've got to do as much as possible to help them if they run into some difficult situations there with mortgages, for example. I, I, I thank the honourable gentleman for his intervention on that. And um, he was at the meeting that we had last week. Um, and I, I know he's, like all other um, honourable members, uh, spends a lot of time um, with Jaguar. Um, if I could briefly go through his points, I must confess, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've not thought about the scrappage scheme, but happy to do now, uh, as he suggested. Um, as far as the taxation matter and, uh, and everything in the electric vehicles, uh, perhaps I could come on to that in my speech, which I will do so. But I was just confirming that Andy Street, who is the Mayor of the West Midlands Combined Authority, and Secretary of State convened the Jaguar Land Rover Development Partnership, which brought the company local MPs, including my honourable friend, the member for Solihull, and I must congratulate him and thank him for coming to that at short notice. Although, again, other local MPs were invited, and I hope that, I hope that the honourable gentleman wasn't missed out, that I might have missed out from my meeting. Um, to be there. I, the reason I wasn't there, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, just for the record, is in case there was an urgent question here on the subject that I, somebody ha had to be here to deal with it. So I don't know if I drew the short straw or the long straw, but I do intend in future this is part of my responsibilities, which I, I look forward to taking up. But there were trade union representatives and um, trade bodies and other, well, uh, local government, and I think almost anyone that could be invited that we felt was relevant. But it's, it's a continuing group, and the partnership heard from the Chief Executive, Ralph Speth, on the significant investment that Jaguar Land Rover continue to make in the UK. He gave many examples of how Jaguar Land Rover is investing in the future, including in Solihull. And accepting the point that the Honourable Gentleman just made about working families across the UK, actually, not just in, in his Coventry constituency, but across the UK, where people's lives, he certainly did make that point, whose lives are involved. Because, as my old friend from Solihull uh, mentioned, these are not just, not just jobs. They're, they're well-paid, highly skilled, well-respected jobs, and long should they continue. Um, but Jaguar and Land Rover seemed very positive about the future. I met with Steve Turner, uh, one of the trade union representatives, last week, and uh, I have to say, without betraying Steve's uh, um, confidences, he, he, I asked him the question. I said, "You know, what's the management really like?" Because I've dealt with the, you know, the chief executive. He says, "Absolutely, very good," and I believe that. And everyone involved, I think, has confirmed that. Um, so I'm confident for the future. Now, of the specific points. The Jaguar has confirmed that the next generation electric drive units will be produced at the company's engineering manufacturing centre in Wolverhampton from later this year. These are powered by batteries assembled at a new JLR uh, battery uh, centre located at Hams Hall in Birmingham, which at least we can clearly say reinforces the company's commitment to the West Midlands. Um, over the past year, they've announced investment in their key plants in Solihull and Halewood to produce the next generation of models, including electric vehicles. For Solihull in particular, in June 2018, the company announced hundreds of millions of pounds of investment in a technology upgrade to accommodate the next generation of flagship Land Rover models. Hopefully, and it's certainly the intentions to future-proof the site. We are determined to ensure the UK continues to be one of the most competitive locations in the world um, for automotive and other advanced manufacturing. The automotive sector deal, mentioned by my honourable friend from Solihull, published just over a year ago, the government's working with industry to invest in the future, including a billion pounds commitment over 10 years through the Advanced Propulsion Centre, which is very impressive. I must say the Propulsion Centre really is. And Jaguar Land Rover has benefited from this support, most recently as part of a 4.4 million project through the Advanced Propulsion Centre and an 11.2 million one through the Connected and Autonomous Vehicles Intelligent Mobility Fund. Um, I would like to now turn to other arguments made by my honourable friend. Um, as he rightly points out, uh, whilst Jaguar Land Rover has, has had great successes over the past decade, the number of challenges facing the com company is significant. Falling changes in China has been a major factor and has had an impact on many global automotive companies, 
In addition, the broad trend of declining consumer demand for diesel has had an impact. I make no apology for the Government's bold vision on ultra-low emissions vehicles, which we set out in our Road to Zero strategy, and I'm sure Jaguar actually in the long run will be a major beneficiary of that strategy, as of course will be the environment of this country, uh, Europe, and I, I hope the world. Um, but we want to be at the forefront of this, and our aims for new cars and vans to be effectively zero emission by 2040. Um, by 20, well, that's new ones, and um, hopefully by 2050 and beyond, every, every car will be. But I agree with the critical point made by my honourable friend. Diesel plays an important role in reducing CO2 emissions from road transport during the transition, and it will continue to have an important role for years to come. And we need to be clear on this point, both in our own minds and in our communication with industry. And I believe we have been. Because the Road to Zero strategy actually is clear that diesel, particularly the new generation of diesel engines, are a perfectly acceptable choice environmentally and economically. For those members who are not familiar with uh, this document, I suggest they could look at it because there's been a lot of talk of government playing a role in actually destroying diesel and talking it down. But. Um, I, I, yeah, sure. anyway, I'm really encouraged by what he said in that regard. I mean, the realities are that the collapse in diesel is a European-wide issue. We know that. It's just that we do need this nuance, this idea, effectively, that cleaner diesel does play a role, sort of shout a bit from the rooftops, provided that the industry can show that this clean diesel does not harm the environment. Thank you. Um, I don't have it within my power, Madam Deputy Speaker, to shout from the rooftops, but I will shout from this chamber. For those people that are listening, the new clean diesels are really, really good. And I, well, I confess, as I say, to having a penchant for this particular kind of vehicle myself. Um, yes. <clears throat> if I may, uh, thank you, for the Minister, for being so generous with his time. Um, but if I can just return to this important point, uh, when he's starting to speak about uh, shouting from the rooftops, perhaps the most critical point to shout on is about taxation. And I, I do appreciate the points that have just been made by uh, the member for Solihull, that there is a, a global issue, uh, as we've seen in North America and across uh, Europe, on diesel. But it is in our gift, the government's gift, to change taxation and not to penalise, because the maximum uh, VED addition that was put in was £560 on a vehicle. I'm bursting to respond to the Honourable Gentleman's point, but I've got precisely, I think, two minutes, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I don't want to torment your time. Um, well, you won't let me. You'll, you'll, you'll say not to. Um, the, and the Honourable Friend from Solihull made the same point. And I'm pleased to remind the House that on the 19th of December, the Treasury published a review of the impact of worldwide harmonised light vehicles test procedure, that is a vehicle excise and company tax. The review is open until the 17th of September. And officials from the Department have been working very closely with Jaguar Land Rover and others to ensure that the industry's evidence is considered of this in this review. And I really look forward to the outcome. Well, I'd like to congratulate again my honourable friend from Solihull, who's, I mean, he really is a major spokesman for the company, together with his colleagues. Um, this debate is but a small part of the work that he does, and my door is always open to him and to the company. So I look forward to a great future for Jaguar Land Rover, and uh, I know that the West Midlands will be a key part of that. Thank you. Thank you. The question is, that this House do now adjourn. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order! Order!
The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.